Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou would be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Yes, President. I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Uh, there are no um, requests for committees to meet, so we'll now move to the swearing of a senator. Oh, beg your pardon, Senator Ciccone. Point of order. I just wanted to seek your um, advice and some clarity order. on relation just moment, to. Just a moment, Senator Ciccone. People at the back are having trouble hearing. Uh, I'll get Sorry. you to start again. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Thank you. Just on a point of order on item number four, um, just to seek your advice on and clarity on advice around when we might expect uh, advice from the opposition in terms of their committee membership. And I make this point simply because committees are not able to meet or elect chairs or deputy chairs until we receive the committee membership from those opposite. Thank you, um, Senator Ciccone. That isn't a point of order. and um, I'm in the hands of the chamber as to when um, those committees are finalised. We'll now move to the swearing in of a senator, Senator Thorpe, to be sworn as the senator for Victoria. As Senator Thorpe was absent from the Senate on the 26th of July 2020, I will now administer the affirmation of allegiance as required by section 42 of the Constitution. Senator Thorpe, please come to the table to make and subscribe the affirmation of allegiance. Senator Thorpe, please recite the affirmation on the card handed to you. Sovereign Lydia Thorpe, who solemnly and sincerely affirm and declare that I will be faithful and I bear true allegiance to the colonising Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Senator Thorpe, I'm going to wait for quiet. Senator Thorpe, you are required to recite the oath as printed on the card, so please recite the oath. Uh, Senator Thorpe, Senator Thorpe, order. I, Lydia Thorpe, do solemnly and sincerely affirm and declare that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law. Uh, Senator Thorpe, please sign the test roll and Senator's roll. Uh, I call the clerk. 
Private Senators bills ordered the day number 13, Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Amendment, Regional Forest Agreements Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Um, I move that the bill be oh, Just a moment, Senator sure. Dunningham, please resume your seat. I would ask senators not participating in this debate to leave the chamber in a quiet and orderly fashion so that Senator Dunningham may make his contribution. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, President. Uh, I move that the bill be read a second time. And in moving that, we'll now speak. Uh, <laughs> this is a very important debate, and I'm sure there are many in the chamber who would agree uh, that at a time like this, in the context that we are facing as part of a global economy and as uh, a nation that's uh, struggling with a number of economic, amongst other issues ourselves, it's important that we provide certainty to all parts of our community and all parts of our economy and, uh, 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 and making sure that those that generate economic activity, small, medium businesses out there and the hundreds of thousands of people that work in those businesses have that certainty as well. Looking at the uncertainty we do face uh, at the moment, um, I think it is, again, as I say, important to take stock of the context against which this private senator's bill is being debated. And in, just in doing that, I do want to pay tribute to Senator Bridget McKenzie, who did introduce this bill in the last parliament uh, at a time when things were slightly different, though not incredibly different. Uh, and the work that she's put into the drafting of this bill and bringing it forward again in the 47th parliament. As I say, though, uh, here we are in Australia and we're facing a great many domestic economic pressures, uh, Mr Deputy President, and uh, matters that there is no handbook to uh, just pull off the shelf and uh, provide a response for government to deal with these issues. Uh, but there is one tried and uh, true thing that a government can adopt, and that is the matter of certainty. When you look at inflation uh, and where that's predicted to go, the impact that that's going to have on the cost of living and all other segments of the economy. Power prices, even in my home state of Tasmania, where they're going up by 12 per cent, something that is going to hit small businesses and households alike. Uh, the cost of food, fuel uh, and, of course, uh, mortgage interest rates too, going in the direction that they are. All of these things are generating incredibly uncertain times and uh, it's something that we need to look at uh, every tool we possibly can. As legislators, uh, the government needs to look at every tool it has at its disposal as a Commonwealth government, along with state and territory governments, to provide certainty uh, as one measure to respond to these times of uncertainty. Um, of course, also, uh, as we emerge and continue to emerge from COVID, uh, where the world was an unpredictable place, we've seen an incredible pattern of uh, behaviours and an incredible pattern of different economic indicators too. Um, I mean, who could have predicted through COVID we would have seen the growth in the housing and construction sector that we did uh, for that time, um, thanks to uh, stimulating measures on the part of many state and territory governments and indeed the last federal government with this home builder program. Uh, but um, there is one thing Australian businesses and households are looking for, and that is, of course, uh, certainty. That's the one thing they're asking for. It's the one thing they're calling for. And this bill provides a pathway for one such example. Um, I think we can all acknowledge that forestry as an industry for time immemorial has been uh, kicked about um, by emotive arguments and often ones that lack scientific basis. Um, and you know, that has resulted in um, a downscaling of the industry, in job losses, uh, in a, a reduction of economic activity, particularly in regional communities. Um, it also, of course, means less resource available to uh, our country, um, particularly, and I've already touched on the increased demand for the resource, uh, particularly at a time when we need it. And I might also point out it's a resource that is indeed, given the way we do forestry in this country, a renewable resource. Uh, and of course, on top of that, um, given the, uh, I think, by and large, good track record that forestry as an industry has, um, of course, with exception, and I'm, I think we all need to acknowledge that, but good conservation outcomes. Uh, and it's something we do need to pay tribute to, is that this industry relies on the environment it operates in to continue to operate. They are good co custodians of the, uh, the land, the forests, and the land on which they work, and uh, they do it based on science. They do it 
based on world's best practice. And on that, uh, that claim, I, I also make another claim, and that is that we do it better than anywhere else in the world. Um, I'm yet to hear of examples of another jurisdiction that do forestry, both native and plantation, to the same standard that we do here in Australia. Uh, be it the regulation that is imposed on this industry at a state or territory level, or indeed uh, through um, the RFAs, uh, it does lead to positive outcomes that are of benefit to our nation and to the people that work here, the people that live here. Um, you know, there are economic benefits. I've already talked about those, and I think they're pretty obvious for anyone who's listening. Uh, of course, the environmental benefits that I talked about before, reforestation, which is part of our forestry management regime. We don't just go out there, clear fell, and leave the uh, land uh, denuded. We actually seek to reforest so that we have continuing and sustained availability of resource. Uh, innovation, investments in innovation, are central to ensuring that we have a strong and vibrant forestry future. Um, getting more products out of less resource is critically important, having less waste at the end of the production cycle, and of course the science that goes into that innovation centrally important. Uh, and at the last election, both major parties committed uh, uh, over $100 million to science, innovation and research through a super NIFBY, as it's called, and that will feed further into better outcomes. Um, and of course, the carbon uh, outcome of forestry, the capacity for our productive forest to sequester uh, carbon and do the, a, a great deal of heavy lifting when it comes to our carbon abatement, uh, the job that we have as a nation to um, fulfil our global responsibilities. The forestry industry does a huge part of that for our country. And indeed, the proud, hard-working men and women that work in this uh, sector as well, that get besmirched every other day of the week by those who just seek to take this industry down. And it might be a good opportunity for my colleagues down the end there to not rile me up, and I'll keep it pretty tame too. So, given all of this, it does beg the question uh, why we wouldn't back the industry. And uh, of course, if you don't, where do you get the resource from? Two pretty central questions around. Uh, this bill and, indeed, what happens in a world where uh, this bill does not take effect. Um, conservative estimates uh, we've uh, repeated ad nauseum in this place and, of course, in the other and out in the public domain as well, that demand for timber products is going to increase uh, fourfold by the year 2050. And there are a myriad of reasons that feed into that. Uh, they be mainly in the housing and construction sector for timber framing, for staircases, window frames, the like, flooring for furniture and decorative applications, amongst others. The demand is heading in that direction, and, uh, of course, uh, native timber, the forests that we are uh, contemplating here in the debating of this bill, are central to the provision of the resource that uh, is required to fulfil that demand. And they say there's some stats out there now that 30 per cent of any home built these days is uh, of hardwood and, uh, therefore, coming from native forests. So, bearing in mind the world-leading status of our forestry industry and those who work in it, um, you've got to wonder why we wouldn't back it. And of course, that second question I mentioned, I asked before: Where does the resource come from if we aren't taking it from well-managed, world-leading, science-based Australian forests? Um, we often get it from overseas. This is the thing: if we're not producing it here, we're taking it from overseas nations, where we don't have the same assurances, we don't have the same guarantees around the resource and the sustainability of the management models they have in place uh, in those nations. Uh, we don't know what environmental outcomes, we don't know what conditions for uh, workers in those forests and those mills uh, exist. And so, uh, without strong regimes in those corresponding nations around traceability and labelling, it is very difficult for us to know with any confidence uh, and I'll come to some facts in a moment around other nations and their track records. Uh, it, it's very difficult for us as a country that do value environmental management, that do value uh, conditions for employees in these uh, often dangerous environments. Uh, whether the timber we are importing and buying will in any way be the standard we require of ourselves and expect as consumers of this resource. And uh, look, in the last term of parliament, um, I was pleased to see a DNA testing program in many of our timber uh, retail outlets. And the scary thing was, 
and I'm pleased that we were able to reveal this, um, that many of our very high-profile retailers were marketing and selling product claiming to be a particular species of timber sourced from a sustainable forest overseas. But the DNA testing revealed that, in fact, it wasn't. It wasn't that timber, and indeed it didn't come from a sustainable source. And I implore the uh, Albanese government to consider continuing this program because I think it is important. If we're going to impose high standards on our timber industry, and rightly so, it's a, a set of impositions that the industry would welcome and, of course, help them with their brand, uh, we should continue to do that for overseas uh, sources and those who import them. But to that point, we are bringing our timber in from overseas, and one such uh, um, point of origination is uh, the nation of Brazil. Uh, a lot of timber comes in, um, and we've got a void here that we are seeking to fill. As I said before, demand quadrupling by the year 2050. Where are we getting this timber from? It's not coming out of thin air. It's certainly not coming out of Australian forests. It's coming from overseas. So Brazil, and I did a bit of research earlier on, and I came across a number of facts that worried me quite significantly about what we, who still want to buy the products, but we are finding it less and less possible to do so here in Australia, using Australian timber, sustainably managed, sustainably sourced, and done to the world's best standard. We still want to buy the product, but we are forcing ourselves to buy it from overseas. And so you look at Brazil, and uh, for the first half of this year, for the first half of 2022, the Amazon rainforest reached a record high in terms of deforestation for the first six months of this year. An area five times the size of New York City was destroyed, government data showed. So from January to June, 3,988 square kilometres was cleared. And of course, you can't just say, oh, well, that's a matter for them, because turning your back on the rest of the world when we are good global citizens, I think, is an important thing for us to do. We set an example and we expect others to follow. And this very same report talks about how uh, this clearing regime, not done in accordance with any uh, science, not done to the world's best standard as it is here in Australia, after loggers extract valuable wood, Ranchers and land grabbers set fire uh, to what's left to clear the land for agriculture. So here they are indeed contributing also not only to deforestation but to carbon emissions, which is something I would have thought many in this place would be opposed to supporting. But this is what happens when we strangle our industry here by not providing certainty. We are forcing demand offshore. We are sourcing from unsustainable forests offshore. Um, and, of course, sending the jobs with them. And I could go on about Brazil uh, at length, but let's turn to the uh, continent of Africa and uh, the deforestation in the Congo Basin, particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and, of course, we're seeing, uh, if you're looking at the measurement of the amount of timber being ripped out of the Congo Basin, uh, wood removal, which is measured in cubic metres, is continuing to increase annually. Uh, Industrialised round wood, which is of course used for the purposes I've been talking about, has increased from 3.05 million cubic metres in 1990 to 4.45 million cubic metres in 2010. So if we think that these uh, forests are being managed well and in accordance with world's best practice, uh, you only have to consider claims like Congo Basin rainforest may be gone by 2100 study fines and the facts that I've already put on record. We do forestry well here. And that was the point behind Senator Mackenzie's private senator's bill, the bill we're debating today. Now, of course, there have been events that have happened uh, since the bill was first introduced in the Federal Court of Australia, and that's great. But we are in the business of providing certainty. We are in the business of making sure that this industry, which is world leading, which does not have headlines like the ones I've just read out, does not have academic studies pointing to terrible outcomes like the ones I've just referred to, uh, our industry is one that is sustainable, one that we should be proud of, one that supports tens of thousands of jobs in regional communities and uh, billions of dollars of economic productivity and revenue for Australian households and businesses, all the while providing good environmental outcomes. And so, uh, this is why it is important for us to remove all doubt. It's great that the federal court reached the conclusion that they did, but let's not leave people in doubt. Let's show the government's intent 
uh, for this particular um, industry, amongst other great primary industries, and make sure it has the support it needs. That certainty I mentioned earlier on, the one thing businesses and households are looking for anywhere they can get it, certainty from government through its policy, its regulation and its legislation. Now we know, of course, that at a time in the future the uh, new government will present to this parliament its response to the Samuels Review, uh, a review which I might add has been out and in the public domain for some time, but that will also make a change to what we're debating here. So let's put a marker in the ground, let's support this industry and let's support this bill. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Um, and it's good to start this parliamentary week on uh, such an important topic um, about our forestries and ensuring that we do not just conserve our forests for future generations, but also support uh, a very important industry that employs thousands of people right around, right around this country, particularly my home state uh, in Victoria. And I, do note the, the comments by Senator Dunham as a former minister in, in this portfolio and a very important industry in his home state of Tasmania. Uh, however, I do want to just also make the point um, that the last election, I guess, does demonstrate, um, sadly, how irrelevant those opposite um, have become. Because the decision to bring forward this private senator's bill um, in, in the first period of the senator's private um, time at the private senator's time of this 47th parliament does say a lot and it's just another example about the opposition and, and how they are scrambling to find any form of relevance right now you know, for a whole decade there have been an absence of policy agenda particularly when it came to forestry you know, and faced with the very first opportunity to put forward in the senate a bill a bill that will deliver uh, jobs that will actually strengthen the industry they bring forward a bill that is effectively out of date. It's superseded by events of last year. Um, and it really is concerning to see if this is the first opportunity uh, that the Shadow Minister for uh, Forestry brings to this, uh, to this chamber, uh, a bill that no longer has any practical meaning, no practical effect. Uh, I know it's not his bill, and I should note that for the record. Uh, it is a, a bill that uh, was put forward by uh, Senator McKenzie's in the previous parliament. But this bill, um, Deputy President, the uh, Environmental Protection Biodiversity Conservation Amendment uh, Regional Forestry Agreement Bill uh, is not really a serious legislative venture. Indeed, it has never been. Um, originally conceived by the uh, former minister and, now, uh, and, and, and uh, current Senator Mackenzie, she effectively had used this bill to wedge the previous administration. Um, when her time out of the ministry. Now, this bill is nothing more than a stunt. It is nothing more than an attempt by the National Party to embarrass their Liberal colleagues. Uh, Senator Scott, I'm doing you and your colleagues a favour, but it is nothing more than the Nationals trying to do wedge politics against the, the Liberal Party when they were last in government. Um, the matter to which this bill pertains, that of uh, the May 2020 uh, decision of the Federal Court, um, has, just like those opposite, long since, has long since lost relevance. And uh, for those unfamiliar, who are those who are listening into the chamber today, listening, the, uh, the decision by the federal court uh, came as a judgment in the matter of the Friends of Leadbeater Possum versus Vic, Vic Forests. Uh, now, its, its impact upon the forestry forestry industry was, was devastating, in my opinion, and I note that there will be others that will have very different views. But just to be clear, on that particular decision, the interpretation around Section 38.1 of the EPBC Act, Her Honour at the time found that in breaching the Victorian Code of Practice for the timber production of 2014, Vic Forest was no longer operating in accordance with a regional forestry agreement, and thereby thereby it lost the so-called exemption from Part 3 of the EPBC Act, Deputy President. Now, I know that uh, the intricacies of such legislation, regula regulation, um, particularly when it comes to the environment and in the forestry industry, can be lost on a lot of people. However, it's complex, and I appreciate that, but it's a policy area that is so important, so important for thousands of people uh, who rely on a very strong industry, an industry that does uh, employ people in our regions, 
Um, and it is an area of interest, as I said, particularly in this place um, here in the Senate. But I can assure you that for me and for thousands of workers in my state who rely on this industry to make ends meet, these interests are hardly niche. And there are vital importance. For the forestry industry in this country, the implications of the federal court decision were very significant. They threw, out, they threw in doubt the legal framework within which um, the, the forestry activity operates. Regional forestry agreements are essential legal instruments to the Australian forestry industry and each tailored to be a specific geographical area. Now, these agreements provide forestry operators with the certainty they need to carry out their work, very important work. Recognising the significant uh, environmental approval processes proposed, forestry activity must complete before proceeding at a state level. Regional forestry agreements allow these processes to stand as those that apply to the forested area rather than those of the EPBC Act. Indeed, it was never the intention of the EPBC Act to provide the legal framework for forestry operations. This is why regional forestry agreements exist. That's why they exist. Now, with great relief to myself and many others, uh, in May 2021, the full bench of the federal court handed down a unanimous decision which upheld Vic Forest's appeal to the previous federal court decision reinstating the long-standing status quo regarding how regional forestry agreements interact with the EPBC Act. Now, this is a, very, a big win, a major win, I might say, for the industry and for the thousands of workers that rely on its continued existence for their own economic security. The later decision by the High Court of Australia to deny leave to appeal this second decision was of just as much relief. Uh, it provided industry with the certainty it needed, certainty that was lost on the federal court decision. Unfortunately, uh, Deputy President, those opposite appear to not be aware of these essential and very important facts. This should hardly be a surprise. After all, you know, those opposites aren't really interested in delivering for very key industries in my home state, like forestry, and it really is disappointing to see them rehashing old bills from the previous parliament. But what was also more disappointing and probably not even acknowledged uh, by the contributions uh, by the good Senator, uh, Senator Dunham, um, someone who I've worked very closely with on a number of issues in this place, but one of the recommendations that came out of the uh, inquiry, the Senate inquiry into this bill, Deputy President, was, was and, as, and I'll read it out for the benefit of uh, new senators as well, 2.71, recommendation number three. In the event that the federal court decision of 10 May 2021 in relation to Vic Forest's appeal to the decision in Friends of Leadbed Opossums versus Vic Forest's number four is appealed and at the time the Australian government has not legislated the outcome required by recommendation one, the committee recommends that the Senate pass the appeal. Now, the only thing about that, that recommendation is that the appeal was actually denied. The appeal, the appeal was actually denied. So therefore, if you take the Liberal Party's recommendation from the, the previous inquiry, then we really should not be even be here today debating this bill. Because the recommendation is that we should proceed only when the appeal was successful, but it wasn't. So quite frankly, it is redundant. I'm surprised we're even wasting the Senate's time this morning even debating such a bill. Um, but you know, it's, it's as I said earlier in my contributions, it is no surprise, given that they are scrambling to find, to find bills to even debate in this place. Well, I'm sorry, uh, Senator Scard, to take your interjection, but uh, not trying to be negative, just being truthful, just putting the facts on the table. Um, you know, quite frankly, it is disappointing. Um, it is also disappointing to see, as I was trying to make a point earlier um, this morning, not to be, again, negative, Senator Scard, but it is disappointing the opposition have not provided uh, names for committees in this place, because quite frankly, I'd like to get stuck into business as much you would as well too. I know the Nationals uh, were very keen to get an inquiry into biosecurity, which I'm very keen. I'm very happy that this Senate supported my motion, but we don't have a chair. Why don't we have a chair? Because the National Party and the Liberal Party haven't provided the Senate an opportunity with names for committee order. membership, Mr. De Deputy President.
Mr Deputy President, relevance. Uh, I, whilst I understand uh, Senator Ciccone is, uh, is concerned about the issue of committee memberships and raised it earlier in the proceedings today, it hardly can be in any way relevant to the bill under consideration. I draw you back to the bill at hand. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Um, I, look, I know it's a sensitive issue, but look, I thank you very much for your uh, ruling there, Deputy President. Um, as I was saying, uh, my early contribution in, in, in my first, uh, uh, sorry, in, in the speech from earlier today, it is just disappointing to see the opposition again not bring forward a bill that the Senate can actually deal with today, that actually deals with real issues that matter to working people. Quite frankly, it is disappointing that we are here, first day of the second sitting week, having to deal with a bill that is, quite frankly, redundant, will not take any impact, will not have any impact, practical effect on working people even by their own recommendation, recommendation number three, which makes it very clear in the event that the appeal was denied by the High Court that we should not even proceed with this bill. And yet we're here dealing with a bill that shouldn't even be spoken about today, because quite frankly it has no practical impact. But anyway, what else are we going to talk about today other than the opposition just bringing forward old legislation from the 46th Parliament? But Depu uh, Acting Deputy President, um, as we um, have stated, the first time this bill came to the Senate, the time when the opposition's now uh, environment spokesperson and, and, and the former assistant minister for forestry vehemently opposed it. We do not support piecemeal amendments to the EPBC Act. And that's very important. We don't. It's important that we do these in a much more coordinated, collaborative fashion rather than this piecemeal approach that we saw in the previous parliament and I really hope we don't see in this new parliament going forward. Um, our approach, well, um, Senator Scar, you know, you like to interject, but uh, I will say it's not been again negative. It's just being truthful with the Australian people. We are just being quite frank and putting all the facts on the table. Um, as Senator Green and others in this place have seen in the last three years, the negativity of the previous government. What we want to see is outcomes, outcomes that matter to working people, outcomes that will change their lives. Outcomes that support vital industries right around this country, like forestry, like forestry. You know, where are those one billion trees that the, 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 that the former government, the coalition government promised? Not one tree was, was planted. Not one tree was planted, Senator Macdonald. I don't think they're growing, sadly. I don't think they're growing because not one was actually put in the ground. I mean, I've got a shovel ready to go. We should start planting those trees. Come on, let's do it. We know that the previous government, the previous government promised one billion trees, and then at the last election said, "Oh, actually, we're only going to promise now a couple hundred, couple of hundred million instead of the one billion that they had promised." So again, you know, we see the opposition who are constantly backflipping all the time when they promise one thing to the Australian people, then after the election, go back on their word, and that was the rhetoric and the narrative of the of the previous Morrison government. The previous Morrison government was all spin and no substance, or spin and no substance. And wages, just to take the interjections across the aisle, uh, Deputy President, wages actually are going up. And the one thing that we did, the first thing we did, in fact, when we came into government, signed by the Prime Minister, was to put a submission to the Fair Work Commission to support Australian workers. So when it comes to Australian workers, we know, we know who's on the side of workers. It's unfortunately not senators on opposite of the government. Sorry, Senator Macdonald, but you know that is the case. Why did your Prime Minister then sign off on a submission to the Fair Work Commission? Why? Why? But look, to go back to the point that we are discussing today, which is forestry and some, an area of policy that is very close to my heart, an area that is very close to my heart, and Senator Green knows I've spoken about forestry many times. Many, many times, as, uh, as Senator Rice also knows, an area that we have spoken about many times in this place, um, we might have slightly different views, but we do have a view that we need to protect the environment, but also protecting the sustainability of the industries going forward so we can enjoy both worlds. And I think it's very important that we actually do work together on these very, very sensitive but important areas of policy. Um, but Deputy, um, acting Deputy President, good to see you, Acting Deputy President. Congratulations on your swearing in uh, earlier last week. Um, I also just want to make the point that, before I finish off my contributions, 
Those opposite, um, in concern how to use their, their precious senator's time in this place in the future, they ought to perhaps focus on bringing forth bills that actually have importance and actually have import to the problems that we are all seeking to solve. You know, the nine and a half years of inaction, let's try and work together. Let's try and work together, rather than this nonsense that we keep seeing from those opposite. Uh, I really do hope that we don't start off on a bad foot here with the opposition bringing forward bills in private senators' time that don't have any practical impact on the lives of working people. That is something that I really do implore on those opposite, and I really do ask them, if they are very serious about changing the lives of uh, working people, maybe they can start by bringing forward a list, a list of senators. Uh, who can actually participate in our committee system, because I think it's very important that we start doing the important work that this committee, that this Senate is meant to do, which is scrutinise legislation and deliver for working people. Thank you, Senator Giacchini. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. This bill is shameless. It is an unbridled, completely huge onslaught on our precious native forests. Not only is it shameless, Sadly, as Senator Ciccone has just told us in his contribution, it is irrelevant because, sadly, the court cases that have gone, been completed over the last couple of years have shown that our native forest logging laws, the regional forest agreements, are totally broken. They do not protect wildlife. We have species going to the brink. We have leadbeater's possums now critically endangered. We have greater gliders, which have now, just in the last few months, been declared as endangered because of the impact of native forest logging. And yet our logging laws are not protecting them. This bill came about because of the number of legal cases being brought by the community, being brought by scientists, being brought by wildlife ecologists, people concerned about our native forests, about illegal logging, logging of threatened species that was occurring in Victoria. And the initial findings in the Supreme Court was that, yes, this logging was threatening precious native wildlife. It was threatening species that are listed under our federal environment laws as matters of national significance. And the original judgment found that logging in the 66 areas subject to the case was in breach of Victorian environment laws, and that in 17 of the areas investigated, up to 600 greater gliders may have been impacted and killed by the state's logging appeals. However, what we found in the appeal was that the finding that said that our logging laws were broken was dismissed, not because the environmental impact was dismissed. No, the appeal actually found that all of the grounds of the initial finding that the logging that was occurring was illegal, that was all upheld. Yes, the logging that was occurring was having a massive impact on our native forests and our, on our wildlife. Why the appeal was upheld was it basically said that our regional forest agreements allowed this to occur. They are broken, totally broken, and our forests are suffering. So rather than having legislation that seeks to consolidate this, that can, seeks to say that's exactly how we want it, we want ongoing native forest logging that's going to continue to destroy our wildlife, continue to send our forest-dependent wildlife to the brink of extinction, rather than acknowledging we've got a problem here if we're concerned about our native forest wildlife, we actually maybe we need to protect them. No. The former government, the Liberal National Party, are now debating legislation and continuing to debate legislation that actually says we support this status quo. We want this industry to continue to continue to decimate our native forest wildlife. It is absolutely shameless. I want to talk us through what the state of play actually currently is, because if you listen to Senator Dunning and you listen to Senator Ciccone just now, now, they would have you believe that everything is fine, that we've got best practice logging activities, that we don't need to worry one jot. However, anyone that knows anything about what's going on in our forests, anybody who sees what's going on in our forests, realises it is totally unacceptable. Every wildlife ecologist that is working in the area of forest ecology says that what is currently happening is totally unacceptable. 
And of course, it's not just wildlife that native forest logging is impacting. It is water, it is carbon, and it is our forests as places of beauty and inspiration, and it is our forests as being sovereign lands of our First Nations peoples, sovereign lands that contain totem species of our First Nations peoples. All of this is under attack by native forest logging. Let's just start with water. I mean, in Melbourne, we are lucky to have some of the highest quality drinking water in the world. And a key reason for this is because of our forests. And it's through the trees, the roots, the branches, the soil, the surrounding of our mountain ash and forest ecosystems that Melbourne's largest water supply catchment filters water naturally. And any disturbance to these forests, any logging of these forests, any disturbance to these forests has detrimental impacts on the quality and the quantity of our water supply. And without this forest, our water would require intensive man-made filtering and it just would not be as good quality water. When it comes to carbon, we know that the, carbon, the ability of our forests to be soaking up carbon, to be storing carbon, is absolutely unmatched, unmatched anywhere in the world. The forests of Australia are, contain some of the most carbon-dense ecosystems in the world, and yet logging them is massively impacting on them. There was a recent report into Tasmania's forest carbon that showed that the native forest logging industry was in fact the highest emitting industry in Tasmania, with 4.65 million tonnes of carbon being emitted each year because of logging activities. And the contrast is what would occur if we just allowed those forests to just keep on growing old and to be protected rather than being logged. And that report found that there would be 75 million tonnes of carbon would be absorbed by these forests, these so-called production forests, by 2050 if they were protected rather than logged, and that it would allow $2.6 billion benefit in climate mitigation, thus by protecting our forests rather than logging them. And then, of course, let's talk about the value of our forests for our wildlife. And we've got case after case where the impact of logging on our wildlife has been exposed in the court and that the logging that is occurring is illegal. I mean, there was a report by the ABC last December that exposed the widespread illegal logging of hundreds of hectares of mountain ash forests by the Vic government's own logging agency, Vic Forests. And documents that showed that the Office of the Conservation Regulator, which is the body tasked with enforcing our state logging laws and monitoring Vic Forest, was alerted to the agency's illegal activity, but it failed to properly investigate. And even after admission by Vic Forest in 2019 that they were illegally logging protected areas, the regulator found the allegations of widespread illegal logging could not be substantiated. So, so much for Senator Dunningham's case that we have got the best um, regulated forest, um, forest logging regime in the world. We have got widespread illegal logging going on in our forests that is being permitted by our state logging agencies. And I mean, the case that I was just talking about of Vic Forest's lawless logging of our mountain ash forests, which was shown to be impacting on threatened species, species the critically endangered wallet or the leadbeater's possum, it goes on unregulated by our federal agencies and endangering in doing so our water supply, countless, the habitat of countless other species and destroying the country of First Nations peoples. So, I mean, let me quote after the, the, the case, the appeal was dismissed um, in, the, in the federal court last year. There was an article by ecologist and professor of conservation biology, Brendan Wintel, which explains why we are debating this outrageous bill today. And he said that Australia's forest-dwelling wildlife is in greater peril after last week's court ruling that logging, even if it breaches state requirements, is exempt from the federal law that protects threatened species. The federal court upheld an appeal by Vic Forest, Victoria State Timber Corporation, after a previous ruling in May 2020 found it raised critical habitat without taking the precautionary measures required by law. And the ruling means logging is set to re resume despite the threats it poses to wildlife, and at particular risk are the leadbeater's possum and the greater glider. 
mammals that are highly vulnerable to extinction that call the forests home. So there are catastrophic consequences. And since the commencement of the regional forest agreements over 20 years ago, we have seen more than a quarter of the federally listed forest dependent species move closer to extinction. In these decades, we have seen 15 forest vertebrate species to be listed as threatened for the first time. This is the impact that native forest logging is having on our wildlife. Our laws are broken. Our environment laws are broken. We are in an environmental crisis. We cannot afford to push more species closer to the extinction. Our laws need to be strengthened urgently, not weakened, which is what this bill would seek to do. So, I mean, if this was passed, this bill would basically just say it would consolidate the position that would make forestry activities within regional forest agreements exempt totally from any scrutiny under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Act, regardless of whether they are being undertaken in compliance with the regulations that are set out in the Regional Forest Agreement. I mean, it's apparent. You look at the history, you look at the devastation that native forest logging has caused of Australia's forests over the, the decades, and particularly under the last 20 years of the Regional Forest Agreements, that Vic Forest and other logging agencies they don't need any more exemptions. They are already able to recklessly destroy forests critical to the survival of wildlife, to water and to carbon. We're going to I mean, some of the other illegal logging activities that what our state logging agencies are not managing is the whole claim that the industry like to make that for every tree that they log that, they, that more regrow. You might recall that there was revelations that were covered by the ABC last year that showed that Vic Forest actually fails to regenerate sections of harvested forests, despite those claims. And according to the Victorian government, I mean, they claim that there's 85 to 95 per cent of the time logged areas were successfully re regenerated within three years, but yet documents obtained under Freedom of Information reveal that at least 30 per cent of harvested areas weren't regenerated in this time frame, which means this claim that we are regenerating our forests after logging—I mean, you cannot regenerate a 100-year-old forest anyway. You cannot regenerate the habitat for those critical, system, critical species, but even the claim that we regrow the trees that are logged, 30 per cent of those logging operations failed to regenerate. So we have got to a situation where we need to change. We need to strengthen our environment laws. We need to be protecting our forests. We need to be getting native, native forest logging out of our native forests. We need to be protecting them for their water, their wildlife, their carbon, for their places of beauty and inspiration. Yet, what are we doing? We've still got bills like this being proposed. We've still got the new government, you know, Senator Chicone, the member of the, of the new government, saying that he's absolutely in favour of ongoing native forest logging. And we have got state legislation that is continuing to not just protect our, to not protect our forests, but in fact to persecute people who are trying to protect it. I mean, the Victorian government is attempting to pass draft legislation that would mean people defending Victoria's forests could be imprisoned for up to a year or receive up to $21,000 in fines for trying to protect our precious forests. And this draft legislation would also introduce powers to search vehicles, to confiscate personal belongings and ban people from being in public forests based on suspicion of an offence. This is where we're at. We have got the majority of the Australian population want to be protecting our wildlife. They know that it's important. They know that it's critical to who we are as a people that our wildlife is protected. And yet people who are trying to protect our wildlife are now being threatened with up to a year in jail or $21,000 in, fine, in fines. Totally unnecessary and disproportionate provisions for people and non-violent protesters who want to protect forests. And we've got similar anti-protest laws that have been introduced in Tasmania and New South Wales parliaments. I mean, the freedom to protest is absolutely fundamental to a functioning democracy, as it allows people to voice their disquiet and bring change in, into effect. 
and these laws would prevent and, legitim and penalise legitimate protests by community groups and forest defenders who are seeking to hold these logging companies like Vic Forest accountable for potentially illegal activities. And that also, these anti-protest laws would also prevent traditional owners from protecting country and their totems, which rely on the forest to survive. And additionally, these draconian measures they will restrict the work of wildlife carers and citizen science, who are absolutely critical to understanding and caring for our native flora and, and fauna. And so, I mean, we need to be protecting the freedom to, to protest. And to allow that, we need to make sure that those draconian anti-protest laws must be stopped. We urgently need stronger laws to be protecting our magnificent forests. We need to be strengthening our environment laws. We need to be getting rid of the regional forest agreements. We need to be getting native forest logging out of our forests. And yet, here we have a private senator's bill, which is basically representing a final attempt by the native forest logging industry to lobby for additional exemptions from basic environmental protections. Enough is enough. Right now we are facing a climate crisis and we are facing an environment crisis. We have to protect our forests and we need to be act, act now to do that. Senator Rice. Senator Macdonald. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to uh, also speak to this private senator's bill. I always think it's fascinating to spend some time in the chamber listening to the contributions of various uh, senators who all represent different uh, parts of the country. Uh, and I always listen uh, closely to Senator Rice because she is always incredibly sincere and passionate in her uh, defence of her region and, uh, and the environment. Um, I come from the other end of the country, in Queensland, where we have had a proud history of incredibly considered uh, timber cutting. And so, uh, while Senator Ciccone made some representations on representing uh, workers, I would suggest that that has long been uh, the role of the National Party, is to ensure that primary industries, of which I include timber cutting to be one, be represented. And the certainty uh, that's required for uh, those people who are still operating in the Maribyrnong region, uh, those people who are operating the Cape, the uh, native title holders and indigenous uh, people of the, the north who are now accessing their own uh, hardwood timbers, that they be given the rights and opportunities to uh, develop their industries uh, in an appropriate and sensitive and well-regulated environment. And that is something that I believe uh, is in the best interests of our communities, of our people, and of course in being able to utilise the most renewable and sustainable uh, resource there is, probably other than sugarcane, uh, but is uh, timber. And so I rise to, to support this legislation uh, in its attempt to provide certainty, in its attempt to uh, allow the men and women who are employed mm. in the timber industry, uh, particularly under the RFAs, to have a sense uh, that they will not be uh, held up or have the, the uh, industry that they are so passionate about and work so hard in uh, to be um, in any way curtailed. The EPBC Act is one that, uh, as we all know, is incredibly difficult to deal with. And in Queensland, particularly in the far north of the state, uh, it is not uncommon for projects to get to seven or eight years to spend you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in consultants' fees before they just withdraw and walk away from uh, investment in our part of the state. Now, I think that's a, an incredible tragedy because uh, we are crying out for jobs for those communities. Um, as Senator McCarthy was talking about in the chamber the other day, of purposeful, meaningful work, and that only happens when we approve projects and allow for investment to go forward. And, uh, and certainty is a very important part of that. Uh, again, in Queensland, we had a, a timber industry that was so successful, so environmentally light in its touch, uh, that the, the, the region was nominated for World Heritage listing. It was so pristine after a hundred years of logging. And I speak to some of those, well, particularly men, who came out as immigrants from different parts of the country to go into timber cutting. 
and they understand and they know that country as well as anyone. They talk about which tree to take and from which direction. And during the school holidays, I took my son and we drove up the Kirima Range Road uh, to the Blenko Falls, which was the old timber cutting uh, track uh, to allow the, the timber to come more directly down to, to the coast, to the, um, to the mills, rather than work their way around. Uh, the other Karanda Range and other more uh, further away roads. Anyway, beautiful. And it is impossible to see where those timber activities used to be because they have now been completely um, regrown. And, uh, and the, some of the timber cutters tell me that if they went back a month after they'd cut, it was difficult to see where they were. But certainly six months or a year later, um, all traces of their activities were were gone. Such was the sensitive touch that they had in that part of the country. And so I think some of Senator Rice's comments were, uh, I'm sure, well made, but they're really better directed at the state government, the Victorian government, who is uh, failing to carry out the work that they are required to do under their regulations. You know, in Queensland, we have a fully sustainable hardware, hardwood industry. It is highly regulated. Uh, and it is something that we should be incredibly proud of, is the expertise and knowledge of our uh, timber workers and industry. But what they do require is certainty to know that they will still be able to operate in the months and years ahead, that they will be able to bring their children into that industry and pass on that deep knowledge of, of understanding the forests, the timbers they take and how it, it uh, continues to make it healthy. Uh, previously, we used to have more fires uh, and more um, uh, events that would have managed forests and, and rangelands in a different way. Uh, as humans, we now try and stop that from happening. We fear fire. And of course, the result has been that we've got uh, growth in different places that, that was, be was being managed by timber cutters, by the forestry industry, and we are now leaving parts of the country uh, completely exposed to the hot fires that we've had uh, more recently. So I support this, this uh, private senator's bill. I recommend it to you because I do believe it provides a sense of certainty for the uh, RFAs and the people who work in them, the people who have deep expertise and sensitivity for the place they work, the communities that, that they live in. Thank you. Thank you, Senator MacDonald. Senator Green. Oh. Uh, thank you, Acting President. Um, very uh, pleased to be speaking on this private senator's bill this morning. Um, and it's clear that uh, every speaker who comes to the chamber today to speak on this bill um, is choosing to highlight um, different areas that this bill touches on, uh, different parts of the industry, talking about our environment. I would like to take this opportunity to really reflect on the con context of the work to reform the EPBC Act and what this bill does in highlighting the failures of the previous government to do that. The bill itself um, being brought here today by the opposition after 10 years in government really highlights that they failed to reform the EPBC Act, Act and protect our environment when they had the chance to do that. They had a decade to deliver certainty to industries and to build a framework to protect our environment. But instead, the Liberal National Party defunded the Environment Department, hid crucial reports, presided over a decline in the state of the environment, and for too long they used the environment and climate change as opportunities to wedge the Labor Party and create political division. Well, our Labor government will reform the EPBC Act and we will respond to the Samuels Review and we will establish an environmental protection agency. The Albanese government is focused on tackling spiralling, spiralling costs of living that is making life tough for too many Australians. And while we get on with the job of delivering for Australian people during these difficult economic times, the Liberal National Party is focused on these types of bills, redundant, cheap political st stunts still aimed at wedge politics. The EPBC Act is the Commonwealth's central piece of environment legislation and it provides a national legal framework for environmental and heritage protection and the conservative biodiversity. This bill would amend 
the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act and the Regional Forest Agreements Act to make it that, that all forestry operations covered by the RFAs are exempt from Part 3 of the EPBC Act. But the private senator's bill that is before the chamber today was brought about after a decision of a single judge of the federal court in the Friends of Leadbeater's Possums v Victoria Forest, in which the court found that whilst operations in accordance with the RFAs are exempt from provisions in the EPBC Act, forestry operations were not considered. But this decision, as been explained by my colleagues this morning, uh, was appealed by Vic Forest, and the full court of the federal court upheld that appeal on the 10th of May. And further to that, the High Court has dismissed or denied leave um, to appeal that decision. Uh, that means that this bill in itself, in the current form, uh, is redundant. And the relationship between the bill and the court decision is important in terms of context for this bill today. But it's the further context uh, that needs to be considered about how this bill came to be introduced in the previous government and where we were in terms of legislative reform of the EPBC Act at the time that this bill was introduced. The bill was introduced to the Senate under the previous government and a Senate inquiry was held. Lots of um, evidence was taken. Mm -hmm. uh, but the bill itself was a sign of disunity and dysfunction from the previous government. It was introduced by a Morrison government senator, but it did not reflect the Morrison government policy at the time. And yet the theatrics from government benches epitomised the former government, a government focused on dividing Australians instead of delivering for them. The Act itself requires an independent review of the operation of the Act to the extent to which um, the objects of the Act have been achieved. So every 10 years, someone is required to review the Act, and that happened. And the Samuel review commenced on the 29th of October 2019. It was led by Professor Graham Samuels, and an interim report of the review was presented to the previous government on June 2020. The final report, the final report of the Samuel review, was presented to the government in October 2020. And I raise this because it's incredibly important to understand that in, in relation to the final report, Professor Samuel asserts that the Act itself is outdated and presents a barrier to holistic, holistic environmental management. And to address these deficiencies, the final report called for extensive reform of the EPBC Act and a fundamental shift in Australia's environmental management from transaction-based approach focused on individual projects to a one centred on effective and adaptive planning. This report was delivered at the same time that this bill was introduced into the Senate. And the previous government was yet to provide a formal response to the independent statutory review. They never responded to the report. They never amended the legislation. They failed at every step to do what was required of them to reform the Act and to deliver protection for our environmental systems. Proponents of this bill believe that the measures are necessary to ensure operational certainty for industry and clarifying how the provisions work. But we know, as we've said, since the High Court denied leave, that that is not required now. But what is required and what has always been required to balance protecting our environment and providing certainty to proponents and to industries should have been done already by the previous government is a response to the Samuels review and reforming of the entire EPBC Act. That is the work that should have been done by the previous government. So to be here now and to be looking at a piece of legislation that seeks to amend a small part, a small part of this Act points to the failures of the previous government to address entire reform when it comes to uh, the way our environment is regulated, the way it is protected and the way that industries work with the environment. When the bill was previously considered, Labor senators held the view that EPBC reform should not proceed in an ad hoc unconsidered piecemeal manner, but by way, by way of a private senator's bill, given the significance of the nation's environmental laws and the importance of getting those reforms right. The fact of the matter is that those opposite had a decade to reform the Act, and they failed to do so. Even the former government's Liberal-controlled Senate committee at the time refused to support this bill. 
They couldn't deliver reforms. They could never do the hard work to bring Australians together. They were solely focused on political point scoring. Nothing much has changed in opposition. This bill brings that into focus. And can we really take seriously anything, anything that those officers say about the environment? The Independent Samuel Review concluded that environmental laws needed reform. At every opportunity that the previous government had to genuinely reform Australia's laws, they failed to do so. They are the same people who buried the State of the Environment report. And the previous minister, who is now the deputy opposition leader, received it before Christmas, decided to keep it away, locked away before the federal election. And we understand now why, now that report has been delivered. They, the State of the Environment report, which was finally revealed to the Australian people, um, showed that we've lost more mammal species to extinction than any other continent that threatened communities have grown by 20 per cent in the past five years, with places literally burned into endangerment by catastrophic fires, that the Murray-Darling fell to its lowest water level on record in 2019, and that for the first time Australia now has a more foreign plant species than native ones. I can see why they kept this report secret, because it shows just how damaging the wasted decade the wasted decade of environmental neglect was in this country. They cut funding to the Environment Department, they repealed climate legislation, they failed to deliver the Murray-Darling Basin, they ignored the Samuel report, which said that our laws were broken, and that's why they hid the report. And that's why they never stepped in to reform the EPBC Act as a whole. Well, last week, the Minister for the Environment, Tanya Plibersek, mapped out our government's approach to reform of this important law. The government will formally, finally respond to the Samuel Review this year. We will then develop new environmental legislation for 2023, and we will create a new environmental protection agency to enforce the law properly. While the government consults on this generational reform, we will not be accepting any stunts from those opposite when it comes to the Environment and EPBC Act. As our first act in the new parliament, we're legislating more, more ambitious emissions reduction targets. We're setting a goal of protecting 30 per cent of our land and ocean by 2030. And we're reforming our environmental laws to finally build trust, integrity and efficiency into the system. After nine years of wasted time, after nine years of going backwards on the environment, Labor is finally taking a step forward. And this bill, this private senator's bill today, demonstrates again the lack of urgency, the lack of priority, the lack of care when it comes to our environment from those opposite. That all they, are, all they do care about is coming in here and playing politics, playing wedge politics with our environment, with industries that rely on the environment, with our forestries, with our forestry workers. They're not. They're not here to deliver the reform that our country requires. They're here to play politics and to make sure that nobody ever takes a step forward in the things that need to be done. I seek leave to, to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Green. I call the clerk. Order of the day number 12. United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Thorpe. Deputy President, I move that this bill be now read a second time. In March, I introduced this bill to the 46th Parliament, and it is my pleasure to speak to it today. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, or UNDRIP, is an opportunity for the new Labor government to prove that they are committed to action, not symbolism, for First Nations people. Passing this bill would make honouring, respecting and protecting First Nations people's rights one of your first acts in government. This could be a historical moment. People in this building cannot claim 
to be serious about First Nations justice and hang up their dot paintings and call for Black Lives Matter if you vote against this bill. <coughs> First Nations rights are human rights. If we want to make this country a better place, we need to start taking human rights seriously. This bill doesn't spell out exactly how the government needs to enact the undrept. The bill instead requires the government to prepare an implementation plan to achieve the objectives of UNDRIP and to work towards ensuring that our current and future laws respect First Nations rights. Passing this bill means putting First People in the driver's seat when it comes to making decisions about our communities, our culture and our country. The UNDRIP is the most comprehensive international instrument on the rights of Indigenous people around the world, and not just First Nations people of this continent we now call Australia. The UNDRIP establishes a universal framework of minimum standards for the survival, dignity and well-being of First Nations people and also expands on existing human rights and freedoms as they apply to Indigenous peoples worldwide and to First Nations people of this continent. The UNDRIP is particularly significant because First Nations people of this country, our elders, academics and activists, were involved in its drafting. The UNDRIP covers human rights relating to First Nations peoples, including self-determination, participation in decision-making, respect and protection for culture and equality and non-discrimination. These are all essential demands my people have been fighting for ever since the colonisation of this country. We don't have to wait until next year or for a referendum to start protecting and promoting First Nations rights. The declaration was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in September 2007. This country was one of just four countries to vote against it at the time. While the Australian government finally endorsed the UNDRIP in 2009, and committed at international forums to take actions to implement it. We have seen nothing, no meaningful action. The Australian government identified that closing the gap was a strategy to key policy reform and that it would give effect to the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. However, most of the measures under the strategy are woefully lacking in ambition and, despite this, most are not on track to be met at all. Closing the gap is a farce. Our people have waited long enough. All we have received are broken promises, lip service and straight-up lies. We are not willing to wait any more. We are dying at the hands of a racist system. Our children and land were and are still being stolen today. Country, culture and languages destroyed even today. But we are strong and we are capable despite this racist system trying to destroy us. We have fought and will continue to fight until we finally have some justice. The time to act is now. And one of the key aspects of the UNDRIP is free, prior and informed consent. Free means we're able to make our own choices without coercion. Prior 
means we have adequate time to make those decisions. Informed means that we have all of the relevant information before making our decision. Now, I don't think that's too much to ask. It enables us to protect country and sacred sites. Free, prior and informed consent would have saved the Jukan Gorge. It would have saved and stopped the fracking at the Beedaloo. And it would save the Japarung trees on my country. It means that First Nations people are in charge of the policies that affect us and enable us to say no. These policies will, therefore, be much more effective at closing the gap. Through enacting UNDRIP, we will finally have to look properly at our decision-making processes and have different levels of government work with First Nations communities around the country and ensure that they are being genuinely consulted and that their opinions are genuinely and respectfully heard. To some of you, auditing our laws, policies and practices as to whether they comply with the UNDRIP and then develop an action plan on how to actually change them, as this bill would require, might seem daunting, even threatening. It is going to take time and not be easy. Sometimes this will be painful, for many, I'm sure. But to me, it does not seem daunting. To me, it seems among many other things, that there will be less First Nations communities seeking my help because their country or their sacred sites are being threatened to be destroyed by mining companies. To me, thinking that this country can be so courageous as to look at its past and present to learn from it and improve what we are doing it fills me with hope. It fills me with hope that there could be a brighter future ahead, not just for First Nations people, but for everyone in this country. As we are building a juster and more equal society that respects human dignity and human rights, Canada has already passed their United Nations Declaration on the Rights for Indigenous Peoples, and New Zealand have established a working group whose report outlines a political aspiration to meet compliance with the UNDRIP. This is our moment to lead the way in this country for First Nations justice internationally. This is the moment. We have a so-called progressive Labor government who want a voice to parliament, who want to talk truth, who want to talk treaty. So this is a moment. We have the power to do this now. We don't have to worry about the opposition who wants to bring this down and sees it as a threat. It's not going to take people's homes. It is no threat. It is to empower the oldest continuing living culture on this earth. Today, I urge all my colleagues in this place to put your actions into words, to put your Black Lives Matter posters into words, to put your dot paintings and the support for hanging those in your offices, put it into words. We can together improve the lives of First Nations people in this country. I look forward to working with you all and getting on with business 
I hope that we don't hear too much racism in this place as we progress First Nations rights and justice. And I ask you all again, living on stolen land means you have a responsibility. And this is your responsibility today. Uphold the rights of Indigenous people in this country and show leadership once and for all that we are or we could be or we, or we are on the path to be a United Nation. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. I call Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy, Acting Deputy, no, President. Yeah, President. Um, I rise to speak on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of uh, Indigenous Peoples Bill. And I listen very closely to my colleague over there and the passion behind it. And uh, as I early, my earlier years went to Geneva to help work on this particular bill, this particular declaration, under the great leadership of Madame Diaz, the subcommittee of the Human Rights Commission. So uh, my association with this bill goes back a long way, and these sentiments and this declaration. And I, and I move the second reading amendment uh, standing in my name, which would refer to the bill would refer the bill to the newly constituted uh, Joint Standing Committee on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs. The adoption of the declaration by the United Nations General Assembly in 2017 was an historic moment for First Nations peoples around the world. It was a culmination of more than 20 years of negotiations which included notable First Nations leaders from this country. It stands as the most comprehensive international instrument on the rights of Indigenous peoples. 18 countries around the world apply human rights standards to First Nations peoples. It is a source of shame that Australia under the Howard government was, the only, was only one of four nations to vote against the 2007 resolution in the General Assembly. It is a source of pride to those of us on this side of the chamber that the Rudd Labor government reversed that, this position and formally expressed Australia's support for the declaration in 2009. While non-binding, the declaration carries significant moral force. The government supports the aspirational principles underlying the declaration, and we agree with the intent of this bill that we should align our actions to these principles. This bill is closely modelled on legislation that was first passed in Canada last year. That legislation provides a useful model and starting point for our country as it moves towards a greater implementation of the important principles of this declaration. But it is important to make sure that a meaningful consultation with First Nations peoples on this bill and the best methods of implementing the UNDRIP uh, takes place in our country. Earlier this year, the Senate referred an inquiry into the application of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in Australia to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Reference Committee. This inquiry lapsed in the last parliament, but not, uh, but not before 992 uh, people and organisations made submissions, many of which support the need for better implementation of the declaration. Those who made submissions, including the Australian Human Rights Commission, the Law Council and multiple First Nations individuals and organisations. The work that, was, that has gone into these submissions deserves our attention as we consider and take the next steps towards implementing the declaration. And that is why the second reading amendment I have moved this morning will ensure that a new inquiry will be established with references to this, these submissions and work that was done in the last parliament. An inquiry in this committee will have the ability to hear from the First Nations and other Australians directly on how they want the declaration to be implemented. Importantly, it will also be able to hear expert evidence about how the Canadian law is working in practice. It's worth acknowledging that the Canadian Act has not been without criticism from First Nations Canadians. This includes the criti criticism that it was passed without sufficient community engagement. 
At the time it was passing, Canadian academic Ken Coates uh, and Heather uh, Eno Pirot wrote in the Vancouver Sun, and I quote, properly done, the legislation could only be a unifying and transformative act. Instead, this legislation was introduced in December in the midst of the pandemic, rushed through a truncated House of Commons agenda under, under close and, and is being pushed along with minimal public engagement and interest or interest. We can and should take uh, time to ensure meaningful consultation on this bill. Indeed, this is at the heart of the Declaration itself. Article 19 of the Declaration states, and I quote, states should consult and cooperate in good faith with the Indigenous peoples concerned through their own representative institutions in order to obtain their free, prior and informed consent before adopting and implementing legislative and administrative measures that may affect them. This article is one of the most important parts of the Declaration, and we should honour it in the way we consider the implementation of the Declaration itself in Australian law and policy. This does not mean we have to and we won't uh, wait to move uh, forward on the changes that are consistent with the Declaration and improves the lives of First Nations peoples. This government has historically uh, ambitious first, uh, and, uh, and historically ambitious First Nations agenda, and we look forward to working closely with Senator Thorpe and, and the Greens on that. We have um, committed to policies that are intended to improve people's lives in real ways, particularly in remote and regional Australia. And this includes replacing the punitive community development program with real jobs and real wages in remote communities, addressing incarceration and deaths in custody through landmark justice reinvestment funding, investing in housing in remote communities, including funding for homelands to support people to have better quality of life and, and greater uh, connection with culture, investing in more First Nations health workers and more community workers to assist women and children experiencing family violence in remote communities, doubling funding for Indigenous ranger programs. Labor established the first Closing the Gap Framework in 2008, and we will work with the Coalition of Peaks and all levels of government to raise the uh, ambition of the current, of the current uh, targets. And of course, we have uh, committed to uh, full implementation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, a great speech by our Prime Minister at Gama uh, just the last, on the last weekend. This weekend, I was proud to stand alongside the Prime Minister as he took the next steps towards a referendum on a voice to the parliament. And he told the participants at the Gama Festival on Yulunuri land, Australia does not have to choose between improving people's lives and amending the constitution. We can do both, and we have to, because 121 years of Commonwealth governments arrogantly believing they know enough to impose their own solutions on Aboriginal peoples has brought us to this point, this torment of powerlessness. Implementing this, the Uluru Statement in full will be a significant step forward in the protection and upholding of the rights of First Nations peoples. The words that the Prime Minister has proposed for the Constitution are derived from the work done by many committed Australians, First Nations and non-Indigenous peoples. This includes some of the same leaders that represented Australia in the international negotiations that resulted in this declaration. The proposed words for this uh, constitution are simple and straightforward, and I uh, take the opportunity to repeat them in the Senate chamber today. There shall be a, a body to be called the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Voice. The Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Voice may make representation to Parliament and the executive government on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And thirdly, the parliament shall, subject to this constitution, have power to make laws with respect to the composition, functions, powers and procedures of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander's voice. And these provisions would be accompanied by a simple question. Do you support an alteration to the constitution that establishes an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. 
As elected representatives, we have a chance to bring our communities together in this historic moment to answer that question with a resounding yes. I urge everyone in this chamber to come with us on this journey. I urge you to accept the hand of the First Nations peoples as generously as they extended it in our direction. And I urge you to walk with us in unity to a better and more reconciled future, to realise the hopes and the aspirations that uh, Senator Thorpe and others have, have spoken about. We are on a very, in a very exciting time. We have got many challenges, but we have got serious reform to make, and I look forward to working with all of you in this chamber on both goals, getting a successful referendum to establish a voice uh, uh, in our constitution and to working to make sure that the principles of the declaration through the committee's work is in fact uh, going to deliver the positives that we all hope for. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Senator Napanjimpa Price, please. I rise to speak to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People Bill 2022 presented to the Chamber by Senator Thorpe. I was reflecting on this bill over the weekend as I spent my time listening to Territorians speaking of the challenges experienced of living in two worlds and how, in order to thrive, living in a modern world with an ancient culture, we require honest and practical approaches. This bill is not a practical approach. It is a declaration. It is not a treaty. It is not binding under international law. Australia is therefore not required to enact the declaration in Australian law. We are one nation with one law and many belief systems of faith that personally guide us on ways of living. There are dangers of recognising customary law under the United Nations Declaration. The voices of the women and children that are subject to brutal sexual violence and misappropriated payback do not, do, do not serve any human right. We must stop this divisive virtue signalling. This bill is an unnecessary distraction from the important work that needs to be done that we as a coalition have invested heavily in. And we call on the Albanese government to continue to advance the practical measures to support our most vulnerable. We, the coalition, will always be focused on practical outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and this Labor Greens government should be focused on holding the states and territory governments and the Aboriginal organisations to account for the billions of dollars being poured into the, to alleviate disadvantage of the most marginalised Australians who are not meeting their funding agreements. One of the most basic human rights is to feel safe and to have access to safe housing. In the Northern Territory, the Labor Minister for Housing fought against these basic human rights by countersuing an Aboriginal organisation. The Minister for Housing at the time, Chancy Paik, didn't want to acknowledge the human rights of Aboriginal residents to humane conditions in their rental homes and was prepared to have his department stand up in court and argue that position. Get housing delivery right first, I say, a practical, basic human right. Significant practical work was done under the coalition government to improve the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians, and this practical work reflects the aims of the declaration. In government, the coalition invested in the human rights of Indigenous Australians. The coalition in government appointed June Oscar AO as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner. The commissioner works as part of the Australian Human Rights Commission to work on anti-discrimination and human rights for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. And I was only just this weekend listening to the important work that she has been doing, and I look forward to meeting her in the not-so-distant future. The coalition government addressed this basic practical human right by investing in housing. Under the National Partnership for Remote Housing in the Northern Territory, the coalition government contributed $550 million 
matched by the Northern Territory to equal $1.1 billion over five years to deliver 1,950 new bedrooms in remote communities through a combination of new houses and extensions to existing houses. Minister for Indigenous Australians Ken White called out the Minister for, for Housing, citing he was alarmingly concerned that the Northern Territory Labor government was not delivering the houses that it was funded to deliver. In regards to the human rights of children and child protection, on 10 December 2021, the coalition government delivered safe and supported the National Framework for Protecting Australia's Children 2021 to 2031, the successor plan to the National Framework for Protecting Australia's Children 2009 to 2020. Safe and Supported was developed in partnership with all states and territories and an Indigenous leadership group, with a focus on improving outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. On the 27th of October, the Australian government launched Australia's first, first national strategy to prevent and respond to child sexual abuse 2021 to 2030, the national strategy. It includes Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as a priority group. Under the coalition, the, de the Department of Social Services commenced delivery of a package of four new measures under the Closing the Gap Implementation Plan to deliver on target 12. 49 million over five years to improve multidisciplinary responses to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families with multiple and complex needs. 7.7 million over three years to develop the cultural competency and trauma responsiveness of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and non-Indigenous child and family sector workforce. 3.2 million over two years to assess the needs of, increase the involvement of and strengthen Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community-controlled organisations in the child and family sector. 38.6 million over three years for an outcomes and evidence fund to support the commissioning and implementation of outcome-based funding. In the coalition's last budget, we also undertook to make significant investment to improve the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. 1.1 billion for a range of measures to support the new agreement on closing the gap, and this included 254.4 million to improve existing or build new health infrastructure to deliver services to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, 81.8 million to help Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children to be safe, healthy, and ready to thrive in school by the age of five by expanding the Connected Beginnings program by an additional 27 sites. 74.9 million to build three additional studio schools in remote areas and refurbish another school into the studio schools format to provide education on country and build relationships with culture and local community. 66 million to expand existing alcohol and drug services to be funded through the Indigenous Advancement Strategy. 45 million to continue to work to improve the birth weight of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and improve health outcomes. The Coalition extended the National Partnership Agreement on Remote Aboriginal Investment by $173.2 million, which takes the total investment to over $1 billion since 2015-2016. We have to continue to focus on practical outcomes in this House and to not be consuming our time on unnecessary debate that will take away time from discussing legislative debate that will bring practical improvements for all Australians. Thank you, Senator Price. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. What an honour to follow Senator Price, a woman, a person, an Australian of integrity, a deeply caring and informed person, a practical person. As a servant, Mr Acting Deputy President, to the people of Queensland and Australia, I wish to indicate some concerns I have about this bill, which is both divisive and mostly unnecessary. Our country is Australia. Our country consists of people from many nations, cultures and religions, and from many racial groups, providing a rich tapestry of positive contributions to our Australian nation. What we do not want or need is legislation that picks out a particular cultural group and makes laws aimed at that particular cultural group, driving a potentially divisive web wedge between Aboriginal Australians and other Australians. It does not matter where a person comes from or what that person's cultural or racial background is. I am, you are, we are Australian are the words of a well-known theme song. And it's true. We know that and we do not need legislation that is geared to a them and us mentality that leads to a them versus us mentality. 
This bill is intended to affirm into Australian domestic law the contents and intention of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. This is a requirement necessary before the UN Declaration provisions become enforceable under Austra in Australian law. Aboriginal Australians, as Australians, already have the same rights as any other Australian right now. If there are gaps in services available to Aboriginal Australians, these gaps are due to poverty and remoteness, issues that affect many isolated people across our country. It's the failings of successive governments to adequately address health, housing, education and infrastructure that have led to many people, Aboriginal and otherwise, to fall into the poverty gap. I call on the, on the Australian government to address these issues with priority before considering this bill, which is unnecessary and does nothing more than acknowledging what already is in place for all Australians. This bill perpetuates the victimhood of Aboriginal people. It places blame on past cultural divides for the current plight of some Aboriginal minorities. There are many Aboriginal people in Australia who have access, accessed free education, worked hard and prospered as Australians in the broader community. I followed one in, this speaking, in the speaking roster. They do not need this bill. There are many Aboriginal Australians who would be offended by the content of this bill, which virtually enshrines a them and us mentality. The most divisive clause in this bill is Clause 7, which throws blame on colonisation for all the ills that prevent their right to develop in accord with their own needs and interests. All this in the face of facts that include determined native title claims now cover approximately half of the Australian landmass. Aboriginal Australians represent approximately 3.5 per cent of Australia's population. All Aboriginal children are entitled to scholarships to continue education through high school and beyond. Assistance to Aboriginal families has now become an enviable yet divisive issue within small remote communities where other minorities in similar living conditions are not able to access assistance at the same level. This is where the true problem lies. Treating Australians differently on the basis of race is racist, scientifically false, legally questionable, morally condemnable and socially unjust. It is simply wrong. I want to draw the Chamber's attention to three words, care, core and cure. That is what we must do if we really care for people. We must care enough to get the facts, to understand the core issue. Then and only then do we have any, any right to imp impose a cure or to propose a cure. Greens and Labor do the reverse. Cure first. Ignore the core. That shows they do not care. To truly care for any group of people, we need to care enough to understand their issues. And that means listening and having the courage to really listen. And then we must have the courage and the integrity to address those issues. Virtue signalling is hollow, dishonest and uncaring. Following the UN is hollow, dishonest, uncaring and selling out Australians, all Australians. I do not support this bill. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, look, uh, I think it's important and it's, it's been good to, to hear previous speakers on uh, this particular bill. And I do think that um, perhaps some, some clarity around a bit of the history uh, is important, certainly for me, as I uh, also reflect on the importance of this bill uh, coming before the Senate. And every senator has that right. It's why we're chosen and elected as senators to this place. We certainly support the principles of the declaration, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2007. And if we reflect on that year of 2007, and if I think about uh, my time in the parliament, both uh, here and also in the Northern Territory, that was also the year uh, when the John Howard uh, Prime Ministership and the government uh, intervened into the Northern Territory. And I think there, these are critical moments in history, uh, whichever way people choose to look at. But that intervention in the Northern Territory 
continued until only last month. And when I reflect on that, uh, that intervention at the time, for those of us who were in the Northern Territory Parliament, uh, it was perhaps one of the most significant moments of disempowerment as an elected member of parliament uh, in the Northern Territory at that particular time, because we didn't know uh, what was going on. I certainly didn't know. I'm sure I was not in the cabinet at the time. I'm sure they would have a different response to that. But as a elected member of North East Arnhem Land, representing thousands of, of Territorians, and not being able to have an opportunity to understand, to defend, debate, uh, discuss uh, what was going on. That was in the minds of the then government of the day, Mr Acting Deputy President. So it comes as no surprise that in that year of the declaration uh, at the United Nations, it comes as no surprise that the then government of the day, the Australian government of the day, did not sign the declaration. Uh, to have the same concerns for First Nations people in unity with First Nations uh, countries around the world, and obviously uh, we were the, one of the four that did not sign it at the time. It wasn't until the Rudd Labor government came in in 2007, late in 2007, that in 2009 they then did sign uh, this declaration, otherwise known as UNDRIP. So Australia then joined the international community and expressed its support for the declaration. Because the first thing that Prime Minister Rudd knew that he had to do was to also show that this was an Australia that did have compassion, that did listen to First Nations people and did agree with the world stage in terms of uh, the declaration for the rights of Indigenous people around the world. The declaration sets out non-binding principles, Mr Acting Deputy President, regarding the fundamental human rights of Indigenous peoples for nations to work towards. The Australian government supports the aspirational principles underlying this declaration. We're clearly still seeing some of the fallout uh, from the intervention in terms of no exit strategy. Uh, I think for anyone or any government to make such a massive decision, irrespective of political persuasion, when you intervene so dramatically in the lives of a population, there must always be a significant step out from that intervention. And that exit strategy was not clear. That exit strategy is something that we now have had to pick up and try and work, Mr Acting Deputy President with the people of the Northern Territory as to how we step out from that, which is unfortunate on one level because we know that this was not an urgency in terms of the time lapse of the Stronger Futures legislation. And the fact that there was no urgency in the time lapse showed that there could have been much better planning to step out of something where a group of people had been intervened on so dramatically and then we're just left to deal with that fallout by not stepping out from it with an appropriate exit strategy. In fact, I do recall uh, even uh, the former coalition foreign minister, Alexa Alexander Downer, in 2007, uh, suggested what the intervention could have meant for political gain for the coalition. And he said, when we intervened in the Northern Territory and the Indigenous communities, the actual initiative was very popular with the public but it didn't shift the opinion polls." End of quote. And the reason why I share this and remind the Senate is because we needed to reflect on why it was that the Australian Parliament did not sign up to this declaration in 2007. Mr Acting Deputy President, this bill should be referred uh, to a committee to finish the inquiry of the last parliament. I know uh, my colleague, Senator Dodson, has made references to it as well, uh, that on the 29th of March 2022 this year, the Senate, inquiry, uh, the Senate referred an inquiry into the application of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in Australia to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs References Committee for inquiry. Now, that committee was to report to this Senate by the 15th of September, but clearly uh, that inquiry lapsed. We went to a an election, and we're back here. 
So we'd certainly encourage that inquiry to, to pick up because 92 people and organisations made submissions which are listed on the inquiry's web page. And this includes, Mr Acting Deputy President, submissions from First Nations land councils, legal services and peak bodies. Now, we want to hear from them, and I would urge this Senate to support this going to that Senate inquiry and enable all those submitters and more to have their opportunity to speak to this bill through that inquiry. Since being appointed Assistant Minister for Indigenous Australians and Indigenous Health, I've met with a range of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations and national leadership bodies, including the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation and the National Health Leadership Forum. And I certainly had the honour of meeting with organisations as part of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Advisory Council on Family, Domestic and Sexual Violence. The National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Plan highlights that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have a right to culturally safe and responsive health care free of racism and inequity. I note the valuable submissions from organisations such as the Aboriginal Peak Organisations of the Northern Territory and the North Australian Aboriginal Justice Agency. And I also note the very strong desire of many organisations to see a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Mr Acting Deputy President, we want to make sure that there is meaningful consultation with First Nations people on this bill, and we should not ignore those submissions that have been received already. Article 19 of the Declaration states that states shall consult and cooperate in good faith with the Indigenous peoples concerned through their own representative institutions in order to obtain their free, prior and informed consent before adopting and implementing legislative or administrative measures that may affect them. Mr Acting Deputy President, we should align our actions to the principles and intent of the declaration. We know that similar legislation was put in place in Canada last year, and we're aware that some First Nations peoples in Canada raise concerns about its implementation, and we recognise that it is early days. So we want to ensure that there is meaningful consultation with Australia's First Nations peoples on this bill. And we propose, Mr Acting Deputy President, that the application of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples be referred to this committee to complete the inquiry. We certainly, on this side of the House, do have a plan, Mr Acting Deputy President, to deliver a better future uh, for Indigenous people in, in Australia. And I'd like to talk about some of the areas that I have responsibility for, which I'm incredibly proud. Uh, to, to be able to uh, work towards over this term, uh, knowing, though, of course, how challenging it will be. We, we certainly took to the election uh, the importance of replacing the community development program with real jobs and real wages. Now, that will be uh, a significant challenge, but one that we are up to. Uh, we have made reference, especially here in the Senate, and I know I've spoken about it over the last few years about the previous program of the Community Development Employment Program. So the current CDP program has around over 40,000 Australians on that program, and it is not uh, working, and, that, and that's a clear fact. So with the job summit, Mr Acting Deputy President, that we will have in September, I'm certainly uh, pushing to ensure that, along with uh, Senator Dodson and obviously Linda Burney as the Minister for Indigenous Affairs, to ensure that we do have those representatives uh, from this sector. For example, the Arnhem Land Progress Association, ALPA, uh, who's, who does an extraordinarily excellent job in employing First Nations people throughout its stores, not only in the top end uh, but also in uh, far north Queensland. And the work that they do, especially on places like Mill and Gimby, where they do not only just run the store, but they also have a wonderful uh, manufacturing uh, furniture factory 
and it's, it's awesome. It really is. Uh, they are working locally to design some of the most beautiful, beautiful pieces of furniture which are now in boardrooms uh, across Australia and overseas. And it comes from this very small island known as one of the part of the Crocodile Islands and they make incredible furniture and they are so proud of that. And I think if we can have input uh, from organisations like ALPA, from Manapan, who runs the, the uh, furniture industry, at the Job Summit in September, then we can start to really engage again as to how we work with over 40,000 Australians on this current CDP program, which we know is failing, and how do we um, move that to the areas that we want it to in terms of uh, better conditions, better jobs, obviously uh, superannuation and all the kind of leave entitlements that we would like to see uh, as part of that. It will be a challenge and I do look forward to, to trying to address that. As part of my uh, role in health, I'm quite excited about this initiative, Mr Acting Deputy President, and it is about training 500 new First Nations health workers to increase access to life-saving dialysis treatment for those living with chronic kidney disease and expand efforts to eradicate rheumatic heart disease in remote communities. One of the places that comes to mind with uh, rheumatic heart disease uh, is the work that's being done in particular in places like Manangrida. Labor will invest in First Nations conservation of our land and waters by doubling the Indigenous Rangers program. And can I take this moment, Mr Deputy President, <laughs> to, to congratulate uh, all those rangers out there across Australia, uh, because Sunday was World Ranger Day. So a huge congratulations to all of those rangers uh, right across the country who do what you can uh, to look after country and to look after our waterways. And uh, I know many of you thoroughly enjoy what you do, but we certainly want to keep supporting uh, those First Nations ranger programs and, and the conservation uh, in those areas. We're also boosting funding for Indigenous protected areas by $10 million a year and delivering the promised cultural water in the Murray-Darling Basin. We want to strengthen economic and job opportunities, as I said, for First Nations people and communities through a new public sector employment target and public reporting, Mr Deputy President, in Australia's 200 largest companies. And I do look forward to bringing that back as something that um, I will be monitoring to see what uh, those companies are doing to, to assist. Uh, we're certainly going to renew Australia's commitment to reconciliation and work in genuine partnership with First Nations people for better practical outcomes. And there is no doubt, after the weekend in Gama on Yongu country, uh, I'm incredibly proud uh, to represent the people of the Northern Territory and continue the passion and the fire that burns to see our country go to a referendum, Mr Deputy President, uh, to see First Nations people with a voice to Parliament enshrined in the Australian Constitution, and I encourage all Australians to have open and respectful debate, irrespective of whether we agree or disagree, but let's keep it respectful. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. And I absolutely agree with Senator McCarthy that it's absolutely crucially important that we have respectful, open, courteous debate in relation to this matter. And I have been listening uh, during the course of this debate to all the contributions made by all senators in relation to this matter very, very closely. I'd like to make a few preliminary comments, if I could, Mr Deputy President. And uh, at the outset, let me say that I think there's considerable merit in Senator Dodson's proposed amendment that the matter be referred to the joint, relevant Joint Standing Committee. I was serving on the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Reference Committee, which simply ran out of time in terms of conducting its inquiry in relation to these matters. As Senator Dodson has rightly observed, there were hundreds, hundreds of submissions made uh, to that committee, and those submissions need to be carefully considered uh, by, I believe, 
the relevant joint standing committee for this matter to be properly progressed. And I think that is important. That is important. I was reading the debate last night in the Canadian Parliament in relation to the bill that has been referred to uh, in Canada in the context of this debate, and it was clear to me that there were objections coming from all sides in relation to the rush that bill had in terms of progressing through the Canadian Parliament. And that was a source of friction between various sides in the Canadian Parliament. And I think it would be a great shame, it would be a great shame if, if this bill was not given the consideration which it certainly does deserve uh, through our committee processes. And I'd like to avoid, I think we should all aim to avoid the situation that occurred in Canada where the debate became quite fractious. And I think that was a factor of the time. There just wasn't enough time for all the views to be considered in the context of the bill. And in particular, in particular, I bring to the attention of the Senate one of, one of the issues that was raised in the debate was the concept of free prior and informed consent and how that would work in practice in the Canadian context. And I'll speak further about that uh, matter shortly. The second, pre second preliminary point I'd like to make is in relation to the reasons why the Australian government in 2007 did not endorse uh, the UN declaration, and that has been referred to. I think it is important to place on the record the concerns in good faith, the concerns in good faith that the 2007 Australian government had with respect to the declaration. And I'd like to uh, place on the record a quote. Uh, from my good friend, the former Senator George Brandis, who served as Attorney General of this country uh, under the previous, previous government or previous governments. And this is a quote which was attributed to him uh, in a Sydney Morning Herald article on 26 March 2009, written by Mr Julian Drape, and I quote, Of most concern is that the declaration seeks to establish special sectoral exemptions for one section of the community to the exclusion of others. There is no room in Australia for different rights attaching to different citizens differentiated only by race." End quote. So that was the concern as expressed by uh, then Senator, my good friend, uh, George Brandis, in relation to the context of this debate. And there is, there is a legitimate point of inquiry in relation to the references made in the US, UN Declaration to customary law, traditional law, in the context of the Australian legal system. And I think that should be recognised as, as quite a, legi a legitimate point that needs to be considered in the context of this debate. And I think it's important that that articulation of the previous government's reasons for not endorsing the declaration should be placed on the record. I'd like to reflect on a comment which Senator Thorpe made in terms of speaking, introducing, uh, in, introducing the bill. And Senator Thorpe quite rightly made the comment that the bill does not set out how to enact the declaration in relation to specific laws. It basically sets a framework for the declaration to be advanced in the context of Australian laws. And it is very similar in that respect to the Canadian bill, which I referred to earlier. And the point which causes me some concern, and which should be a matter of inquiry by the Joint Standing Committee, is, is whether or not that is the best approach, or whether or not the best approach is actually to look at a particular area of law, for example, safeguarding cultural heritage, and then seeking to progress uh, proposed amendments to that law, which some might say would better reflect the intention and the ob objectives of the UN Declaration, as opposed to starting at the process of holus bolus introducing the Declaration, uh, make, giving it force of law, and then seeking to apply it to individual situations. I think there's a lot of merit. I think there's a lot of merit, and I, I think it would actually help bring people together if the detail of how the declaration would apply in a particular context in a particular context 
was considered. And I believe a good place to start would be in relation to cultural heritage. In particular, I say that mindful of the disgraceful uh, occurrence which occurred recently in relation to the Duke and Gorge. And, uh, I note that considerable work was done in relation to proposed amendments uh, relating to cultural heritage in that context, and the committee drew very heavily in terms of uh, the references to the UN declaration uh, in that regard and did a, an analysis as to whether or not the existing laws at both the national level and a state level uh, adequately reflected the intents and objectives of the UN declaration. So, Mr Deputy President, from my perspective, I would like to see how the declaration would impact in practice, in practice upon some of the most important areas of law with respect to Indigenous rights in this country, and maybe cultural heritage laws would be a good place to start, working on the foundation that was established by the committee which produced its report into the Duke and Gorge uh, Disaster. There's no other word for it. And uh, as someone who worked in the mining industry for many, many years, an absolute blight, uh, a shameful blight on, on the mining industry, what occurred in that case. I'd also like to make some comments, Mr Deputy President, in terms of the concept of free, prior and informed consent. And Senator Thorpe rightly referred to this concept as one of the cornerstones of the UN Declaration. And in doing so, I bring to this place perhaps a different perspective. As someone uh, who worked uh, in the mining industry uh, for a company that adhered to the highest standards of environmental and social licence, uh, I had occasion in different jurisdictions around the world to consider this concept of free, prior and informed consent, and in particular, in particular in the wonderful country of Papua New Guinea in relation to projects. And I think it is important it is important that everyone understand what that concept means. Free, as Senator Thorpe says, no coercion, intimidation or manipulation. No coercion, intimidation or manipulation. And that means coercion from any side. And certainly in other jurisdictions overseas, I've seen instances where people were bussed into meetings uh, in order to intimidate, to coerce, to frustrate the exercise of free consent. So the consent must be free. Secondly, prior. It needs to be prior. It needs to be in sufficient advance of whatever is proposed so that there can be truly meaningful discussion at a uh, local Indigenous level in relation to whatever is proposed. And that prior consent must be informed. It must be informed by all the relevant information that the uh, the people on the ground, the Indigenous uh, landholders, rights holders, need to have to make a fully informed consent. And that needs to be in the context where things can change on the ground. Things can change on the ground. And what was originally proposed may well change. And uh, during my time in Papua New Guinea, I had uh, quite considerable. Uh, interaction in relation to a project in PNG called the Octeti Project. And in the Octeti Project, uh, originally it was proposed, originally it was proposed that the mine, mining waste, the tailings would be deposited into a tailings dam. And at the end of the day, due to uh, it was a factor of geology as much as anything, unstable geology, the tailings dam failed, and therefore it was decided that the tailings would be deposited into the Octeti, uh, and the Octeti flows into the Fly River. But that was something in relation to which there was no free prior informed consent of the local people in relation to that. The project fundamentally changed, fundamentally changed. And years later, years later, there was a consultation process in relation to what should happen now. What should happen now? after the project had fundamentally changed and after it was impossible, absolutely impossible, to reverse the damage that had been done in relation to uh, the Fly River uh, in particular. So that information is absolutely crucial in relation to the concept of free, prior and informed consent. And then it has to be consent. It has to be consent. 
And what does that mean? What does that mean in different contexts? And Senator Thorpe <laughs> referred to the, the Beetaloo Basin. Now, not wanting to go into the dynamics or the intricacies of what happened in that case, suffice, it, suffice to say that there are no doubt different views as to whether or not consent was given in relation to the Beetaloo Basin. So what does constitute consent in this context? And again, I think that is a matter which uh, properly should be considered in depth, in depth by the Joint Standing Committee. And one of the, uh, an example in terms of processes, certainly in my experience in Papua New Guinea, was on occasions project promoters needed to actively ensure that women were involved in terms of consultation process, that they actually attended the meetings uh, that occurred in relation to potential projects. So uh, the issue of obtaining consent from men and women uh, in relation to these projects is absolutely important. So free, prior and informed consent. And of course, in order to give that consent, uh, the relevant parties need to have access to appropriate expertise and resources to make sure that they are represented uh, by people with expertise in relation to these matters and they are receiving all of the relevant information. So, in summary, uh, Mr Deputy President, I think uh, there is um, great merit in relation to referring this matter to a joint standing committee. I think we should, we should also reflect very, very carefully on the contribution made in this place uh, both last week and in this debate by Senator Nampa Jimpa Price. And as she was talking about, as she was talking about the practical issues on the ground in some of our Indigenous communities. I was looking at the declaration and there are a number of articles which I circled, which we should always remember are also part of this declaration. Article 7, Indigenous individuals have the rights to life, physical and mental integrity, liberty and security of person. That's absolutely fundamental and we should make sure everyone in, our, in every community across Australia has that right. Article 11, sub-article 2, states shall provide redress through effective mechanisms which may include restitution developed in conjunction with Indigenous peoples with respect to their cultural, intellectual, religious and spiritual property taken without their free, prior and informed consent. Article 22, particular attention, particular attention shall be paid to the rights and special needs of Indigenous elders, women, youth, children and persons with disabilities in the implementation of this declaration. Article 24, Indigenous peoples have the right to their traditional medicines and to maintain their health practices. And sub-article 2, Indigenous, Indigenous individuals have an equal right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. States shall take the necessary steps with a view to achieving progressively the full realisation of this right. And I think there are many articles in, in the 46 articles of the declaration which we should all reflect upon, which we should all reflect upon in terms of uh, considering whether or not um, we're meeting the relevant standard. The, the declaration does have moral force, as Senator Dodson referred to. It does have, uh, it does have moral force. It should be a cause for deep reflection and, in my view, this is a matter which should be, uh, given its serious nature, which should be considered in depth by the relevant uh, Joint Standing Committee. Senator Cox. Thank you. Uh, I rise to make a contribution to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Bill 2022. It is, in fact, the first time in this country's history that the federal government move closer towards enshrining our rights as First Nations people into our domestic law. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, or UNDRIP as it's commonly known, was adopted by the UN United Nations General Assembly on 13 September 2007. And in my opinion, it is the best mechanism for which we can enact our sovereign rights as First Peoples of this country, which in fact have been denied since 1788. In 2007, as um, Senator Dodson also remarked, there have been 144 countries that voted in favour of UNDRIP. If you want to know what shame looks like, it looks like 
Australia being one of those four countries that voted against the UNDRIP. The Rudd government finally endorsed this in 2009, but this announcement was in fact quite meaningless. And the reason it was meaningless is because it didn't actually translate into the implementation of UNDRIP into our laws until now. During the final sitting week of the 46th parliament, it was in fact the Greens, the Australian Greens, who established an inquiry into the application of the UNDRIP in this country. And through a co-signed motion between Senator Thorpe and I, we also introduced Senator Thorpe's private senator's bill to compel this government, the new government, the one we knew we were going to get, to implement UNDRIP. And I want to acknowledge the work of Senator Dodson uh, in his previous life in the work that you've done on UNDRIP. And there are, in fact, these two wins that are the first step to implementing UNDRIP into our laws, into our policies, and, in fact, what the opposition and coalition talk about, which is in our practice. And it includes a full audit of our existing laws, our policies, our practices to ensure that we are, in fact, compliant with UNDRIP. And this is a foundational piece of future work. The UNDRIP provides a roadmap for the future a future that is built on the international principles that were designed by sovereign people and sovereign nations for First Peoples globally, not by governments. Again, I want to reiterate, not by governments. Upholding First Nations people's right to care for country, for community, which encompasses language and kinship and all of those other things that are important as part of culture which benefits everyone in this country especially in the context of a climate crisis, which is what we're in. And we all know that the climate crisis will disproportionately impact First Peoples of this country, and it is time for us to act. We have 60,000-plus years of knowledge that have helped preserve the environment in this country and, globally, First Peoples, and in particular the biodiversity. It is up to us that we all have a responsibility, which Senator Thorpe um, articulated already, and we rely on our lands, our waters, our skies to survive. And likewise, our lands, our waters and our skies rely on us to survive. UNDRIP is about First Nations people having the final say on First Nations affairs. The Albanese Labor government agree wholeheartedly that our cultural heritage laws are too weak. And they want to work with First Nations people and they bandy around co-design. So let's get to the crux of that. What does that actually mean? Well, it actually means it, it's about our free prior informed consent, one of the critical elements of UNDRIP. And what, that is in fact what Senator Scar was referring to when he talks about JUCON. It's protecting our country, our, our cultural heritage and our people. And this is referenced in Article 2 of UNDRIP. It says, Indigenous people are individuals, are free and equal to all other peoples and individuals, and have the right to be free from any kind of discrimination. Fortunately, it doesn't happen in this place. And in the exercising of their rights, in particular, that are based on their Indigenous origin or identity. The UNDRIP is in fact about bringing people together to build communities that are free from discrimination. And as my colleague Senator Thorpe also noted earlier, the key principle of UNDRIP under free prior informed consent, also known as FPIC, will enshrine that principle of free prior informed consent to put at, at, at the heart of decision making. It emphasises that First Nations people have the right to full and effective participation at any and every stage of action that affects or indirectly affects our lives. The requirement to seek genuine free prior informed consent will completely change the way governments and proponents seek approval for projects that affect our land, our skies and our water, and will put an end to the coercion and manipulation that we currently see, and we see it time and time again, across all levels of government and across all levels of industry, in fact. And when it comes to development proposals on our land, we will put an end to the half-baked consultation that is approving the destruction of our cultural heritage. And unfortunately, they give that promise of jobs. What jobs? Those jobs are still unfulfilled promises, particularly on my country. So we've seen it from Jukin. Right now, we're seeing it in real time with Perdamon on the fertilizer plant, the urea fertilizer plant up in Karatha. 
I would like to um, take some time to share some of the views made from the submission to the inquiry on this bill by the Australian Greens First Nations Network, which outlined the potential impacts that UNDRIP could have. The Australian Greens' major policy for First Nations people has its foundation, the UNDRIP. We believe that enacting UNDRIP into domestic legislation will in fact protect human, civil, social, political and economic cultural rights for First Nations people and Australia. And it's urgently needed given the oppressive policies of generations of government since 1788, which has not recognised our sovereign rights nor treats us equally under Australian law since then. It is now time. It is time for governments to step up in this place and to take the next steps to implement UNDRIP. This is, in fact, a very, very powerful tool. It will fight for the rights for Indigenous people. It will make sure that they are enshrined in domestic law across all of those elements which are important in a human rights framework. And I look forward Excuse to working with my colleagues I'm in this place. I'm required to interrupt you, but you will be automatically in continuance. The time for the debate has expired. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of government business. I call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number 1, Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment, Royal Commission Response, Bill 2022, second reading debate and on the amendment moved by Senator Rustin. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Today I rise to speak about the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Bill. And firstly, I would just like to set the scene for Senators, in January 2020, our lives changed. Australians were about to face the first global pandemic in a century. Just as our country had endured the worst bushfires since Black Saturday, uncertainty swept the nation. It will be no surprise to Australians that the then Prime Minister was nowhere to be seen because when Australians needed him most, he buried his head in the sand. By the time COVID reached Australian shores, cities and states around the country were facing the prospect of long, hard and lonely lockdowns. States and territories closed their borders. Many families began uh, what would be years of separation. Australians were dying, aged care homes were facing outbreak after outbreak and residents were left at risk with families preparing for the worst. It wasn't until February of 2021 that Australians began being vaccinated for COVID, months after vaccines had started going into the arms of people in other developed nations. And then, to no surprise to any Australian, the government did not order enough vaccines, and when vaccines did finally arrive, our most vulnerable were forgotten. Getting vaccines in the arms was the um, in the arms was a for, what was the former government called key priority of 2021, and they failed early. Two months on from when doses finally started going into the arms of residents in aged care and aged care workers, only 10 per cent of the private aged care workforce had received a vaccine. Aged care residents were isolated for longer. Workers left with the fear of accidentally introducing the virus into facilities and families left separated from their loved ones for much longer than necessary. Now, it breaks my heart to hear the number of lives lost to the virus in aged care homes. Well, over 3,000 families have lost members of their family, and the former government simply treated them as statistics. The former government neglected aged care residents, workers and our entire community for the best part of a decade while they are in government leading to the Royal Commission into aged care. Older Australians work hard their whole lives, contributing to our communities and our nation. All Australians deserve dignity in their frailer years. Deputy President, that is why I rise today to commend the aged care bill before us, because a Labor government has done exactly what we said we would do. This bill implements many of our government's urgent uh, election commitments that put security, dignity and humanity back into aged care through urgent funding and safety reforms. 
Aged care workers are dedicated, caring individuals working in challenging environments across the country. Aged care workers could take home a late, larger paycheck by stacking shelves at Woolies than they currently get caring for vulnerable Australians. This government is a government that will advocate for all workers to be valued and for their pay to reflect just that. That is why this government acted swiftly to write to the Fair Work Commission for permission to lodge a submission to support a pay rise for aged care workers. This submission is well underway and will be delivered to the Fair Work Commission by the 8th of August. It will shock Australians to know that 24 per cent of aged care facilities do not have a nurse on site 24 hours a day, leaving some of our communities most vulnerable without the care many residents, families and the community expect them to receive. The bills introduced to Parliament will legislate that providers of residential care or specified kinds of flexible care must have a registered nurse on site and on duty at each facility 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In doing so, older Australians will have access to the care they need when they need it. This will save lives of unnecessary trips to the hospital emergency, thousands of unnecessary trips to hospital emergency departments and ensure that older Australians living in residential aged care have, ex have access to the nursing care they deserve. Finally, putting a dedicated facility-based registered nurse in the room, not over the phone or with the responsibility of looking after three or four facilities. Through extending the availability of registered nurses in aged care facilities, the government is committed to ensuring quality care. This bill would legislate a new code of conduct for the aged care workforce that will set high standards of behaviour to ensure that care is delivered in a safe, competent and respectful way. The bill legislates for the creation of a comprehensive worker registration scheme. In the meantime, criminal history checks will remain for workers entering the aged care sector. This bill replaces the outdated aged care funding instrument with a new model for calculating aged care subsidies. The new body will be titled the Australian National Aged Care Classification Care Funding Model, which has been developed in consultation with the aged care sector and consumer groups. Funding under the new National Age Aged Care Classification Model will commence on 1 October 2022. The bill makes a series of much-needed structural changes that will improve the health, well-being and safety of older Australians. The bill will also assist older Australians and their families to have a better understanding of care and requirements and the operation of providers. On top of this, the Albanese government is taking swift action to enhance the protection of older Australians living in aged care. The government's aged care response is working to enhance the safety of workers and visitors in homes and introduce, introducing infection control training. The government is committed to integrity and transparency in the aged care sector, introducing measures to hold providers to account about what they are spending money on and other information about provider operations. Through this bill, a star rating system has been, has been published on all residential aged care services by the end of 2022. Publicly available information ensures families and future residents are able to make informed decisions about the facility they are moving into. The information will be provided will provide an honest contrast to the flashy flyers and advertisements. Further, the Health and Aged Care Pricing Authority will be re renamed to reflect a change of scope to include provisions of, of advice on health care, aged care, pricing and costing. These important measures respond to public concerns, concerns that embody the sentiment of residents and workers in aged care. This government is set to deliver 17 recommendations from the Royal Commission through the first two pieces of aged care legislation. The former government could only 
manage nine. This government has acted swiftly and will legislate real changes that will improve the lives of residents in, a, in aged care and the incredibly important and dedicated people who work with them. Unlike the former government, whose former leader has not bothered Unlike the former government, Labor is getting on with the job. Mr Deputy President, this bill brings back care into the heart of aged care, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Um, you'd be hard-pressed to find a single Australian who doesn't have a loved one in aged care, approaching aged care, or in some form of at-home support care. The broad range of services for older Australians are necessary and vital in a compassionate society. Unfortunately, the message that we have heard on this side of the um, chamber and the message the Royal Commission heard is that you'd be hard-pressed to find a single Australian who thinks that our aged care system is working. It just isn't. And the stories that we hear over and over again throughout our communities just reinforce that. In 2013, when the coalition came to government, they unpicked a wide range of reforms that had been put in place by the previous Labor government. They had been legislated, they had been planned, they had been consulted. And those reforms would have gone a long way to ensuring we did not find ourselves in the situation that we do find ourselves in today. It is a system that has been on the precipice of disaster for the last decade, a system that has been ignored by the previous government, underfunded and allowed to languish. And when you allow the aged care system to languish, you allow Australians to languish, people who have worked their whole lives to support this country, being left abandoned and uncared for in the manner that they deserve. In the last nine years, we've seen 23 reports from inquiries and studies all the way to the Royal Commission. That's 23 reports, each and every one of them completely and utterly ignored. I don't need to explain to you all how shocking the findings of these reports are, because many of you have read them, and far too many Australians, as they've read them, have just felt sick to their stomach at the situation that we are placing our older Australians in. Last week I spoke to this chamber of how Australian communities, industry and workers are sick and tired of the uncertainty and the divisive politics that have surrounded climate change in this country for over a decade. I spoke of how workers and industry and communities are needing certainty are needing to understand what that plan going forward is, will understand the issues that we face and how we intend to address them. A plan that is backed up by consultation, by input from industry, from communities. Best practice policy is what we should be aiming for. But I may well have been speaking about in terms of climate change last week. But in terms of aged care this week, we have exactly the same circumstance, an issue that has been long neglected and ignored. And just as Australian people sent a clear message to us on the need for climate action, they have also sent that same message of need for, for strong action on aged care now. We need an aged care system that cares. We need a system that we can have confidence in and we need a system that will deliver the support our loved ones need. Prior to the election, I had the opportunity to travel around the regional area in South Australia talking to workers, talking to aged care providers and talking to families. And the stories were consistent and they were alarming. No one felt that they had their loved one in a situation that was all that it should be. Some were in better situations than others, but in the main, people were really upset, really concerned, and felt very powerless in that circumstance. I spoke to families who had loved ones who needed help with um, eating food for whatever reason. 
They needed to be coaxed. They needed to be supported through every meal. And the hours in those aged care facilities were insufficient for staff to be able to undertake that work. Yet the families were not given permission to be there at every meal. And for many of them, it's then a decision about whether they maintain their own employment circumstances, how they share around that workload all the time while those frail older people are in a care facility where without one-on-one -on -one support they do not get sufficient nutrition. So I can tell you whether it's in Wyala, Port Augusta, Port Pirie or Mount Gambier or anywhere else in regional South Australia or the rest of the country for that matter, the message was exactly the same. The litany of issues from food, from personal care, from amount of time that anyone could spend engaging in a meaningful way with their loved one. It was just the same. Everyone had the same stories. This is a huge and unconscionable systemic failure. People are worried that when they need aged care, they'll have to move away from the communities they've lived in their whole lives. We've seen closures of facilities in many places, which has meant that the ability of families to visit with their loved one, the ability of those families to be able to afford the petrol to get to the aged care facility. It's different in the regional areas. It's not the same as in the city. It's not just an extra 10 minutes. It's not just an extra couple of kilometres. We're talking about people having to travel hundreds of kilometres to see their loved ones, while also maintaining their own jobs, bringing up their own families, and still trying to maintain that strong bond with their loved ones. The other critical issue here is that of workers. I spoke to many, many workers who feel exactly the same way as the families of those older people in residential aged care. They care so much and they try so hard to undertake their jobs. Yet they do not have the time. The staffing is insufficient. The structures are inefficient. The way things are panned out on a daily basis, they're left running from one resident to the next, often with many, many bells lit up on their panel, knowing they have to go and see someone because they need assistance, but just not having the ability to get there given the enormous number of people who are requiring support. They're exhausted. They simply can't go on. I heard story after story of aged care worker saying that they, one, would earn more money if they went and worked in um, a retail environment uh, or in a cafe environment, and that they would be less stressed. The additional shifts they're being asked to do and the hours that they are undertaking and the level of stress that they're having to deal with is causing what can only be described as a mental health crisis across our aged care workforce. The industry is worried that they won't be able to sustain the care they want to provide, having been stuck in a nine-year revolving door of inquiry and report and inquiry and report and no action. Earlier this year, the ABC reported that a resident in an aged care facility in Port Augusta had developed very bad bed sores. And the sore became so bad on his back that you could actually see his spine. That's the kind of situation that we are seeing in some of our aged care facilities, and it's one that we should all be ashamed of. I heard stories of workers spread so thinly that they would find co-workers in tears, that they would find co-workers just trembling with anxiety at not being able to care for the people that they genuinely, genuinely want to work with, genuinely want to support. So this kind of anguish for the families, for the workers, cannot go on. The neglect must end, and the Albanese Labor government intends to do just that. We're not waiting. The bills that have been provided are going to take those first steps, and there's more to come. 
Key to this, today's legislation is the principle of transparency. Part of the message I heard consistently was that people didn't understand how the aged care system was being funded, what the aged care providers were spending on food, on care and on the various other aspects, be it administration, profits and the like. They did not know what those taxpayer-funded subsidies were actually going towards. They did not know how the subsidies were calculated, and they did not know how to pursue their concerns. This bill begins to address some of those very specific concerns. Namely, it establishes the Australian National Aged Care Classification Model, uh, which will be um, the structure for, for calculating the aged care subsidy. This was endorsed by the Royal Commission and will ensure transparency and clarity about what subsidies are provided and what they are spent on. The bill facilitates the publication of star ratings so the community can start to understand exactly how those facilities are operating. It introduces a code of conduct for aged care sector, again, transparently sending the message to the community about what they can expect and what they can deserve from our aged care sector. The provisions in the bill facilitate increased information sharing, increases of oversight of refundable deposits and bonds, and also strengthens the governance of approved providers. Crucially, this bill extends a serious incident response scheme to home care and flexible care, whereas it previously only operated in residential. So that is going to move the sector to actually start covering off on all the in-home care that is provided. And that serious incident response scheme will help address issues as they are coming to the light, as they are coming to light, and to get onto it immediately to make changes and address those situations. We know that aged care needs to be tailored to people's specific needs, and we know that that's a challenging situation. We know that more independence that people have in aged care, the better they fare, um, and the better the quality of life that they enjoy. Still being able to make the decisions that you can, even though you are unable to make other decisions or you are unable to continue on with certain aspects of your life, to retain that control is desperately important for the well-being of our older Australians. But the flexibility isn't a barrier to accountability. Those two things have to go hand in hand. Approximately one in 20 older Australians will experience some form of abuse or neglect, but it's only one in six cases that it's estimated are reported. So there is a huge disparity there between what is happening and what is being talked about and what is being reported up the line. At the end of last year, just over 16,000 South Australians were receiving home care packages. And unfortunately, at the moment, the structures and mechanism for reporting abuse and neglect in those in-home facilities is, is vastly lacking and does not give the opportunity to improve those circumstances, improve those services and make a difference to those older people. So the bill introducing that legislation is necessary to extend that report and to ensure that we fill that gap. The fundamental issue we face here is how we treat our older people and how we provide their families with the confidence, the knowledge and the understanding to be able to work with the system, to be able to look at where those issues are and be able to pursue some solution, some resolution to the problems they're facing. The transparency that we choose to bring in here and the additional information for people to understand how the aged care they're selecting for their loved one is performing, how they are matching up to the standards that we set as a country for the care of our older people. And then having that detail about what percentage of the money they receive, the government money they receive, public funding, what that is being spent on. Is, is there an overspend in the administration, noting that there does need to be administration, but it needs to be balanced? How much of that money is going into profits for our profit-based providers, and is that appropriate? How much money is being spent on the food that is being provided 
how much money is being spent on the care, the actual time that individual care workers have to spend with residents, to see how their day is going, to make sure they have the care they need, that they're not lying waiting um, to go to the bathroom, that they're not having accidents because they need the support and the assistance. These kind of things are critical to how we run our aged care system. I commend these bills um, and particularly the accountability that we wish to bring in to this system and the accountability and transparency. Thank you. Senator Still. Yes, thank you, Mr uh, Dep Acting Deputy President. And I rise to make my contribution uh, to the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Royal Commission Responsibility of 2022. Uh, and this is an extremely important piece of legislation, as we've heard so many times already today and last week. And it, it is absolutely necessary, following the damning report from the Royal Commission into Aged Care. Now, the title of the interim report summed up the experience of many in the aged care sector, whether that be the staff who provide the care that is so important to our elderly Australians and their families or the residents and patients themselves. Now, let's think about neglect. In fact, the opening title of the first paragraph reads, and I quote, a shocking tale of neglect. In one of the opening paragraphs, the report says the following, and I quote, Australia prides itself on being a clever, innovative and caring country. Why then has the Royal Commission found these qualities so signally lacking in our aged care system? Also, we have uncovered an aged care system that is characterised by an absence of innovation and by rigid conformity. The system lacks transparency in communication, reporting and accountability. It is not built around the people it is supposed to help and support, but around funding mechanisms, processes and procedures. This too must change. I also quote, our public hearings, roundtable discussions with experts and community forums have revealed behaviour by aged care service providers that, when brought to public attention, has attracted criticism and, in some cases, condemnation. Many of the cases of deficiencies or outright failings in aged care were known to both the providers concerned and the regulators before coming to public attention. Why has so little been done to address these deficiencies? We are left to conclude that a sector-wide focus on the need to increase funding, a culture of apathy about care essentials and a lack of curiosity about the potential of aged care to provide restorative and loving care, all of which is underpinned by an ageist mindset, has enabled the system to hide from the spotlight. This must also change. I also quote, left isolated and powerless in this hidden from view system are older people and their families. This is not a life. This is not my home. Don't let this happen to anyone else. And another quote, left in her own faeces and still no one came. Mum doesn't feel safe. This cruel and harmful system must be changed. We owe it to our parents, our grandparents, our partners, our friends. We owe it to strangers. We owe it to future generations. Older people deserve so much more. We have found that the aged care system fails to meet the needs of our older, often very vulnerable citizens. It does not deliver uniformly safe and quality care for older people. It is unkind and uncaring towards them. In too many instances, it simply neglects them." End of quote. And quite frankly, Mr Acting Deputy President, it is a national disgrace that the system has just carried on under these conditions. And what makes it worse is that those who had the power to do something about it did nothing. Well, I'm happy to say the Albanese government is not going to cop that. The evidence taken and recommendations made by the Commission are far too important to ignore. And we owe it to our older Australians to put them in practice by introducing this bill so that they have an assurance that they are going to get nothing but the very best of care when they go into aged care. And that assurance extends to the families as well. This bill makes a series of important changes that will improve the health, safety and well-being of older Australians. 
and it will also assist older Australians and their families to understand the quality of care and operations of providers. This bill contains nine measures to implement urgent reforms to the aged care system and responds to 17 recommendations of the final report of the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety. The Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety was established on 8 October 2018 by the Governor-General of the Commonwealth of Australia and was seen by experts as a crucial opportunity to address a failing system. The Royal Commission made no less than 148 recommendations to address structural issues in funding and governance, formulated after evidence from 641 experts, residents and families over almost 100 hearing days since the former Prime Minister ordered the inquiry in October in 2018. Now, just a few facts about the, 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 the Royal Commission. And for someone who spent a fair bit of time in, in, in Senate inquiries, I mean, this is mind-blowing. 10,574 submissions received to date. 6,800 telephone calls were made to the information line. Like many Australians, I was horrified to hear stories and cases about the conditions aged care residents were being forced to live in on a daily basis across our country. As part of their lobbying for change, I did meet with a delegation of aged care workers and United Workers Union members last year who came to Parliament to appeal to the former government to act and make change. These are good, decent, hard-working people who actually love their job and the care they provide to older Australians. And it was terribly sad to see how heartbroken they were because of the conditions they were being forced to endure at work and the conditions their residents were experiencing also as a result. The UWU's submission to the Royal Commission included some direct experiences of aged care staff, which I want to put onto the record. And I quote, I get disheartened and frustrated. There's not enough staff or money for what we do. Management do not listen to us, notice what we do, or take notice of our complaints. This has to change. And another quote, in the last three years, my income has reduced each year, and I expect this year to make four. I have no guarantee at all regarding how many hours I work. I cannot get out of this job soon enough and when I do, I would never consider working in this field again and would never recommend for anyone else to do so. It's a complete dead end. How sad is that? And another quote, I do the job because of how much I care. Not for the money because it's terrible pay for the amount of physical, mental and emotional strain on us. I'm sure more people would do it if the pay was better. And another, paperwork. Documentations are necessary, but our residents come first. Carers are working back in their own time to finish the workload. Another one, I work extra hours in my own time. And, then, and another one again, people should not be allowed to do a six-month course and then be qualified to work in aged care. They have no idea what they are doing and it's not fair on the elderly that end up getting care staff. And another quote, it took me nine months to get qualified through TAFE. Stop doing six-week courses to qualify to be a carer. Poor quality of food, abuse, neglect, lack of quality care, poor standards and conditions for staff and residents, understaffing, lack of training, low levels of pay, the list goes on and on and on. And you've got to ask yourself, how did it get to this? Conditions in the aged care sector had got that bad that earlier this year, aged care peak bodies and unions made a request to the former government for the Australian Defence Force to be brought in to assist in residential aged care facilities to alleviate stress on the embattled aged care workforce. As we learnt, COVID-19 hit the aged care workforce hard, with some facilities losing anywhere between 5 to 50 per cent of their staff due to COVID-19. Uh, 19 results or staff are needing to quarantine as close contacts of a case. On top of this, Peak Body stated that staff burnout among the workforce was resulting in widespread resignations. Industry bodies, including the Australian Aged Care Collaboration, 
um, consisting of six aged care peak bodies, the United Workers Union and the Health Services Union joined together to call for extra assistance from the former government. Those same organisations pleaded to the former government to fix unresolved systematic funding and workforce issues which were outlined in the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety Final Report. And what did they get? Nothing. So on top of the complete neglect that the former government was guilty of, there was a complete disrespect for the peak bodies who represent aged care sector, which is in so much need of attention. And despite the former Prime Minister himself conceding that the aged care sector is indeed in crisis, not my words, his, his government refused to act on aged care reform. Prior to the election, Prime Minister Albanese told Australia that fixing aged care was a Labor priority and the introduction of these reforms demonstrates this government's commitment to reform. The Royal Commission response bill provides the legislative framework for the new AN ACC funding model for residential aged care homes, which will replace the outdated aged care funding instrument of October 2022. This framework will offer more equitable funding, better match to providers' costs in delivering the care residents need. It also extends the functions of the Independent Health and Aged Care Pricing Authority, which will lead to better price setting for aged care homes. Other measures enshrine transparency and accountability of approved providers and improved quality of care and safety for older Australians receiving aged care services. This includes the star rating system which will see the Department of Health and Aged Care publish a comparison rating for all residential aged care services by the end of uh, this year, an extension of the Serious Incident Response Scheme to all in-home care providers from 1 December 2022, meaning increased protection for older Australians from preventable incidences, abuse and neglect, and a new code of conduct for approved providers, their workforce and governing persons. And what a good thing that is. Better accountability, improved care, uh, quality of care and a code of conduct for providers and their workforce, which will go a long way to address the experiences of aged care staff that I did mention earlier. And I wish there was a system of transparency and accountability in place when we were looking for finally to settle on a place for my mother-in-law, Ilma. Uh, we do miss you, uh, Ilma. Uh, she would have uh, turned 90 last week. But I know with uh, my wife and her sisters the effort they put in to find a home a suitable home for Ilma. A lot of research was done and much consideration, I have to say this, that the family made the decision to settle Ilma at the Aegis, Aegis, A -E -G -I -S, residential care facility in Melville, not far from our home in WA. So when the family looked at the room and checked out the facility, the management was told that Ilma would have her own bathroom. No problem. I know when the girls moved her in there, they were packing her stuff into the bathroom and saw another door. They opened the door. It was a door to another room. It was a shared bathroom. Now, that's fine, but the thing is on the Aegis website, and which was checked out again on Friday, updated on July the 6th, these lying so-and-sos are still saying you get your own bathroom. You do not. The aged care uh, residents do not. They even lie about it. And to this day, they're still getting away with it. And I would encourage any West Australian, and I'm happy to meet with the Board of Aegis, I'm happy to meet with whoever from Aegis, I wouldn't put a cat or a dog in an Aegis home while they lie like that. And the sad part is the staff at Aegis too, decent people, really decent people, all agency people. They didn't know where they were going to work this week, where they would work next week. They were just shuffled and shunted around. And for old people, Aegis, you think that's a good model? When older people desperately need uh, recognition. They desperately need some form of stability. They have to have that. It makes them feel more comfortable too. And not only that, the poor staff. The poor staff being shunted around, they didn't know the intricacies of their residence. They didn't know what some people may be a little bit harder to do something here or there because they didn't know they weren't around long enough and they just had great pride in taking people's money for that. But I'm happy to say that Ilma ended up at Rafa and the Royal Air Force uh, aged care facility in Perth. What a magnificent facility. Chalk and cheese, 
everything about the place I would thoroughly recommend. The food that was served to the residents was the same food that was provided in the canteen for the workers, which was the same food provided at the little uh, lunch bar when family came in to visit them. What a magnificent bunch of people. When, when Ilma did pass away, it was lovely to see half a dozen of the staff came to her funeral because they treated her like family as they treated all the residents at Rafa as family, not like ages. One of the worst of the worst, and I would thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy a conversation with the ages, but I know you wouldn't dare pick up the phone because I'd even start using my trucky language when we got into it seriously. So on saying that, I want to recommend these bills to the Senate, Mr Deputy President, and thank, I thank the Senate for its time. Senator Billick. Thank you, Deputy President. And I'll start by my contribution today on the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Royal Commission Response Bill 2022 by pointing out that this is the first bill Labor has introduced into the Senate. It really underlines the seriousness with which we take this issue, that we would choose to open our entire legislative program for the 47th Parliament with this bill. Of course, it's hugely important. This bill goes to the heart of how Australia treats some of the most vulnerable people in our community. Aged care recipients are people who have lived long lives, worked, volunteered, raised families and paid their taxes. They are our aunts, our uncles, our parents and our grandparents. They spent many years contributing to our country and community. And now, when they lack the ability to live independently and care for themselves, they justifiably expect to be cared for by society with dignity and with compassion. It's a simple and reasonable request. But sadly, we as a nation have been failing our older Australians for a considerable time. The aged care sector is in crisis because of nine long years of failure and neglect by the previous government. Fixing the crisis is not just about looking after the millions of Australians relying on the aged care system now. It's for all our sakes. Let's face it, most of us will grow old, hopefully, and we will rely on the aged care system in some way. And when we do, we would like the assurance that we are going to get better treatment than the suffering being experienced by many older Australians now. The Aged Care Royal Commission shone a light on this suffering, and many, many Australians were absolutely shocked by what it revealed. Among the worst findings of the Aged Care Royal Commission were the following. In 2018-19, the number of alleged assaults in aged care was estimated to be between 32,000 and 44,000. In the same period, there were, esti there were estimated to be 2,520 alleged incidents of unlawful sexual contact, almost 50 a week. Studies revealed that as many as 68 per cent of people in residential aged care were either malnourished or at risk of malnutrition. And there was a clear overuse of physical restraints and dangerous and unnecessary chemical restraints in residential aged care. The Royal Commission concluded that at least one in three people accessing residential aged care and home care services experienced substandard care. They also found that many of the people and institutions in the aged care sector want to deliver the best possible care to older people but are overwhelmed, underfunded or out of their depth. I know those opposite hate being reminded of this fact, but the Royal Commission's interim report was given a one-word title, neglect. That one word sums up perfectly the shameful treatment of older Australians over the time that those opposite were in government. The previous government failed to address the crisis because, like so many issues, they treated it as a political issue, not a human catastrophe, but a public relations problem to be media managed. And the worst culprit in this respect was the former Prime Minister, Mr Morrison. We all know Mr Morrison earned himself the nickname Scotty from marketing because of his propensity to try and spin his way out of problems rather than showing any real leadership. And a case in point is the release of the Aged Care Royal Commission's final report on 1 March 2021. Mr Morrison held a conference outside Kirribilli House to announce the release. What should have been an opportunity for a dialogue about the contents of the report 
its damning findings and what the government was going to do to address it turned into a PR stunt. I'm sure Mr Morrison was hoping the media would simply go along with it. But kudos to the ABC's Anne Connolly for calling it out for what it was. Here's what Ms Connolly said when she confronted the then Prime Minister about his stunt. And I quote, You've had this report since Friday. You've given us half an hour's notice to attend a press conference. You tabled the report while we were here. How can we ask questions that are relevant to the report without knowing what's in it? I guess the um, follow-up implicit in Ms Connolly's line of questioning was, what's the point of the press conference? It was clear that the point of the press conference was to, to deliver the type of spin that Mr Morrison constantly engaged in. He released the report at the beginning of the press conference because he wanted journalists to his, hear his interpretation of the report without asking any uncomfortable questions about its damning findings. To Mr Morrison, the ongoing crisis in aged care, like the so-called barnacles of the Howard era, were just a political problem that he wished would go away. And let's not forget that the Aged Care Royal Commission was called about six months before the 2019 federal election. Although it was an important exercise in shining a light on some of the most egregious failings in aged care, I think the timing was pretty cynical. It seemed that Mr Morrison, shortly after coming to the leadership, wanted to kick the can down the road to get through the next election, rather than take any real action to address the aged care crisis. Even with the Royal Commission in full swing, there was a need for urgent action and plenty of previous reports to outline what action was needed. As the Royal Commission itself noted in this stinging criticism, and I quote, had the Australian government acted upon previous reviews of aged care, the persistent problems in aged care would have been known much earlier and the sufferings of many people could have been avoided. This is a sector that has never truly been valued by those opposite, an aptitude that was typified by former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull when he suggested an aged care worker in Burnie in Tasmania was, and I quote, entitled to aspire to a better job. On that side, we've had a procession of aged care ministers who have allowed report after report after report into the sector to accumulate. Altogether, 23 reports have been gathering dust on the desk of one aged care minister after another, without any meaningful action from the previous government to address the crisis in aged care. The latest and arguably least efficient effective, uh, least efficient or effective minister, although he had strong competition for that title, I think, was Senator Colbeck. As minister, Senator Colbeck oversaw the disastrous handling of the government's response to COVID outbreaks in aged care in the early days of the pandemic. In the midst of this crisis, he chose to accept VIP hospitality at a cricket match in Hobart instead of turning up to answer questions at a public hearing of the Senate's COVID inquiry. And I remember speaking to um, Senator Gallagher about this and being told that he had been offered dates, that the, the inquiry was happy to make dates that suited Senator Colbeck, but he still didn't want to turn up. And when he did finally, after being embarrassed into it, front the inquiry, he could not answer a basic but important question. How many Australians had died of COVID in residential aged care? Well, I won't pretend that the election of a Labor government means the crisis in aged care is magically over. Australians can at least be assured that they now have a government that is serious about tackling the crisis. Before the Senate today is a bill that helps restore quality, dignity and humanity back into Australia's aged care system. Extensive consultations have been held with unions, aged care workers, providers and residents to ensure that their views and experiences are considered. And I'd like to congratulate the Minister for Aged Care for hitting the ground running and meeting with so many stakeholders in such a short period of time. Several of the measures in this bill were recommended by the Royal Commission. Some measures in this bill were included in the former government's Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Royal Commission Response No. 2 Bill of 2021, which lapsed when the election was called. Instead of Schedule 2 of the lapsed bill, 
A new comprehensive worker registration scheme will be developed, with criminal history checks continuing to apply in the meantime. In regards to this measure, I appreciate that aged care is a difficult and demanding job. In fact, when I was a student nurse, I uh, was doing my studies at an aged care facility. It was actually a hospital for aged care people, and 98% and of people in that hospital were in aged care. And I've got to say, it's, I've, I was a childcare worker for 12 years, and aged care was even harder than that. And that was a pretty damn hard job, the, the, being the um, early childhood educator. So to have worked in aged care, I absolutely get what these workers are going through. I remember being um, spoken to once because I wanted to spend time talking to the patients, uh, and there just wasn't time. You just got on and did what you had to do. There was no time for that, and that is, is really sad and was one of the reasons I left. There are occasions, however, where someone demonstrates that they are not a fit and proper person to be working in aged care, and we don't want them simply going and getting a job with another provider. If you look at some other professions with registration schemes, for example, doctor, nurses and teachers, the same principle applies. Because they have vulnerable people in their care. The bill also includes several measures that will provide additional protections for older Australians. These include the expansion of the Serious Incident Response Scheme to establish obligations on approved providers of home care and flexible care in a community setting to report and respond to incidents and to take action to prevent incidents from reoccurring. A new code of conduct which will set high standards of behaviour for aged care workers, approved providers and governing persons of approved providers to ensure they are delivering aged care in a way that is safe, competent and respectful. Improved information sharing between care and support sector regulators to enable proactive monitoring of cross-sector risks and better protection of consumers and participants from harm and an interim solution for the provisions of consent, of consent to the use of restrictive practices to be established while state and territory consent arrangements are reconsidered. The bill also includes a series of measures that provide greater transparency and accountability for providers. Star ratings will be published for all residential aged care services on My Aged Care by the end of 2022. These ratings will enable older Australians, their family and carers to make informed decisions when seeking quality aged care. From 1 December 2022, approved providers and their governing bodies will be required to meet new responsibilities that will improve governance. Approved providers will be required to notify the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission of changes to key personnel and the current disqualified individual arrangements will be replaced with a broader suitability test. Amendments will also be made to increase financial and prudential oversight in respect of refundable accommodation deposits and bonds. The functions of a renamed Independent Health and Aged Care Pricing Authority will be expanded to include the provisions of advice on health care and aged care pricing and costing. This bill is just the beginning of the work of the Albanese Labor government. It's just the beginning of the work that we will be doing to restore decency and humanity to the aged care sector and to ensure that older Australians are treated with respect, dignity and compassion. And I'd love to be able to say that we can end the crisis now, that we can snap our fingers and fix the mess caused by nine years of neglect. But this is a large and complex multi-billion dollar sector and you can't fix nine years of neglect in nine or ten weeks. Having said that, we are dedicated to the task, which is more than I could say, for our predecessors. This bill addresses some of the most urgent reforms for the sector, but we have some big plans for aged care that we committed to in the lead-up to the recent federal election. The Albanese Labor government will ensure that every residential aged care facility has at least one qualified registered nurse 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We will raise the standard of aged care across the board and mandate that every resident receives at least 215 minutes of care per day. We will back a real pay rise for aged care workers and, if the Fair Work Commission delivers it, we will fund it. If we want higher standards of care, then we need higher wages for our carers. 
and we will ensure better food for aged care residents by mandating nutrition standards for aged care homes. The contrast between our commitment to drastically improve standards in aged care and the neglect of the previous government could not be more stark. But we are determined to fix this mess and to ensure that older Australians receive the quality care they need and deserve. Senator Green. Thank you so much, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm very pleased to be speaking on this legislation today um, and very pleased to be following my colleague from Tasmania, who has been an incredible advocate for aged care workers um, and for the aged care sector um, uh, in her time uh, representing the people from Tasmania. Um, I rise to speak on the aged care and other legislation amendment bill, but there's one word that rings in people's minds across the country when we think about our aged care system, and that is neglect. That is the hallmark of the former government's record on aged care. Woeful neglect at the hands of either a government that did not care or was too incompetent to act. There have been 23 reports into aged care over the last decade. Let that sink in. 23 reports that went ignored by the former government. And let us never forget that it was in this place that the former Minister for Aged Care turned his back on aged care residents, dedicated carers and their families. Well, today, a decade of inaction is finally about to end. As our government introduces this bill and starts to piece back together a broken system. The Albanese Labor government has fast-tracked this legislation because the, the time to act is long overdue. 23 reports, all gathering dust, under the watch of the former government, painted a horrifying picture. Over a decade, the sector has been crying out for support from the federal government. Advocates, workers, residents had all been banging the drum for reform with no response and no reprieve. The onset of the global pandemic forced an ambivalent government to confront its own legacy on caring for older Australians. The former government failed older Australians and the workers that care for them. They failed to secure enough vaccines and PPE to protect residents and staff from COVID. They refused to act on the recommendations of the Royal Commission that they were forced to call. Their minister, asleep at the wheel, while the sector was in crisis and nobody stepped in. Not enough resources, not enough action, not enough accountability. The stories that came out of the Royal Commission were horrifying. Residents and their family told us they were locked in their rooms without food or water. Aged care workers told us they were overworked, underpaid and put at risk. They literally cried tears of exhaustion, tears of being ignored. And how was this received by the previous government? Well, they consistently denied that there was a problem, voting consistently in this place against motions to acknowledge an aged care crisis, making media appearances arguing that the lived experience of aged care residents and staff were overblown, repeating their talking points through the shortage of PPE, a shortage of vaccines, a shortage of rat tests, repeating uh, time and time again, refusing to acknowledge that the problem was in front of them. Even when they were forced to initiate a royal commission, the former government's implementation of its recommendations were worse than half-hearted. In the 17 months since the final report was handed down, the former government only addressed 6 per cent of those recommendations. Six per cent. What a slap in the face for those workers and residents. Well, over a year, not even one-tenth of the recommendations have been addressed. With all the resources of a parliament and a government and a bureaucracy at their disposal, the former government only tinkered around the edges of a broken system. To top all this off, the Morrison government tried to buy the votes of aged care workforce with a one-off payment just before the election. Instead of using their time in government to fix the real structural issues in the sector that they had been told about for years, they tried to paper over it with a quick sugar hit for frontline workers. Well, we know how that turned out for them. 
At the last election, aged care workers, residents and our community sent the former government a clear message that meagre adjustments around the edges would not cut it, and that Anthony Albanese Labor government was given a clear mandate at the election. It is time to fix up aged care and build a sector that respects older Australians and those that care for them. So Labor's aged care and other legislation amendment bill amends Australia's aged care legislation to deliver a suite of long overdue funding, quality and safety measures. These reforms are born out of the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety, called after countless disgraceful reports into the treatment of older Australians made it impossible not to act. The Royal Commission was intended to be a line in the sand. A line in the sand that said aged care residents and aged care staff deserve to live and work in a sector that is centred around care and not around profit. Labor's bill sets the foundation for a better aged care sector in Australia. These urgent measures respond to a range of recommendations from the final report of the Royal Commission. These are structural reforms and lay the foundation for a more compassionate and sustainable sector. So what will the bill do? It will deliver a more equitable funding model. It will protect residents through a code of conduct for staff and providers. It will recognise the skill of aged care workers through a national registration scheme, and it will improve transparency through provider star rating system and stronger governance. It will extend protections to older Australians receiving care in their homes. This is a vital first step towards getting the settings right, to putting the pieces back together of a broken system. But Labor's work to fix this broken system doesn't stop here. Further reform to aged care is currently before the House. The Aged Care Amendment Implementing Care Reform Bill will deliver three important reforms. Under Labor's plan, every residential care provider will have a registered nurse on staff 24-7. We are putting the nurses back into the nursing homes. And we're making sure funding gets to residents by capping management funding allocations. And we're improving transparency in the sector by making service providers' expenditure publicly available, delivering the transparency and accountability that aged care workers and residents have been calling for for so long. I'm really proud that the Labor government is prioritising these long overdue reforms. We weren't quite on these issues in opposition. We worked hard and to hold the government account on behalf of aged care residents and, and their staff. For months, years, we urged the former government to act. And now, at the very first opportunity in government, that is exactly what we are doing. We are doing what they refused to do. This bill should be a statement to all Australians that Labor is committed to doing what we say we will do. We've said all along that we'll stand up for workers and for vulnerable members of our society, and we're getting on with the job of doing that. The bill is the product of a new Labor government that listens, considers and acts. It is the product of a government that wants to bring people together and leave no one behind. The product of a government that cares. This bill starts the incredibly hard but important work of piecing together back together a broken system. It is the product of thousands of residents, staff and families generously sharing their stories, their recommendations on how to build a sector that all of us can be proud of. It is the product of aged care workers coming to this place time and time again, sitting in the gallery, marching around the corridors of this place, pleading for help pleading for assistance. It is the product of those aged care workers time and time again, marching on the streets, going out there, talking to people about the conditions in their industry. So today, as I finish my contribution, I want to thank those aged care workers for the contribution that they have done, for going that extra step for their residents day in, day out, for being engaged on this issue, for coming here and for telling us what needed to be done. 
because this side of the House was listening. This side of the chamber was listening to those workers. And that is why the passage of this bill is the foundation for a safer, more respectful workplace for Australia's aged care workforce. It is the foundation of a more safe, healthy and dignified life for older Australians, Australians who have done their time, who have contributed to this country and now deserve a dignified retirement. I commend this bill to the Senate. Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam Deputy President, Acting Deputy President. I'm pleased to contribute to the debate today as this bill covers important once-in-a-generation reform of Australia's aged care system. And as the former chair of the Community Affairs Legislation Committee during the 46th Parliament, I take a particular interest in a bill that affects senior Australians and their needs. The opposition is supporting this bill as it is a revised version of the Royal Commission Response Bill that the Coalition introduced in the last Parliament. Essentially, it mirrors the legislation already discussed in this chamber. We also support the delivery of the second stage of critical aged care reform that was started by the Coalition in Government in response to the Royal Commission's final report. What disappoints me about it, this bill is that the Albanese government could have saved senior Australians and the aged care industry under stress by passing these reforms when our bill was before the previous government parliament. Interestingly, one of the major election promises for Labor during the federal election campaign was to support aged care residents, but I would argue making them wait extra time before introducing such important reforms is not supportive at all. In fact, the government's treatment of older Australians since the election is very disappointing. Free rapid antigen tests, no longer available for aged care homes experiencing a COVID-19 outbreak, and the government has backflipped on its decision not to extend the critical COVID support provided by the Australian Defence Force. More support was promised for aged care providers, but nothing has eventuated as yet. Like the Coalition's 2021 Aged Care Bill, this bill replaces the outdated aged care funding instrument with the Australian National Aged Care Classification ANAC, residential aged care funding model from 1 October this year. However, by delaying the passage of this bill, the government has now restricted the time available for aged care providers to transition across to this new ANAC funding model. This delay has done absolutely nothing to support or help the aged care sector or any one of the senior Australians in residential care. I'm also disappointed to see that in addition to delaying this time-critical legislation, the government has removed the worker screening regulations that were contained in the Coalition's bill. These were important regulatory arrangements that were supported by the sector. The Royal Commission recommended stronger regulate regulation of the personal care workforce to increase protection for senior Australians and reduce the risk posed by unacceptable workers. Our bill had, recommended, res had responded to the recommendation 77 from the Royal Commission, which called for an authority that would conduct pre-employment screening for aged care workers and those responsible for governance of approved suppliers. Our approach applied to employment across the care and support sectors, incorporating aged care, disability support and veterans care. This approach included using the national database of cleared and excluded people to support those making employment decisions. It is clear the government has bowed to the unions by removing the specific schedule on workers' screening within the bill. The government must stand up to the unions and implement good policies to protect the rights of care sector workers by allowing a database to be established for all care workers that is consistent at a national level. One database across the care sector would have simplified processes for employers and made it easier for NDIS aged and veteran carers to move between caring roles in these sectors. It also protected aged care residents and gave providers the peace of mind that comes from knowing that their employees are fit to care for older Australians. Instead, this bill and the remaining protections it introduces for those in aged care has been delayed for no good reason. Under the coalition government, the number of home care packages and residential care packages rose every year and funding for aged care rose too. The 2022-23 budget included $522 million in funding for aged care reform, which built on the $18.3 billion committed in the 2021-22 budget and 2021-22 mid-year economic and fiscal outlook. 
That brought the total investment in aged care in response to the Royal Commission to over $19 billion. On this side of the chamber, we remain committed to providing senior Australians with the support they need to stay in their own home for longer, as evidenced by our term of government. I mentioned earlier that home care packages had risen every year under the coalition, but more specifically, these home care packages had increased from 60,308 in 2012-13 under Labor to a projected 275,597 in 24 25 an increase of 357 per cent. Additionally, in February this year, the coalition government had announced that, that eligible aged care workers would be paid up to $800 bonus. The aged care workforce retention bonus benefited 265,000 workers in the sector and was the fourth workforce bonus. The opposition will be keeping a close eye on upcoming aged care reform introduced by the Albanese government to ensure appropriate regulatory provisions are introduced and those who exhibit poor conduct in the aged care sector are held to account. We listened to the experiences of those who gave evidence to the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety and took decisive action to implement the recommendations and introduce reforms that delivered vital support and improved quality of care within the sector. Thank you, Senator Askew. If you could resume your seat for a moment. I shall now proceed to two-minute statements and call Senator Askew. Thank you. On a different topic. Today I would like to acknowledge the work of Mrs Annie Reevey, who has resigned from the Flinders Council after serving as mayor of this beautiful island paradise for almost four years. Mrs Reevey stood down from the leadership role three months shy of Tasmania's upcoming local government elections and plans to focus more on her health and wellbeing. Acting Flinders Mayor David Williams said he had enjoyed working with Annie over the past four years and recognised her dedication to the role of mayor and the effort she put into making our community a better place to live in. I have witnessed Mrs Reevey's commitment to this community for myself during a number of trips to Flinders Island and most recently sitting down with her just a few months ago as she explained the priorities for the island community and the unique challenges faced by residents in this remote archipelago. During that same visit I, visit, I inspected the newly sealed section of road that leads to Palana. Mrs Reevey championed for this six-kilometre section to be sealed, with this advocacy also leading to the Tasmanian government taking ownership of the road as it linked to the existing state-owned road that connects Flinders main port and airport. Flinders Island also embarked on an innovative tourism program during Mrs Reevey's tenure. The two-year Island Away project was created by the Flinders Island community with brand Tasmania focusing on the future of tourism in the Ferno Island groups. The Island Away uses community-led regenerative tourism principles to co-create the region's future. I first met Mrs Reevey when she was the principal of Westland System Primary School when my children were students there. Each time we have met on Flinders Island, she has remembered this, always taking an interest in what my children, who are now adults, are doing. And she has an amazing recollection for all of her students, and I'm sure she has impacted many lives throughout her extensive teaching career. We appreciate and thank you for all your service, Mrs. Reevey. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Askew. I call Senator Dodson. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I want to say a few words about the late Archie Roach. I remember sitting under my bowshed in Broom with Mr. Bill Johnson, the late British actor Pete Fossilswaite, and Archie. Archie and Pete had been on a journey of discovery in the Kimberley. They had camped out in the desert with the Nguru native title claimants and witnessed the senior leaders paint a huge canvas depicting their country. All night the elders sang songs of their country and its significance. They walked across the old Fitzroy Crossing River and uh, heard the stories of Jundamara, the famous one of a warrior, and his deeds against the encroaching pastoralists and the police posses out to kill him, for he had shot one of them. These were the stories of the killing times in the Kimberley being told to Archie and Peter. These were travels undertaken after meeting in Perth with Bill Johnson and his family and learning of the brutal murder of Bill's adopted Aboriginal son, Louis St John Johnson, by British backpackers who used a vehicle instead of horses in the killing. We are all working on a documentary called Lian Yan, how the two stories of our encounters with each other might come 
uh, together and make us as one and free us from our ignorances, fears and prejudices. Trying to expose truth and about the events in our historical and contemporary relationships involving AFL footballer Michael Long and his reflections on his, contemporary, on his courageous work from Melbourne to Canberra. Having attended too many funerals and sorry days, Michael put to the Prime Minister, Mr Howard, where is the love for my people? Leon Yarn was a song that Archie composed. The underpinning rhythm was come together because we've already been too far apart. Farewell, you, my Senator friend. Dodson. Senator Hanson Young, you have the call. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, following on um, from Senator Dodson, I too would like to pay my respects to uh, the late Archie Roach and uh, give my sympathies and condolences to his extended family. What an incredible human being he was. What an amazing musician he was. What an incredible contribution to Australia and indeed the world uh, he gave. His music, his art, had a power that transcends so many others. A power of being able to tell the truth about the history of this nation. The power to enlist understanding and empathy. The power to force us to think about how others are feeling, how they've been treated, and inspire the action we need to respond. This is the transformative power of music and art. And to that point, Madam Acting Deputy President, I also want to make a contribution today in relation to all artists and musicians who are struggling in this country, who have struggled for far too long under years of uh, ignorance and uh, a lack of support from the previous government, and to call on the new government to not simply put them in the later basket or too hard basket, but to actually act now to support the arts industry here in this country that desperately needs a helping hand. Whether it is insurance for live events, investment in our cultural institutions, the ability to have a seat at the table. As we lead into the budget in October, many people will be looking on and hoping that this government does better and more than the last, but it means bringing artists to the table and talking directly with them about what they need to continue their power, their truth-telling, their storytelling. Senator Bragg. Yes, Thanks very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I wanted to give a plug to Kinesha's Kitchen, which is in Elizabeth Bay in Sydney, uh, which has been providing uh, meals and services to people who are doing it tough for more than 30 years. Now, this year I'm going to be running the City to Surf for Kinesha's Kitchen, and uh, the City to Surf hasn't been run for two years because of the dreaded COVID disease. Uh, which is a real shame because uh, that has been a great event for the last 51 years uh, where people have had the opportunity to go and raise funds for important causes. Now, uh, I was able to duck down to Kinesis Kitchen in the past few weeks and uh, it is a one-stop shop for people that are down on their luck uh, because you can go there for a, a hot meal uh, but you can also access the services that you would need to get back into the workforce, uh, an iron shirt, um, a practice interview uh, and uh, access to other services uh, that will help you get back uh, into the workforce and back on your feet. Uh, so um, uh, I was able to meet with Carrie Dean, uh, who is running Kinesis, uh, and a number of her volunteers. She has more volunteers than you can poke a stick at, uh, and it is a really great service that she's providing that community there in Elizabeth Bay and I suspect uh, much uh, further beyond Elizabeth Bay. Uh, so this year I'm running the City of Surfer for Kinesis and we are looking for people to provide some support for Kinesis, which is uh, pretty much running on the smell of an oily rag through the goodwill of uh, people in the community uh, without much government support. So it's a good race, the City of Surf and Kinesis Kitchen is a good cause. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator O'Neill, you have the call. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to give tribute 
to the very hard work of the SDA Shoppies Union, who, along with uh, others in the trade union, union movement, notably the ASU and the ANMF, really fought very, very hard in the last parliament to make sure that superannuation goes to all workers. And I note Senator Bragg talking about people returning to work. Well, when they return to work, uh, even if they earn under $450 now, they will be entitled to super. Um, I was very proud in the last parliament to vote for that at the end of a long, successfully fought campaign over too many years. Um, yeah, the last year, nine years of the government, they were very resistant to this, but finally it was delivered. And I think that this is a very significant improvement for workers in Australia. Now, the SDA members, who are um, over 200,000 in number um, and approximately 100, uh, 1.3 million workers exist in the sector. That's retail, fast food, warehousing, hairdressing, beauty, pharmacy, online, re online retail and modelling. Um, predominantly women, 60 per cent of the workforce, approximately 131,000, and under 35, 57 per cent, approximately 120,000 Australians, and low-income earners in retail and food services, um, who really are two um, of the three lowest median weekly earning uh, workers in Australia, will get the benefit of now having a superannuation contribution on every hour that they work and every dollar that they earn. Now, there's so much more that needs to be done. Superannuation remains uh, inaccessible for some workers. Those in the gig economy who were in this building just last week spoke about how not only have they not got superannuation being paid anymore, they've had to dip into their super as the business model, the Amazon business model, has been attacking their capacity to even make ends meet. There's much more work to do with superannuation, but it's a Labor government in now and we'll be making sure that Australians get their fair share and prepare for a Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Roberts, you have the call. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm meeting this week with Attorney General Dreyfus to review the planned National Corruption Commission. I'll be taking One Nation's position to the Attorney General that checks and balances must be in place to preclude witch hunts. The terms of reference must allow for all outside influence on our decision making to be identified and removed. Outside influences are driving lucrative subsidies for unreliable solar and wind energy. These subsidies are lining the pockets of donors and sponsors of members of parliament in both chambers. Cronyism worth tens of billions of dollars. In my speech entitled This Parliament is a Crime Scene, I detailed the cronyism that infected the previous Liberal National Government. Crikey has now detailed similar cronyism and conflicts of interest in the Labor Party and their affiliated fundraising entities. Running government for the, prof for the benefit of oneself or one's party's finances is a betrayal of the trust the Australian people have placed in us. It is corruption and it destroys confidence in government and in governance. A government without the confidence of the people must rely on authoritarian measures to maintain control. This is a path the state and federal governments chose to take during COVID, and those paths have, powers have now become permanent. Freedoms stolen are never willingly surrendered. A federal ICAC must investigate the many conflicts of interest and tainted decision-making in government's COVID responses. Questions of complicity, cover-up and cronyism. A royal commission, though, is the only way to deal with the wider legal issues that arose during COVID. Constitutional questions about federal and state roles, the legal standing of the national cabinet, vaccine mandates in the public and private sector, the use of troops against law-abiding citizens, criminal harm from medical procedures conducted under duress, police use of excessive force must all be reviewed before we can move on, or we will be there again. We have one flag, we have one community, we are one nation founded of freedom and personal responsibility. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Dunningham, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Deputy, Acting Deputy President. Um, well, look, it's passing strange that uh, in a world like the one we're living in today, with all of the challenges households and businesses face, we'd be debating something, at least in the public domain, like the prayer said at the beginning of any parliamentary session. But look, now it's up for debate. I'm going to put on record my personal views around the prayer. And as a Christian, I'm very proud to be doing so. As we know, of course, participation in the Lord's Prayer at the beginning of any session of Parliament, any sitting day, is a voluntary thing, something I encourage others to do. But certainly, as I say, like with all commencement proceedings, it is voluntary. It's not compulsory. And recognising that we as humans can use all the help we can get uh, is, I would have thought, something that would receive broad support in the community. Uh, acknowledging that we don't have all the answers, that we don't get everything right, that we are 
in fact fallible is something I think that most people out there in the real world would agree with. And that's what this prayer that we say every day is all about. And it's important to acknowledge that the job we do here is so crucial. On behalf of Australians who elect us to come here and to represent them, we have to get the job right. So, to that end, asking God to help us can't be a bad thing, in my view. And I wouldn't have thought even for atheists would it be a bad thing. And as Nick Cater said today in today's uh, article in The Australian, his rallying call uh, for conservatives to unite around causes like this, amongst others, um, recognising that there is something bigger than ourselves uh, is a good counter for human hubris. Again, something I think most Australians would agree with when it comes to um, representative democracy. As it says in the good book, in Romans 14, verse 16, do not let what you know to be good be spoken of as evil. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Senator McCarthy, you have called. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I would like to just uh, share with the Senate an incredible weekend with the Yolngu people uh, of North East Arnhem Land and just take this opportunity in, in the minute and a half that I have to thank all of those involved in organising the four-day festival. Uh, it's a massive event, the Gama Festival, and I'd, I take this opportunity to particularly thank Dr Galaroy Yunapingu, uh, Jawa Yunapingu, Jabari Munungurch, Yanangul Munungu, Balapala Yunapingu, Mr Brewa Munungu and Denise Bowden, all of whom are part of the Yothi Indi uh, Foundation and the board that actually runs the Gama Festival, which began in 1999 as a community gathering in Gulkala, uh, Gulmach country, uh, in remote northeast Arnhem Land. And it's a place where so many thousands of Australians gather, and it is an incredible weekend. Uh, you see academics, you see people from all walks of life who are coming uh, to Nullumboy, fly into Nullumboy and then travel up to uh, Gulkala and have the opportunity to learn more and in particular uh, Balanda or non-Indigenous people, to learn more about uh, Yolngu and the First Nations people. And this weekend was incredibly important as well as the Prime Minister and my colleagues, Senator Pat Dodson and Linda Burney, uh, Marion Scrimger and Luke Gosling and also Mark Dreyfus. Uh, we were able to attend uh, at the invitation of the Yolngu people where the Prime Minister then <coughs> spoke about uh, the importance of a voice to Parliament and has now engaged with all of Australia uh, with a proposed question. So from myself and my colleagues, I just say thank you to the Yolngu people of North East Arnhem Land for your hospitality. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Faruqi, you have a call. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This country is changing. Our community is changing and our parliament is changing. More than half of us were born overseas or have a parent born overseas. A quarter of us have a non-European background. Only 44% now identify as Christian and that number is falling. Other religions are growing as is the number of Australians who don't have any religion, which is now almost 40%. This parliament is more diverse than ever. More First Nations people, more people of color, more women. Australia is changing. I'm glad to see Senator Hansen get absolutely slammed for storming out of here last week during the acknowledgement of country. It was frankly a pathetic stunt from a senator who is struggling with relevance deprivation. If we are genuine about saying to the community that parliament is a place that welcomes people from every race, faith and culture, its systems and norms which purport to represent the community must change. How can we continue to open our daily business with the Lord's Prayer? How can we continue to swear allegiance to a monarch of an outdated and a terrible institution that has wreaked havoc around the world? How can we allow racism to harm so many? The truth is, First Nations peoples are the sovereign owners of this land, and our society is now highly culturally diverse. Our parliament should be modern and secular. So let's stop pretending that we are a white, Christian, monocultural society. We are not. We never were. We must shed the shackles of colonialism. Racism, the oath to the British monarch, and the reading 
of the Lord's Prayer to start our day have no place in here. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Babbitt, you have the call. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I know this is not my first speech. <clears throat> I rise here today to speak of the sheer madness of the government's plan to deindustrialise and shut down Australia in pursuit of an unachievable fantasy of net zero emissions, a fantasy handed down by the unelected bureaucrats at the United Nations and the World Economic Forum who care not for the future and prosperity of our nation or our people and who care not for the environment. Net zero at its core is about power and control for a tiny elite global corporations and foreign powers. The science that CO2 emissions will cause catastrophic climate change is not settled and there is no true scientific consensus on the matter. Even if one was to accept the currently pushed narrative, Australia accounts for approximately 1 per cent of total global emissions and a cut of 43 per cent will have practically zero effect on global climate change. When the government says that they are going to reduce CO2 emissions, what they really should be saying is, let's reduce our standard of living. Let's close down Australian businesses. Let's close down factories. Let's stop making things. Let's stop using agricultural land and let's cut back on food production. We need to cut the rubbish and call it for what it is. Meanwhile, the CCP is not reducing any of their CO2 emissions. In fact, they have plans to build 43 more coal-fired power plants. What we will see is a transfer of wealth and the means of production from Australia over to the CCP. They will be quite happy with the direction that we are heading in. We shut down our country and they benefit. This will not result in any net decrease in CO2 emissions as they and others will simply increase their emissions and negate any reductions we make. What we need to do is move away from an obsession with CO2 and open up a conversation around pollution. We want to protect our natural world, keep our rainforests from being cut down, keep chemicals out of the estuaries and the sea, cut plastic pollution and make corporations accountable for industrial waste which they output when they produce goods and services. Yes, we do. So let's move the conversation to that. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Babbitt. Senator Van, you have the call. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Many complex issues come before this parliament. With all of them, I'm open-minded, ambitious, but also pragmatic. Like Labor's 43 per cent emissions reduction target, I'm supportive of the ambition, possibly even more ambitious than them. However, I'm very sceptical of their plan to get there. You see, the devil is in the details. And if the details are not properly declared, considered, serious in unintended consequences can occur. And I take that same approach to Labor looking to enshrine a voice to Parliament. By asking Australians to make a decision to change the constitution, it is only right to ensure that Australians are given detail of the changes and their consequences assessed. The notion the PM put up yesterday, most will find romantic in its simplicity. However, constitutional law is neither simple nor romantic. If the Prime Minister wants to be successful, he has to bring all Australians with him he has to provide a plan, he has to consult, he has to let Parliament inquire into it and report back to our citizens so their decision is informed. It is an unreasonable expectation to simply hold a referendum to ask Australians to give the government a blank cheque so that they can then go and make constitutional changes as they see fit. As the saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. While Labor's intentions may be good, without adequate consideration of the details, we may very well be signing Australians up for something that they do not want and may make their lives worse. As my good friend Senator Najim Price rightly pointed out in the first speech, there are very real problems currently affecting the lives of Indigenous communities, and they Thank are you, what Senator we should Van. be fixing Senator right Waters, now. You have the call. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Beryl Holmes, one of uh, the co-founders of Queensland's Children by Choice, described the campaign for abortion rights as one of the oldest and hardest fought of women's political struggles. And as we watch abortion rights being dismantled in the US, we know that the fight is not over. Abortion in Australia is still a postcode lottery. And despite decriminalisation across most of Australia, 
for far too many people dealing with, dealing with an unwanted pregnancy, um, they simply cannot access abortion because either they can't afford it or they can't get the time off needed to travel the sometimes hundreds of kilometres to the only provider in the region, or they fall outside the strict access rules in their state. Abortion is health care and should be provided free at public hospitals across the country. More GPs and nurses should be able to prescribe RU486, and the full cost of abortion and contraceptives should be covered by Medicare. I welcome comments from the Labor Women's Caucus about harmonising laws and improving access, but I urge the government to go back to their previous 2019 commitment to make abortion care a condition of federal hospital funding. It's very sad that the Prime Minister appeared to dump that commitment last week. I welcome commitments from Lynne Allison and Judith Troth today calling for free and unfettered access, with personal choice being the criteria. This is not a partisan issue, it is a rights issue. And as Children by Choice celebrates 50 years of operation this week, I recognise that progress has been made, but there is still such a long way to go. If our bodies, our choice is to mean anything, abortion must be accessible, affordable, safe, legal, compassionate and free from stigma. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Rennick, you have the call. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. Uh, no sooner had the electoral writs been signed than the Labor's new finance minister, Stephen Jones, had come out and said that Labor were going to look at investigating uh, rising the superannuation levy to 15 per cent in their second term. Now, why doesn't that surprise me? Because Labor just can't keep their hands off hard-working Australians' wages. Just tell me this, at what level of superannuation is Labor going to stop taking from hard-working Australians? You know, if Paul Keating had said back in 1992 that by 2025 we were going to have 12 per cent of people's wages taken out of their income, given it to someone they've never met, and there's no guarantee of ever getting it back, do you really think that the people would have accepted that? We certainly know that they didn't in New Zealand. In New Zealand, they had a referendum on compulsory superannuation in 1997, and they voted that down 92 per cent to 8. 92 per cent to 8. Now, there is no greater drain on the economy of this country than the $30 billion paid in fees to the financial services industries, and I'll include the banks in this. So I'm not being partisan here. I don't care what type of superannuation it is. And the $50 billion in tax concessions that mainly go to the top 20 per cent. Okay? Now, to put that in perspective, the pension costs $53 billion for the bottom 70 per cent. And that's the thing. Since superannuation has been introduced, the number of people on the pension or part pension has only been reduced from about 76 per cent to 70 per cent, and a large part of that was because of the index changes made in 2018. So tell me, superannuation is not fit for purpose. It is a massive drain on the economy of Australia, and it is hurting the people who need it the most, low-income earning Australians. Ah, Senator Billick. Thank you, President. It was exciting to join Minister for the Arts Tony Burke in Hobart recently for the first of a series of meetings across Australia to consult on our national cultural policy. The hundred or so people in the room were also excited, and not just for the opportunity to contribute to the policy. As I went around the room, there was a strong voice that the arts sector now have a minister and a government that really understands their issues. A government that understands there is far more value in the arts than just its economic contribution. Arts also contributes to our social wellbeing, our cultural identity and how Australian stories are told to Australians. The sector is breathing a collective sigh of relief because of the contrast of this government's attitude to the policy vacuum of the coalition. Over almost a decade, the little policy the previous government delivered was either focused purely on the financial returns from arts projects or on prosecuting cultural wars. I could hardly forget participating in hearings across Australia on a Senate inquiry into the government's since-abandoned Catalyst Slush Fund. Hundreds of artists lined up to criticise the Slush Fund, which had been funded by massive cuts to the Independent Australia Council. This misguided policy spoke volumes about the attitude of those opposite to the arts. This was the same government that, when it came to office, tore up Labor's Creative Australia policy and replaced it with nothing. 
Nothing. Didn't replace it with anything. Australia's artists, arts organisations and national cultural institutions deserve much better than the cuts and chaos of the past decade. They deserve a government that values the arts not just for what it contributes to the nation's economy, but also what it contributes to the nation's soul. And that's what they'll get under an Albanese Labor government. Thank you, Senator Billick. Senator Polly. The former coalition government had 10 years to deliver for Tasmania, and they didn't. They failed miserably. A majority Albanese Labor government outlined a holistic plan during the election campaign to deliver for Tasmania, a plan for local jobs, a plan to bring back manufacturing and secure jobs back to Tasmania in respect to our commitment to Waverley Woolen Mill, Firm and Taz and Green Hydrogen, a plan to access to TAFE and skills and a plan to address the cost of living pressures and access to GPs and health services. A plan for end-of-life care with a 10-bed hospice. A training and respite centre to train aged care workers and disability workers in northern Tasmania. We outlined a plan to grow our community and help them prosper. In Georgetown, alongside our hydrogen plan, we invested in a plan for health with a new swimming pool and gym which will be used by all members of the community. I will be working closely with the respective Labor ministers to make sure that our commitments are delivered in full and on time, something that the member for Bass failed to do during the three years that she was part of the lacklustre, no policy Morrison government. Labor has been elected to a majority government and we will be focusing on delivering a holistic plan for the people of Tasmania, as I said, to Thank improve you, the Senator cost Polly, of living. The time for this debate has now expired. Before we move to question time, I was asked uh, on Thursday to review uh, the Hansard, and I make this following statement. During question time on 28 July, I undertook to review two lines of questions to determine whether they met the guidelines in Odger's Australian Senate practice that, and I quote, supplementary questions are appropriate only for the purposes of elucidating information arising from the original question and answer. They are not appropriate for the purpose of introducing additional or new material or proposing a new question, even though such a question might be related to the subject matter of the original question. Minister Wong asked me to review questions asked by Senator McKenzie relating to the foot and mouth disease outbreak in Indonesia. Senator Birmingham identified that the questions each related to answers given by Minister Watt on the subject the previous day. If that was the intention, the questions could have been framed so as to make the connection clear from the outset. Senator Birmingham asked me to review a line of questions from Senator Ciccone on the same topic. In my view, the thread from the original answer to the supplementary questions here was easier to discern, and no one took a point of order in relation to those questions. Senate practice has changed since President McKellen provided the guidance on supplementary questions in 1986. In September 1996, Pres President Reid noted that many supplementary questions have now departed from those principles and have simply become additional questions. In August of 2018, President Ryan noted that the Senate has become, whether it should or not, somewhat more liberal in its application of those primary question. Now they almost always flow from the original question rather than its answer. This is no doubt because senators write their supplementary questions before the primary question is answered. If senators, if senators want to return to the original intention of supplementary questions, I'd be happy to refer that matter to the Procedures Committee. In the meantime, I encourage senators to make the connection from the primary question and answer to the supplementary questions clear. We will now move to question time, and I call Senator Hume. Thank you, Madam President. You. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallio. The Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations said recently in Gladstone, People will be seeing in their bank accounts what the change of government means. People will be seeing in their bank accounts a wage increase. 
Can the minister guarantee that there will always be real wage increases, in, will real wage growth under an Albanese Labor government? Thank you, Senator Hume. Uh, minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. I'm going to get that right this question time. Um, and I thank the uh, shadow minister for finance on your position um, and thank you for the question. Um, it is somewhat surprising that I would get a question like this this early on from those opposite who, let's not forget, as a deliberate design feature of their economic architecture was to ensure low wages or no wage growth for a decade. And I think that since we've come to government, we have been clear that getting wages moving is part of our economic plan. We have these challenging set of circumstances where the price of everything is going up and people's wages have been going back for the last decade, essentially, under your government's economic architecture. So we have a job to do. There is no doubt about that. And getting wages moving is a key part of our economic plan, just as it is dealing with the decade of wasted opportunities and wrong priorities on you know, a failure to land an energy policy which is placing upward pressure on bills that people are feeling in their pocket. So yes, we have provided a submission to the minimum wage case. That has handed down a wage outcome for those on the minimum wage. Uh, we have supported that, something that never featured in part of your government when you were in government, your submissions uh, to the Fair Senator Work McGrath. Commission. Not once. In fact, you had a whole section on the importance of low paid workers in the economy. That's how far you went. So we are absolutely determined to get wages moving. I think if you listen to the uh, media reports and the questions of the Treasurer, Madam President, it's Senator, very difficult uh, to Minister answer Gallagher, when you're getting yelled resume at. Your seat, please. Oh, uh, no, she hasn't finished her answer. I've sat the minister down because I'm having difficulty hearing her answer. Please continue, um, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, getting wages moving to assist households deal with the increasing cost of living, particularly the inflation challenge that we're thank dealing you, with. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Hume, second, first supplementary. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam President. So, given the minister has refused to guarantee real wages growth, and the Treasurer's economic update predicting that real wages are in fact falling. Does the minister stand by the previous statement of the Minister for Employment, Workplace and Relations that it's not a recovery if people's wages are effectively going backwards? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And we have to, to uh, continue on. We have inherited a very challenging set of economic uh, challenges from those opposite as a result of nine years of wasted opportunities and wrong priorities and a, a former government that was determined to make sure that people's wages went backwards. We have come in dealing with higher than expected inflation, and we are determined to get wages moving by submissions to the Fair Work, work case, by supporting those wages claims like <coughs> aged care workers That's currently right. before the Fair Work Commission. These are the things that a government can do. It can help to shape the policies that deliver the wage outcomes for people, and we do want them to get moving, but we are facing a uh, Resume your seat. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Birmingham, please. Senator Birmingham, Se Senator Birmingham, you stand, and then I give you the call, and then you start. You started to speak as you were rising, so please start now. Sorry, President. I was trying to be efficient in the use of time. Um, at, uh, uh, President, point of order, direct relevance. Uh, the minister, in relation to this supplementary question, has been asked very clearly about a quote attributed to one of her ministerial colleagues and whether she stands by that quote. Now, she has now, for some 49 seconds, talked around and about the broad topic, uh, but has not come directly to the quote. Thank you, uh, Senator Birmingham. In the um, supplementary question, there were references to other ministers and um, a real wage increase guarantee. I believe that uh, the minister is being relevant, but I will continue to listen carefully. 
Um, please continue, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I can assure the Senate that every single minister in an Albanese Labor government is focused on ensuring that we ease the cost of living in, on households, yeah, yeah. that we get wages thank moving, you, and Your that we deal with nine expired. years of Senator Hume, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. So the Treasurer recently said that there is no credible economic forecaster in Australia right now who thinks that wages growth is going to keep up with inflation. Does the minister agree with the Treasurer that the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations isn't a credible source when it comes to wages? And isn't it true that an Albanese government has already broken its promise on real wages growth? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. And I, I honestly cannot believe that the gall of those opposite to talk about real wage growth when it was a deliberate design feature of your economic architecture was to suppress wages. The reason we're in the position where we haven't had real wage growth is because you, when in government, were determined to put pressure on wages growth and make sure there wasn't any. Every minister in this government is focused on making sure Australians get more money in their pocket, whether it be childcare, whether it be through reducing energy prices, whether it be through getting wages growing, whether it be training for the, skill, the jobs of the future, the high-skilled jobs of the future. These are the areas where government can make a difference. Yeah. To Senator Nampajinka Price. Oh, beg your pardon, beg your pardon, Senator. My error, Senator Stewart. President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Can the minister outline the Albanese government's plans for a voice to Parliament? Minister Wong. Uh, I thank uh, Senator Stewart for, I think, her first question. Is that right? And congratulate her again and welcome her uh, to the Senate. Um, over the weekend, the Prime Minister gave the most significant speech on Indigenous affairs by an Australian Prime Minister since the national apology to the stolen generations. He outlined the government's plan to implement the Uluru Statement from the heart in full. And specifically, he laid out plans to enshrine a voice to parliament in the constitution, proposing a referendum question for consultation. Do you support an alteration of the constitution that establishes an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice? It's a straightforward proposition. It's a simple principle, a question from the heart. Our starting point is a recommendation to add three sentences to the constitution in recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders as the first peoples of this country. One, there shall be a body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Two, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice may make representations to parliament and the executive government on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And three, the parliament shall, <coughs> subject to this constitution, have powers to make laws with respect to the composition functions, powers and procedures of the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander voice. We are seeking momentous change together, but it is also a very simple one, because at its heart it's about consulting our First Nations brothers and sisters, our First Nations peoples, about consulting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples on the decisions that affect them. It is nothing more and nothing less, and as the Prime Minister said, it is simple courtesy and common decency. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Stewart, your first supplementary. Can the Minister please explain, explain how a voice to parliament can support practical outcomes and closing the gap? Minister Wong. I thank the Senator for her supplementary question. And the voice will be an unflinching source of advice and of accountability. It's not a third chamber. It's not a rolling veto. It's not a blank cheque. It's a body with the perspective and power and platform to tell the government and the parliament the truth about what is working and what is not, to tell the truth with clarity and with conviction. So it's not an either-or proposition. We can and must do both. It won't delay our plan to train 500 new Aboriginal healthcare workers or stand in the way of our new investments in life-saving kidney dialysis treatment. It won't slow us from upgrading roads or expanding education and economic opportunities. On the contrary, 
Recognition and a voice will accelerate progress because the accountability of the voice will help us get on track to close the gap. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Stewart, second supplementary. Can the minister explain to the Senate the Uluru Statement from the Heart process leading to the voice to parliament? Minister Wong. I thank Senator Stewart for her supplementary. There are now more First Nations parliamentarians, including uh, the good senator, than ever before, and that does make an enormous difference. But elections mean parliamentarians come and go. And the voice will exist and endure outside of the ups and downs of election cycles. And let's recall that the statement from the heart is the outcome of the most significant consultation process, the most significant consultation process the First Nation peoples Australia has ever seen. It builds on the work of the expert panel on constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians and the 16-member referendum council. There had been many years of consultation by the time the Council travelled to 12 different locations around Australia and met with over 1,200 1200 Indigenous representatives. And whilst I respect that there are differences of views, including this place, I do urge senators to recognise and respect the years of concerted Thank you, Minister effort Wong. that has gone us has this expired. far. Senator Nampajing for Price. <clears throat> Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister, representing the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Senator Voice, and how they will be selected prior to asking Australians to amend the Constitution. Thank you, Senator. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And I can certainly um, start to provide an answer, but um, if there is more information that I can provide uh, to Senator, I will following uh, question time. I think the idea that the Prime Minister outlined on the weekend uh, is for the consultations uh, to commence on a whole range of detail about progressing this to the referendum stage. And I think the Prime Minister was very clear on the weekend that he didn't want to um, to determine um, arrangements without consultations with First Nations people, um, but the regional voice arrangements will be put in place and they will provide a nationally consistent uh, system for First Nations people and government to work in partnership at the regional level. And they will, the regional voice arrangements will complement a First Nations voice at the national level. Obviously, there will be uh, consultations across the board, not just with First Nations uh, communities, but also with uh, state and territory governments. But if I can uh, provide further information uh, for the senator, I will do following question time. First supplementary, Senator Nampajinka Price. Thank you, President. What process has the government put in place for Australians, including Indigenous Australians, to provide feedback about the proposed question and approach to the voice. Thank you, Senator. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. Um, my understanding is that there has been deep consultation uh, with a whole range of stakeholders around um, the development of the advice that has informed uh, the speech the Prime Minister gave on the weekend. Um, obviously, there's been the work that previous parliaments uh, have done, um, but also the work that Dr Karma and Dr Langton have done, uh, which has helped inform the position that the Prime Minister outlined on the weekend. But, and I think the Prime Minister has been clear about this, that, uh, that there needs to be a lot more discussion and consultation and listening from government as we proceed to the next stages um, of the referendum process, and that will be done. This is being done in the spirit of cooperation, collaboration and goodwill. And, um, Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. As Senator Nampajinka Price, second supplementary. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam President. Prior to the vote on The Voice and noting the government is fast-tracking abolishing the cashless debit card, 
Will the government outline its alternative plans for tackling alcoholism, drug addiction, problem gambling, violent assaults and sexual abuse in Indigenous communities? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, I thank the President and I thank uh, the Senator for the question. I think the, the outline that the Prime Minister gave on the weekend was that we want to consult further, listen, get the details right. Oh, no, I mean, that is the approach the government will take, whether you guys like it or not. In relation to the second part of the question, um, we, we are working with the Northern Territory government in relation to specific supports that need to be on the ground in the Northern Territory, but obviously there are a whole range of programs that are funded from the Commonwealth in partnership with the states and territories to support First Nations communities across the board, whether that be in health, uh, social supports, housing, education, and those, of course, will continue, but with greater purpose from this government than from, the, from previous arrangements that have been put in place where we seek to collaborate, to cooperate and to listen to First Nations communities. Thank you, Minister. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, um, President. Pre my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister. How does your proposed constitutionally enshrined Indigenous voice to parliament affect First Nations people's sovereignty in this country? Minister Wong. Well, thank you, um, Senator Thorpe, for the question. Uh, I think uh, the government's made clear uh, that uh, the, uh, we will look to implement uh, in full uh, the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which, as you know, goes to voice, treaty and truth. Uh, I understand that you personally have a different view about the order of those achievements or, or those, uh, those objectives. Um, they're not, you know, from our perspective, given the level of consultation with First Nations communities that led to or that grounded the Uluru Statement for the Heart, uh, we are proceeding uh, respectfully uh, in accordance uh, with that statement. Uh, and I would make this point, and it picks up really what Senator Price uh, asked my colleague, Senator Gallagher. Uh, I appreciate that this is, a, you know, this is a big change for many people, and I appreciate that there are those who wish to um, ask questions of detail sometimes uh, even if those questions were answered, they would not change their position. I respect that. But um, Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Thorpe. Uh, just a point of order, uh, just going off track. So, is it? Relevance. Relevance. My question was how does going into the Constitution affect First People's sovereignty in this country? Thank That's you. all. Thank you. Uh, Senator Thorpe, I believe uh, the minister is being relevant. Minister Wong, please continue. Well, as, I, as I understand mm -hmm. what has been put to us by the, uh, the representatives of First Nations peoples, as outlined in the Uluru Statement from the Heart, is that uh, they are seeking that we respond uh, first to the voice uh, um, before uh, our, you know, moving to uh, treaty and truth. I would make the point that the enshrinement of a voice is both symbolic, but it is also pragmatic. It's symbolic because it will in include, include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the founding document of our country. Uh, it is pragmatic, uh, given that there is no systematic process uh, for First Nations peoples to provide Thank advice you, Minister. to Your time has expired. Senator Thorpe, first supplementary. Thank you, President. How does the Prime Minister's proposal for a referendum honour the principles of free, prior and informed consent as defined in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which Labor supported in the last parliament? Minister Wong. What's the question? I, I, I'm sorry, I might have misheard, but I couldn't actually hear the question in that. Okay. I'll just, uh, Senator Thorpe, wait for the call. Minister Wong will ask uh, the senator to repeat her question, if the clocks could be held. Thank you, Minister Thorpe. Uh, senator Thorpe. Minister will, be, will do. 
How does the Prime Minister's proposal for a referendum honour the principles of free, prior and informed consent as defined in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which Labor supported in the last parliament? Minister Wong. The, the, the Prime Minister is seeking to implement not only an election commitment uh, but a call from First Nations peoples for this action. Uh, so, uh, when you talk about consent, uh, my view, what I'd put, what put, what I'd put to you, Senator, through you, uh, President, uh, is that the consent is a representative group, a representative group which has come together. I appreciate you may not agree with it, uh, but people from across this country, First Nations peoples, have come together and they have asked for this. They have put out their. I don't know if Senator Thorpe and Senator Price wish to. Do you want me to continue, or do you want to? No, 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 Minister, no, no, uh, no. Senator no, just... Mackenzie, interjections are disorderly. Minister, my, my please point, continue. My point is this: I appreciate that you have a difference of views, but we are responding to. Uh, and Senator Dodson, I'm sure, could speak with much greater eloquence than I. Uh, the call from First Nations peoples across this country, as exemplified Minister and Wong, as captured. Minister please resume your seat. Senator Thorpe. Point of order on relevance. Uh, as the only sitting member in this place that was at Uluru, it was no consensus. There was no consent. Senator, I was Thorpe, there. Please Were you? resume your seat. Uh, the minister is being relevant to the question that you asked. Minister Wong, please continue. Uh, well, uh, this is a, a call oh, your that we has wish expired. to respond to. Um, Senator Thorpe, second supplementary. Will you legislate for a Makarata Commission before any referendum? So we want a treaty before the referendum. Will you legislate it before the referendum? Minister Wong. Uh, uh, if I can, uh, I know that uh, Ms. Burney uh, and the attorney have had uh, some consultations on this, uh, and if I. Uh, and I think the phrase co-designing um, uh, was, was used, but if I can get further information about the timing of that, uh, I will do so. I'd make the point uh, that uh, you know, we, we are seeking to progress this reform uh, in, the, it, it, in the priority that we have been that has been identified by First Nations peoples. As I said, I appreciate that isn't your view, but is the view of the great many. Um, who came together uh, to form the Uluru Statement from the Heart, uh, who, who, are also, who are also democratic representatives in their own right, who are also democratic representatives in their own right of their peoples, and we are responding to that. Uh, but if I can get uh, further information about uh, the process of, of, of design Thank for you, Macarata, Minister Wong. Your consider. time has expired, and I would ask you to address your um, quest answers to questions to the Chair. Senator Stirl. Thanks, Madam President. My question is to the Minister rep representing for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government, Senator Watt. Could the Minister outline the findings of the ANAO's report into the Building Better Regions Fund? Uh, Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, and Senator Stirl, as a matter of fact, I can. Uh, this, and I know this is something that you followed very closely in your role as the chair of, the, of RAT, the committee we know affectionately as RAT in this place. Well, I don't know about you, Senator Stirl, but I, think, I, I thought that the election defeat that we saw recently of the former coalition government meant that once and for all the coalition's rorts had ended. The scandals, the rorts, the media reports, them. finally we might be making it clear of that, but sadly these reports have not even ended with the defeat of this government. Because last week, the Australian National Audit Office released yet another scathing report into the former government's management of the $1.15 billion Building Better Regions Fund. This report confirmed what we already knew about the former government. It was the latest rort from a government notorious for rorts. Sports rorts, uh, car Senator park Watt, rorts, stacking the your AAT. Seat. Resume your seat. And I would ask you to look to me when you're answering questions so that you can see that I'm asking you to sit down. Senator Rennick. Point of order, Chair. The Auditor General is a partisan hack whose credibility oh, was Senator trashed Rennick. in the Leppington Triangle. Rennick, resume your seat. 
Senator Rennick, resume your seat. There is no point of order. Minister Wong. Minister Wong, I've given you the call. Well. Point of order. Yes, I've given you the call. Oh, sorry, sorry, President. I didn't hear. Well, obviously the Auditor General can't uh, defend themselves. The the point of order is that I'd ask that you ensure the Auditor General is advised of what has just been said, uh, in order that the Auditor General can avail themselves uh, of of the protections which exist uh, under Hansard. Thank you, uh, Minister Wong. I'm not sure that it is my job to uh, advise outside bodies, but I'll seek the advice of the clerk, and if it is, I will do so. Senator Watt, please uh, continue your comments. Little about accountability, if that's the way in which they regarded the high office of Auditor General of this country. Senator Rennick. Now, what the report released last week showed is that communities in regional Australia have been dudded as the coalition actively ignored grant guidelines for their own political purposes in the largest open and competitive grants program available for regional projects. Regional communities with projects assessed as deserving were dumped Senator to accommodate McGrath. the political needs of a desperate, failing government Senator in Davey. its final hours. Now, we always said in the run-up to the election that the coalition spent public money like Senator it was Liberal Watt, National Party money. Resume your seat. I would ask senators to be quiet when the minister is answering the question because I need to hear the answers as well as other senators in this place. Senator Watt, please continue. Thank you, President. As I say, we said repeatedly that the coalition spent public money like it was Liberal and National Party money, and here is yet more proof in this fund. Regional Australia deserves better, taxpayers deserve Thank you, better, Senator Watt. and they'll get it from Your this time government. has expired. Uh, Senator Stirl, first supplementary. Yes, thank you, Madam President. My Lord, what did the ANO report find regarding panel composition and record keeping of decisions, Minister? Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator Stirl. Well, one of the worst aspects of the report tabled last week was what it had to say about ministerial panel composition and record keeping of decisions. I mean, that presumes that there was record keeping of decisions, which of course there was not. Instead of transparent, accountable decision making, ministerial decisions were shrouded in secrecy. The ministerial panel made decisions on the basis of choose your own adventure criteria, a non exhaustive list of other factors that were not fully explained to those applying for grants. Now, I know that the Nationals have again said this was all about supporting the regions. But of course, what happened with this program was that some regional areas were dumped at, to favour certain other regional areas. Would they maybe have been regional areas that had the right colour code next to them in a spreadsheet? We all know that's how the Nationals went about decision making. And who benefited most from this? The Nationals. The Nationals benefited the most as proper process was actively ignored. Those seats got $104 million Minister more Watt, than if the proper process had been followed. The time has expired. Senator Stirl, second supplementary. Yes, thank you, Madam President. Oh, goodness me. Order. Senator Stirl, resume your seat. I'll wait for quiet before I call Senator Stirl again. Senator McKenzie. Senator Stirl. Oh, with pleasure. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, now, Minister. Are you aware of any other programs where similar concerns to those identified by the ANAO have been raised? Minister Watt. Thank you, President. And again, Senator Stirl, as a matter of fact, I do. Because all you need to do is look at year after year of the record of the former government to find rort after rort after rort after rort. Minister Watt. Now let's just start. Resume your seat. I'm waiting for quiet until I ask the minister to again. Uh, resume his remarks. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. I can understand why Senator Mackenzie, of all people, gets a bit toey when we talk about rorts in this chamber. But let's, so because, of course, we have sports rorts, where almost half the projects that were Senator funded were McCarr actually ineligible for funding until they had the colour-coded spreadsheet that emerged out of Senator Mackenzie's office. We've got the car park rorts, $660 million of rorts, which the former government used simply to target their own marginal seats. 
And while those opposite love to name check regional communities, when it comes to funding them, the Auditor General found that 27 per cent of regional grants awarded by the Commonwealth between 2018 and 2021 actually went to recipients from major cities. Remember the regional pool that just happened to be in North Sydney? That's how much they care about regions. They will rule it till they die, Minister and that's why they're out of government. Your time has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to Senator Gallagher, representing the Minister for Health. Tavistock Gender Clinic in the UK, a leading provider of gender dysphoria services, will close in 2023. Britain's National Health Service asked Dr Hilary Cass, past president of the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, to review the treatment of children with gender dysphoria. The Cass review found Tavistock Gender Clinic has failed vulnerable children and it recommended closing Tavistock. Finland, France and Sweden have taken the same decision for their gender clinics. Here in Australia, Melbourne's Royal Children's Hospital has many linkages with Tavistock. Minister, will you review Australia's gender clinics to ensure these clinics are not causing the same harm to vulnerable children that the CAST review found at Tavistock? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, as the minister representing the Minister for Health, if there are further information I can provide after question time, I would do so. I would say that the Royal Children's Hospital has an excellent reputation in um, paediatric care in Australia, um, staffed by uh, world-renowned um, medical professionals providing first-rate care to uh, younger citizens in the state, but also around the country. Um, and uh, I don't have close knowledge of the, the um, services they would provide to children with uh, gen gender dysphoria, but I have no doubt that they um, have the professional standards and the professional skills that are required to provide those young people and their families with first level uh, advice and health care. We have no information um, that's available to the government, to my knowledge, that uh, we should see it any differently to that. That is, that where there are children that require health services, that they access it through a children's uh, hospital, uh, that those services are accredited, there's professional standards in place, there's appropriate um, ethics and, and various advisory bodies that inform the delivery of those services, uh, and if there are concerns around them, that they are dealt with through the appropriate channels, um, not necessarily by politicians who have particular views about certain things, but actually deal with them as, through the delivery of health services, as we do so in a whole range of other areas of paediatric care. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Roberts, first supplementary. Thank you. So you can't say whether you will review. Evidence shows that the use of puberty blockers sterilises children and the impact on brain development is unknown. The Royal Children's Hospital is currently studying the impact of puberty blockers on children. We are literally offering a treatment we do not know is safe. Minister, when will the Australian government intervene and demand the closure of all gender clinics in Australia until gender treatment in children is proven to be safe, if ever? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. And I think um, the government has um, no intention to intervene and ban particular services, health services, um, that are supporting families and supporting children to access the type of care that they need uh, for their individual situation. If there is further information I can provide, and I would say as, as a former health minister, um, you know, health services in this country, and we are very fortunate, uh, are heavily regulated. Um, the professionals who provide health services are heavily regulated. There are professional bodies in place. There are complaints mechanisms. There are a whole range of avenues, if there are concerns about any health service, uh, that those would go through and be dealt with. They are not normally dealt with on the floor of a parliamentary chamber. Um, you know, there are many families that need services. The Australian government is about providing health services, not Thank taking you, them away. Minister, the time has expired. Senator Roberts, second supplement. Thank you, Minister. One Nation listens to people, and this is what we're hearing. So we, we speak up for constituents. <laughs> Minister, a child who has not even reached puberty is incapable of knowing their own mind. Doctors and sometimes parents are taking these decisions on the child's behalf. Has the government considered the legal liability it is incurring for the government's part in this medical malpractice? Minister Gallagher. Thank you, 
Thank you, President. Well, I don't agree that it's medical malpractice, um, nor do I agree with the proposition being put forward in the question that there are professionals and parents making decisions that are harmful to, to young people. Um, perhaps, Senator Roberts, it might be good for you to go and ask the health professionals that are providing these services how they provide them and how they support young people rather than just taking a particular view. I've always found that going in and asking questions and being open-minded about you know, not just necessarily taking some one individual's view about it but actually learning from the health professionals is useful. Um, but I, I also think it's um, you know, saying it's medical ma malpractice um, it goes too far for when you're looking at the vulnerability of the young people and children that are needing this kind of support through the health system, we should be very sensitive in how we deal with it. And as a government, we're keen on making sure that we are able to provide health services to anyone who needs it, regardless you, of their circumstances. Time has Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Labor's Powering Australia plan says in black and white that it will cut power bills for families and businesses by $275 a year for homes by 2025 compared to today. Will the minister representing the Treasurer guarantee that Australian families and businesses will see a cut to power bills of $275 a year by 2025 compared to today? Thank you, Senator Hughes. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, uh, President, and I thank uh, Senator Hughes for the question and again for leading with their chin on a matter around energy policy. <laughs> the first question was on wages policy, the, the deliberate design feature of the economic architecture. The second one, or well, third one, the third one is on energy policy. How many was it? Twenty-two didn't land one of them. Twenty-two. 22 in nine years didn't land one Gallagher. of them, and what do we got now? An energy oh, crisis. Sorry. An Minister energy Gallagher. crisis. Uh, Senator Hughes. Point of order, direct relevance. The question was around power uh, bills being cut to families and businesses, and a promise from Treasury that that occurred. Not around climate policy. This was about cutting. Thank you, Senator bills. Hughes. Thank. Senator Hughes, resume your seat. Senator Hughes, I would ask Minister Wong. Senator Hughes, senators, I would ask senators not to argue across the table. Um, Minister Wong and Senator Hughes, um, the minister is being relevant. She is talking about the price of electricity. I will listen carefully and uh, to the rest of. The senator uh, stood up, Senator Hughes, and called a point of order. It is not for other senators to interject. I've made my decision. I've indicated I will listen carefully uh, to the minute 31 seconds remaining. And if the minister isn't being relevant, I will direct her to the question. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. And the senator asked me where, uh, whether the government would guarantee um, Australians uh, lower power prices, and yes, we will. Uh, we will. We will put downward pressure. We will put downward pressure on energy prices. Absolutely, because we um, are doing Minister, exactly what we seat, said please. we would do. I can't. I, uh, Senator Hughes, unless. Thank you, Senator Cash. I sat the minister down because I couldn't hear her answers. I will wait until there's quiet in the chamber before I call the minister again. Minister Gallagher. Thank, thank you, President. We will lower power prices by implementing the Powering Australia plan, which we took to the election, which was our one and only plan compared to their 22 plans that they didn't implement in nine years. And we will take the plan and the the absolute gall of the opposition when we know that the member for Hume, two days before the election was called, actually amended the industry code for electrical uh, retailers on the 6th of April to delay the release of increases in the default market offer for New South Wales 
Queensland and South Australia. That's what your government Order. did two days Order. before the election was called. You hid the increase of electricity prices. You hid it. Not Order. only did you not try to sweep Senator it under, Hughes. you amended the industry code so that people didn't know before the election. That's what you did. Now, we will clean up this mess. We Minister, will implement your time Powering has Australia. Senator Hughes, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, perhaps uh, Minister Gallagher might need to listen to the Australian Energy Regulator, because ever since the change of government, the Australian Energy Regulator has stated that increasing prices are likely to persist. Doesn't this show that the independent experts don't believe that Labor's policies will reduce power prices? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. And I would say that the 19.7 per cent increase to the default market offer that the former government hid from the Australian people on the eve of an election, that is what you Senator did. Hughes. You didn't want people to know before the election that there was a 19.7 per cent increase coming their way. Our policy will put downward pressure on electricity prices by getting more renewables into the grid. We will do what we said we will do. We uh, will Minister put downward Gallagher, pressure. Resume your seat. I am struggling to hear the minister's answers. Please listen quietly. And interjections are disorderly, particularly those across the chamber. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you, Madam President. We will implement the Powering Australia plan. It will put more renewables into the grid. 82 per cent of uh, Powering Australia plan will be from renewable energy. It will put down pressure Hughes. on energy bills, on electricity bills. You guys weren't doing it because you didn't believe in renewables, right? You couldn't sign up to it. That is what will Your help put down with pressure on this. Senator Hughes, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Now, I appreciate there's been a guarantee, which is probably a word not in the talking points because uh, no one else will say that word from Labor. But given the minister representing the Treasurer has actually really signed up with the rest of the Albanese government and its ministers to refuse to guarantee the $275 that was promised, and that's the number we're asking you to guarantee, isn't it true that the Albanese government has already broken its promise on power bill reduction. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Your time has expired. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, Madam President. From out of the mouths of those that continuously broke promises, we will guarantee that we will implement Senator our Hughes. Powering Australia plan, which will put downward pressure on electricity prices and assist households in a way that those opposite Minister, never did. Minister, please resume your seat. The minister, please uh, continue now that the chamber is quiet. Thank you, President. Uh, we stand by the modelling that underpinned our plan. We stand by our plan. We stand by Senator the Mazar, fact. Take a breath. We stand by the fact that we Senator will be Hughes. honest and upfront with the Australian people. We don't stand by the behaviour of those opposite, particularly the member for Hume, who, on the eve of an election being called amended the industry code so that the Australian people didn't go to the election knowing that under your watch there had been a 19.7 per cent increase in electricity. Uh, Senator Rice. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. Your government has rushed the implementation of the previous Liberal government's new Workforce Australia program, providing only a 30-day suspension of mutual obligations that ended last week. You've now provided an additional 30-day suspension, but only for points-based activities. So people who can't attend their required appointments are still at risk of losing their payments, even when it's the broken system that has allocated them to service providers that are too far away or don't meet their accessibility needs. Will you commit to extending a pause on all mutual obligations for at least 90 days to ensure that no one loses their payments in this cost of living crisis? Thank you, Senator Rice. Uh, Minister Watt. Uh, thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Rice, for the question. Uh, obviously, as you'll be aware, I'm the representing minister, so I'll certainly do my best to give you the best answer I can. Something that, something that 
happened when you were in government. I know it feels like a long time ago, but you'll get used to it. Um, uh, Senator Rice, Se Minister uh, I'll Watt, certainly resume your seat. I'm asking senators to be quiet. I can barely hear uh, the minister's response to the question asked by Senator Rice. Minister, please continue. As, as I was, thanks, President. As I was saying, Senator Rice, I'll give you the best answer I can uh, as the repping minister and provide you with further information to your questions. Uh, this government uh, does accept and believe in the principle of mutual obligation, uh, and uh, that is something that Labor has supported for some time, not just in this government. Uh, but the way we go about doing that is by providing people who are unemployed with opportunities to enter the workforce, including by providing skills. Now, I've heard Minister Burke uh, talk about the fact that under this program that your question is about, um, that we are not simply going to be requiring people to apply for jobs endlessly, uh, but we are going to be providing people with opportunities to gain licences, to gain other skills, in order to help them into work. Um, so it is an alternative way of assisting people to get into work while, re while requiring people who are in, uh, in, in receipt of public funds uh, to take up those opportunities to help find work. That is probably even more important at a time in Australia when we have such low unemployment. Um, we do need to encourage everyone who is available to take up work uh, for themselves, for their families and for the country. Uh, so we, we stand by this program. I stand by what Minister Burke said, and I'm happy to provide you with further detailed answers to your questions. Thank you, Minister Watts. Um, Senator Rice, first supplementary. Despite promises of a clean slate, we've seen demerit points carried over from the old system, broken location services with people being directed to apply for jobs in areas they don't live in, um, inaccessibility for diverse communities, the dead naming of trans people in the system, and technical difficulty after technical difficulty. Minister, I know that you have promised to get back to us, but given the rollout has been an unmitigated disaster from day one, how can the government justify not extending the pause on mutual obligations you, until the, all the flaws expired. have been wiped out? Um, thanks, uh, President, and thanks, Senator Rice. Uh, we don't believe that at this point in time a pause uh, is required to the system in the way that you suggest. Uh, we, we accept uh, that this program isn't perfect and we intend to go about fixing it. Uh, the, the technical issues that you refer to are obviously things that we take seriously, and if there are any additional flaws in the system that you uh, believe should be addressed, then I'd be more than happy to talk with you about that or to facilitate a meeting with the minister. Senator Rice, second supplementary. Thanks, Minister. You say <laughs> you take those issues seriously. Yet right now I've, I'm hearing from hundreds of people who are terrified of losing their income support <coughs> payments now through no fault of their own while food costs are up and many people are struggling to stretch a dollar far enough to survive. What do you say to those people? Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Minister, uh, Senator Rice. Uh, what I say to those people that is core to our beliefs. Uh, and I noticed that senators over that side are laughing at that proposition, which you know, that's really something you'd need to ask yourself, Senator Van. Um, uh, Senator the... Watt, uh, Minister Watt, I'd ask you to direct your questions to the president and answer Senator Rice's question. Thank you, President. So what I say to those people, as I say, is that they can have confidence that a Labor government uh, will support them uh, and that we will continue to make systems and programs better improve them. We will not have Order. a callous attitude towards people who are unemployed in the way that we saw repeatedly uh, from the former government, uh, and we will continue to make these programs better. Uh, Senator Pratt. And my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister please update the Senate on the government's response to the la latest wave of COVID-19? Thank you, um, Senator Pratt. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. And I um, thank Senator Pratt for the question and the opportunity to update the Senate on this very dangerous third Omicron wave uh, that is um, prevalent through the Australian community. There are many Australians who are losing their life every day, uh, Madam President. It's a very sobering reminder that we're still in the throes of this pandemic. 
Our clear message to Australians is you're not fully protected against COVID unless you have had your third or fourth dose. So for those people that are behind with their booster or eligible for their fourth dose, please go out there and get vaccinated. It will offer you individual protection, but also it will offer uh, significant um, protection across the community, particularly for those that are vulnerable. We understand that this is a really tough time for many Australians who are fatigued after uh, the past two years of this pandemic. But there are things we can all do to protect ourselves and help protect others. Uh, firstly, go and get your third or fourth dose. If you're eligible for antivirals, um, please get them. Ask your doctor for them. If you can't socially distance, then wear a mask. If you're sick, stay at home and also make sure that you stay up to date with the latest health advice. Australians know that the pandemic is not over and people should continue to act in accordance with the health advice. We have taken uh, action to take the pressure off our hospitals and protect the health of Australians by extending the National Partnership on um, COVID-19 for the public hospital system. We've extended that support to hospitals. We've expanded access to fourth doses. We've expanded access to antiviral medicines for eligible re uh, recipients. We're continuing to get information out to families in the community and also strengthen protections in aged care, where COVID-19 is still such a significant issue. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pratt. First supplement. Thank you, President. Could the minister update the Senate on the rate of uptake for the fourth vaccine dose? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Pratt for the supplementary. Since it, um, expanded eligibility has been made for the fourth dose, the number of people getting a fourth dose each week has tripled from around 180,000 a week to more than 500,000 per week. Over four million people have had a fourth dose which is up almost 1.5 million since we expanded the eligibility. More than 50,000 people got their third dose in the last week, but more than 5 million Australians have still not had theirs. Uh, data shows that people are more likely to get severe illness, admitted to ICU or, uh, or to die, if they're not vaccinated or are overdue for a vaccination compared with those who've had their recommended vaccinations. For those as aged 50 to 69, it's around 16 times more likely. Almost three quarters of the Victorians who died this year after contracting COVID had not had their third dose. Senator Pratt, second supplementary. Thank you. Could the minister update the Senate on the rates of vaccination for Australians in aged care? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Um, the Labor government has now made COVID-19 vaccination rates of aged care residents publicly available to drive the uptake of vaccinations as part of the government's winter plan. 78.8 per cent of eligible residents in residential aged care facilities have received a fourth dose, up from around 50 per cent on 9 June, when Minister Wells and Minister Butler wrote to providers to ask them to improve that rate. From today, uh, the aggregated data for each residential aged care home will be available in both a list and interactive map. And this data will be updated weekly on the Department of Health and Aged Care website. The Labor government's winter plan to boost vaccination rates is already working. At the start of June, less than 50 per cent of residents had a fourth COVID-19 dose, but vaccination rates have now increased to 78.8 per cent. Thank you, Minister. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, um, President. President. <laughs> um, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. Why is the government creating uncertainty for people with serious medical conditions by refusing to confirm funding commitments? On 1 March 2022, now Minister Butler announced funding for Patient Pathways Telehealth Nurse Program from 1 July 2022 as an election commitment. He has now stated that funding for the program is still being finalised and will be delivered, if it is delivered, through the October budget, but is still subject to an independent evaluation. Why is the government now forcing the provider into a period of uncertainty? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Madam <coughs> President. Um, I'll have to take that question on notice. Uh, the bits, well, I, I understand the bits around going through the budget process because those decisions are still underway. And as, as Senator Rustin from sitting on the ERC would note, uh, that in lead up to a budget, we do go through a process of assessing and approving and making decisions about what will be funded in the budget. And those decisions 
are currently before government. I am trying to be directly relevant. I beg your um, pardon. Sorry, Minister. Um, Senator Rustin. On a, on a point of relevance, I was actually um, asking the minister in relation to a commitment that had been promised on the 1st of July and why it was being considered in the budget in October when it actually had been committed to start on the 1st of July. Thank you, uh, Senator. I'll draw the minister's uh, attention to that part of the question. Minister Gallagher. Um, Oh, someone's trying to help me. Um, <laughs> thank you, President. Uh, if it is relating to a previously funded commitment from the government, we are also the former government. We are also going through a process around that. Uh, but I will look. I, I think, in the interest of the chamber and giving accurate information, I'm not briefed on this matter, and I would bring this information back uh, to the senator um, following question time. Thank you, uh, Minister. Senator uh, Rustin, first supplementary. Mm. Uh, why is the government creating certainty for young Australians facing mental health challenges by not honouring funding commitments? Young Australians living on Bribie Island were promised greater access to mental health services by the establishment of permanent official telehealth uh, uh, satellite services. Why is the government creating uncertainties for these vulnerable Australians by refusing to confirm this funding? And is it the intention of the government to put all of its election promises through the ERC? Thank you, uh, Senator Rustin. Minister uh, Gallagher. Thank you, um, Madam President. In relation to the second part of the question, yes, uh, we are a fiscally responsible uh, government and we will be putting through all our expenditure. I don't know how it worked under the previous government and whether you just did sign blank checks that went around ERC or whether uh, the Prime Minister Order. just authorised all the spending. Uh, but Order. we have. Well, I am trying to answer the um, question, Minister Senator Gallagher, Rennie. Please resume your seat. I wait for quiet. Uh, senators on my right, Minister Gallagher. Um, all of our election commitments uh, and other pressures that are coming our way, of which there are a substantial, um, will be going through the ERC process. I don't think that is a surprise, or it shouldn't be a surprise uh, to anyone. In relation to the allegation around uncertainty, um, I Order. reject the insinuation in the question. Uh, Labor is always about investing and strengthening Medicare and health services, and we will do that, and you will see that in the October budget. Our second supplementary, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Why is the government creating certain for women escaping family, domestic and sexual violence by not honouring funding commitments? Funding was allocated in the budget for the Zara Foundation for a national expansion of their successful confidential financial counselling support to victims for survivors of FDSV. Why is the government now proposing to review the budget funding provided for this crit critical support? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. Well, I completely reject uh, the allegation that's implicit in the question, uh, completely and totally. We are going through a process where we are assessing all um, financial expenditure uh, against, uh, through our ERC process. Again, that is good government and good governance, and we are being responsible with the nation's finances. If that means going through a process to assess and, and determine what should go ahead and what shouldn't, then we are doing that. Uh, but we will be delivering on our election commitments and on our election policy in full. We will do what we said we would do. The Prime Minister has made that clear. Uh, Minister Gallagher, please finish. resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Uh, on, Order. Senator Rustin. Uh, on a point of relevance um, in relation to honouring of, uh, of election commitments, I mean, if the government is intending to honour its election commitments, why is it reviewing them? I'm not quite sure that's a point of order, Senator Rustin. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. We're not uh, reviewing the merits of our policy commitments. We are going through an ERC process as we go through for the budget. I mean, that is how responsible governments that want to manage the budget properly conduct order. themselves. That is what we are doing, and we're committed to our order. election commitments. Thank you. Uh, Senator Waters. Yes, thanks very much, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, uh, Senator Minister Gallagher. Um, with inflation and rate rises compounding existing housing and inequality crises, we need real action to address cost of living pressures. The Parliamentary Budget Office says Mr Morrison's Stage 3 tax cuts will cost $224 billion over 10 years. 
whereas building a million affordable social homes over 20 years would be an investment of $128 billion with only a $27.3 billion cost to government. Why are you backing the already wealthy rather than fixing the housing crisis, which is far cheaper? Our Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. Well, uh, we're doing both. Um, we will we will implement our election commitments. And one of those was, and we were asked many times around this, around the stage three tax cuts, uh, was that they have been legislated by the, for the by the previous parliament, and we were not uh, going to change that. That was our policy, and we made that decision probably 18 months before the campaign. And, and as the Prime Minister has said, we will do uh, in government what we said we would do um, during the campaign and in opposition. On the housing crisis, yes, uh, that needs absolute uh, priority attention from uh, government. This is another one of those areas where nine years of neglect and um, refusal to work with states and territories have left us in the position that we are in now, where we will be picking up the mess left by the former government and working constructively with states and territories in, on how to best deal with the crisis in housing, particularly for those at the, who need housing at the affordable end. We also have our Housing Australia Future Fund, which is one of those key commitments that we will roll out um, through the budget process to make sure that the Commonwealth is back at, in the game of housing and housing policy, um, which this, those opposite absolutely neglected and didn't treat with the priority that it should have de dealt with for nine years in government. Well, we didn't have a housing minister for a long time. We didn't have a national housing policy. I don't think we ever had a national housing policy. These are the things that need fixing, but so does that working across the states and territories who have a big stake in the game here to work with the federal government on improving access to housing and opportunities Order. for housing, and we will do that. Senator Waters, first supplementary. Thanks, President. The PBO says fossil fuel subsidies will cost $117 billion over the decade. The PBO also says that cancelling student debt would cost $65 billion. Why are you backing the fossil fuel companies to cook the climate instead of helping young people deal with the cost of living? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I think these are the PBO costings of the Greens policy commitments um, that they took to the election, and we are not implementing the Greens policy commitments. Um, but um, so that's that's the short answer to the question. But the, um, Minister Gallagher, the, please resume your seat. I'm waiting for quiet. Uh, Senator Birmingham and Minister Watt. Minister Gallagher. But um, having said that, uh, President, there is, I don't want to dismiss or trivialise the issue of cost of living on um, everybody at the moment, including young people, um, and particularly for those um, you know, lower income households. There's no doubt that higher inflation and higher than expected inflation, significantly higher than what was in the PFO update before the election, is putting enormous pressure on households, as is the, the rising interest rates that are, are you know, increasing because of this inflationary environment we're in. So government does need to focus on this. We are focusing on it. That's why the policies we took to the election are even more important to implement now. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Waters, second supplementary. Thanks, President. The PBO says that a corporate super profits tax would raise $286 billion over a decade and that adding dental and mental health care into Medicare would cost around a third of that at $100 billion. Why are you backing the big corporates instead of people who can't afford to access the health care they need? Minister Gallagher. Thank you, um, Madam President. Well, um, again, those were Greens' policy commitments taken to the last election. They didn't form part of Labor's policy agenda, uh, and we are not. Uh, we we are absolutely about implementing our policy commitments to put downward pressure on the cost of living, to lower the inflation that's um, ravaging through the community and put downward pressure where we can on you know, people's cost of living. Um, that is fundamentally 
top priority for this government, our policies on childcare, on skills, on the National Reconstruction Fund, on Powering Australia Plan are all designed with that in mind, to deal with some of those supply constraints Senator in the Ford. economy and to put downward pressure on cost of living for Australians. Okay, uh, Senator, uh, Minister Wong. Well, thank you. I'd ask for the questions we placed on notice. Thank you. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, I have some additional information uh, for the Chamber in response to questions I took on notice from Senator Lambie last week relating to uh, family and domestic violence leave. Uh, I did write to Senator Lambie providing those answers at the end of last week, but I thought I should update the Chamber as well. Uh, the, the Albanese Labor government believes that workers experiencing family and domestic violence should never have to choose between their safety and their wages. Our bill to Parliament delivers a paid family and domestic violence leave entitlement to over 11 million employees in Australia, including casuals. This is a necessary and fair entitlement in line with Fair Work uh, Commission recommendations. This entitlement applies to all national system employees, and I table my response to Senator Lambie. Okay. Or seek leave to table? Table? Sure. Table. Apparently ministers can do that, eh? Hey? How about that? Thanks, Fully. <laughs> Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Rennick. Uh, I rise to take note of questions from Senator Hume and Senator Hughes. Senator Rennick. Okay. Uh, well, this is an interesting uh, situation we find ourselves in today, dealing with the cost of living uh, and real wages. It's interesting to note that at the end of the Howard government, uh, wages were increasing by 4.4 per cent a year, uh, and by the end of the Rudd-Gillard government, they were down to 2.7 per cent a year. Now, arguably, we dropped a little bit to 2.4 per cent, but it was nowhere near the same level of drop as what happened in the Rudd-Gillard era. However, I would like to note, however, that in the last nine years, uh, we have been racked by a, uh, a Senate that wouldn't pass bills. We've had a, a bureaucracy that works against us every time we get the chance. And of course, we had to get through COVID, uh, which was, of course, a very difficult time. Uh, and of course, it didn't help when the RBA uh, printed $300 billion and effectively fed that into the economy uh, without any real investment uh, in infrastructure. Uh, and you know, it's interesting to note the difference between 2019, 2020, and 2009. You know, when swine flu broke out in 2009, you know, the coalition opposition of the day didn't go and call for an immediate shutdown of the economy uh, like Labor did uh, when COVID broke out. Uh, and that's really, really important. Interestingly enough, it was well known that Nicola Roxon actually told the bureaucrats that we can't shut down, don't be silly. But yet again, we were forced to shut down and then the RBA went ahead. Uh, and of course, it's independent statutory authority. For some reason, people seem to think that we should outsource one of the most important economic levers uh, to unelected uh, officials. Um, but they went ahead and printed $300 billion and thought they'd go and uh, throw it out to the banks and then lower interest rates to 0.1 per cent. Um, and it's going to take a lot of uh, winding back to uh, deal with the inflation that those reckless actions by the RBA, um, by the RBA ha has undertaken. And uh, unfortunately, they've raised those interest rates. So good luck trying to raise real wages when you've got inflation running at over 6 per cent uh, to the Labor Party. So it's not something I'd be getting too self-righteous about uh, right here and right now. But the other thing we need to talk about is Labor's promise of reducing energy bills by $275. Now, you know, this is where the roosters or the chickens have really come home to roost because we've been pursuing, you know, uh, the, the, the woke brigade have been pursuing a renewables at all cost, or what I like to call unreliables at all cost, um, and it is at all cost, I might add. Uh, and you know, billions and tens of billions of dollars have actually been sunk into the energy sector, and for what? What we've got is less reliability and higher power prices. And that's not surprising if you're going to go recklessly throw science under the bus, engage in junk science, junk science, because does anyone know heat's kinetic energy, the energy of motion, the idea that it gets tracked uh, is a complete oxymoron. If you only step outside and look at a hot air balloon when they turn up the gas, the hot air rises into outer space there, you know, negative 270 degrees. It's called the second it's called the entropy of a system always increases, the second law of thermodynamics. Anyone with a basic understanding of year 12 physics would know that. Uh, but anyway, I digress. So we need to go back to why energy 
prices are increasing. And it's very simple because in the old days you had a coal-powered fire station somewhere like Cogan Creek, which is 400 million tonnes of coal sitting underneath it or near around it, and you basically dig it up, you put it into the coal-powered fire station, and it goes straight through the uh, uh, transmission lines, including the southern uh, interconnected to the southern states, um, and straight away it's into your, ha into your houses uh, or to the factories where we desperately need cheap, reliable energy. But no, 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 not with unreliables. Look, unreliables, what we've got to get is we've got to wait for the sun to shine and the wind to blow, um, and we've got to put all these different uh, stranded power stations around the country. And in order to join these power stations up, we've got to add transmission lines. Now, this, uh, the, the government opposite us, they want to uh, spend $20 billion on building transmission lines to connect all these new unreliable uh, power stations up. So, you know, that is a cost that isn't going to exist. Uh, if you never relied on unreliables in the first place. But it doesn't stop right there, because then you've got to build all these batteries to store the power for when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing. Now, this stuff costs a lot, a lot of money. Lithium, for example, is a 1 per cent ore body. You've got to mine 100 tonnes of ore to get one tonne of metal, and then you're going to have to duck it through hundreds and thousands of litres of sulfuric acid. Heavens forbid if that ever leaches into the ground, water. Uh, and gets out to our Great Barrier Reef. I know the Greens were always talking about they love the Great Barrier Reef. Well, I can tell you what, when we've got sulfuric acid going everywhere from the creation of these lithium batteries, we're going to have more problems there. Uh, and then we've got the whole uh, problem of uh, stability. So we've got inertia control. All those things are going to add to the cost. And that's why power prices are going up. Uh, not to mention, of course, there's a slight problem in Russia and Ukraine, but I'll just leave that to one side for the moment. But let me tell you this: is that Labor will never reduce power prices unless they Senator back coal in this country. Time has expired, Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Well, it's always remarkable when the opp opposition want to come into this chamber. They ask questions about wage growth. Wage growth. This is a government. Well, this is an opposition that, whether it was under Abbott or Turnbull, or in fact Morrison did nothing to support working Australians. They did nothing to support an increase in the minimum wage. They had, they had 10 years almost to do something for Australian workers, and they failed at every single obstacle. Now, we have inherited a huge debt. We've also inherited a situation where this uh, opposition, when they were in government, had no real plan for jobs. They had no plan at all when it came to reducing the cost of living. And all of a sudden, in the short period of time they've been in opposition, they want to come in here and lecture us about what we uh, should be doing and what we haven't done in what less than 12 weeks. I mean, realistically, I know you've learnt nothing at all from the election defeat, and I know it will take you some time to get used to being in opposition, but we went to the election with a plan a plan to grow jobs in this country, to increase wages for working Australians. We know and we understand the challenges that Australian families and Australians uh, are facing when it comes to the cost of living. But to do that, you need to lift productivity, you need to lift wages, and you need to ensure that we have skills and opportunities. That's why we went to the election uh, supporting uh, TAFE and ensuring that we have uh, the best workforce, the most highly skilled workforce uh, going forward, because we've got a plan. That's the difference between us and those opposite. Now, I know it, it's difficult to, to face an election defeat, particularly when you've been in government for so long, but the reality is the Australian people didn't buy your crap anymore. They just didn't believe anything that you took to the election. No one believed a word of what you've been saying for so Senator long Hughes. because you have— Senator Hughes, Senator Polly. Uh, Mr Deputy President, I bet that one hasn't been said wrong before. Um, we've gone the wrong way. I said madam rather than mister. <laughs> Everyone's getting in trouble the other way. Uh, point of order, unparliamentary language uh, was just used, I think, by uh, Senator Polly, and perhaps she'd like to withdraw. The office editor withdraw if, if, if it caused offence. Otherwise, reflect on your language. Uh, I'm more than happy to, to. If I did cause any effect, I didn't think that I did, but sometimes the truth hurts, I guess. But I'd like to continue in relation to uh, the plan that 
our government has. The plan is to increase productivity. It's to support workers, ensure that we have the best trained and skilled workforce. I'd just like to remind those opposite that the care sector in this country, in aged care workers, this government for 10 long years had the opportunity to increase the wage and remuneration and skill base for aged care workers in this country, but did nothing. Nothing at all. In fact, people within the disability sector earn more money than those who are caring for some of the most vulnerable people. Now, I support the disability carers. I support them, but I also support aged care workers, childcare and early childhood educators. Now, we're a new government, but we've taken a plan to the people at the last election. Australians agreed with our agenda that we put forward and supported us. So when it comes to energy prices and the questions again today about whether we're going to keep our election commitment, well, yes, we are, because we know how important it is to the Australian people that a government keeps their election commitments, unlike those when they were in government. But when it comes to energy and renewable energy, well, we know the track record of the previous governments under Turnbull, Abbott and Morrison. They had no policy. They don't even believe in renewable energy. And I come from a state where we have led the nation with renewable energy, with our hydro. And so what we as a government will do is we will invest and we will, as I said from the outset, we will keep to our election commitments. We gave a guarantee that we would do everything we could to reduce power prices because it does have a huge impact on Australian families and businesses. So you can rely on us. So when you want to get up, as I'm sure that the next speaker will try and rewrite history and uh, blame the the current government for all the woes in uh, the community. I think what you will see over the next three years is a government that keeps to, to its commitments, will put Australian people and business ahead of those in opposition. And Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, uh, I too rise to take note of answers to questions today concerning real wage growth, concerning the cost of electricity prices. Uh, and we've heard from Senator Polly that the government has a plan to tackle inflation. <laughs> this reminds plan? me, this plan? reminds me, Senator Hughes, and I suspect that we both watch this show. We're, I won't start commenting on people's age. I'm going to show my age again. And uh, it, it, the West Wing, it was, it was one of my favourite shows, still is, you know, the <laughs> left-wing president of, of the United States who Bombs, bombs other countries, uh, and and Josh Lyman is called up to the press secretary uh, one day, takes over in the in the in the in the press room of the White House, and he's forced by the media to to admit they have a secret plan to fight inflation, and that's what this government is channeling Josh Lyman. They must have a secret plan plan to fight inflation because. They're certainly not telling the Australian people what the plan is. They're certainly not telling the Australian people what the plan is. So the Australian people can come to two conclusions. They can come to two conclusions. They can either conclude that the Labor government has a secret plan to fight inflation, or they could conclude that the Labor government has no plan to fight inflation. Because the left hand is not talking to the right hand, or should I say, the left wing is not talking to the right wing of the Labor Party. Because on the one hand, they're promoting wages growth, which obviously will have an impact on inflation. Senator Wong knows that wages growth and inflation are linked. Without productivity increases, wages growth will fuel inflation. Simple as that. And without uh, downward pressure on energy prices, which there is no sign of under the current government's policy settings, without downward pressure on energy prices, you're going to see flow-on impacts through the economy, further inflationary pressures on the economy. And it's important that the Australian people recognise the fact that we do need a government that takes a fiscally responsible approach to the current economic circumstances. The former government—we are now in opposition, we understand that—but the former government made it very clear 
of the economic headwinds that were, Australia was facing in the years ahead. They are significant economic headwinds, and it's important that the settings that the government adopts in the upcoming budget are, are appropriate for the time, and that includes tackling the scourge of inflation. Now, I am also old enough to, sadly, I was a young child, but remember the periods in, in, in Australia's history where inflation was absolutely out of control. Uh, and I can remember the impact on uh, my family's farming business uh, during the 1970s when inflation did get out of control and we had a wage and inflation spiral that caused untold pain, untold pain to the workers of Australia, to working families, to the businesses of Australia. Uh, on our family farm, uh, under, under um, then Treasurer Keating, uh, the, the, mortgage, the overdraft uh, that our family's farming business operated on reached 22 per cent. 22 per cent. Now, many, you know, the generation of young people in today's economy, uh, those, those who have, have only lived under Liberal governments um, in their adult life, have seen extraordinarily low uh, interest rates for a long period of time. And we have now seen significant increases in a very short period of time. And so there is a challenge to this government. There is a challenge in the upcoming budget to show that they actually understand the economy, that they haven't bought into the modern monetary theory view of the world, where constant spending and constant borrowing is the way in which you actually fix this problem. We need to have a set of policies that are appropriate for the times. And in doing that, I can absolutely guarantee that this opposition will be looking at that budget with an absolute magnifying glass to ensure that the settings that he put in place, put in place are appropriate for the times, that we actually do tackle the serious problems that are facing the Australian economies, the cost of living pressures on Australian families, the impact of inflation on Australian businesses. And that is the test for this government, and it is a test that they will be found wanting in. Senator Sheldon. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Congratulations on your election as well, Mr. Pre uh, Deputy President. Well, Senator Hume, on question one, must have a very short memory regards wages. In nine years of the Liberal government, were the worst period of wage growth in Australia's history. We saw middle class people in this country wages decline under the previous government. And it was no accident because the former minister, Cormann, said, and I quote, low wages growth is a deliberate feature of our economic architecture. Well, when the Liberals left office, real wages were actually lower than they were when they entered office in 2013. The Labor share of income is it was at an all-time low, while profits were at an all-time high. The McKell Institute has found that an average worker would be earning $307 more per week if the wage growth achieved under Labor between 2007-2013 had been sustained through 2014-21. That's almost an extra $16,000 per year in the pockets of Aussie workers. Well, we also know what the cause of low wage growth has been over those nine years. We know that the government's policy was to drive wages down because that was part of their architecture. A tax on trade unions, on raising on right and percent less in their industry and it's rife through many industries. But the Liberals, of course, response to that is it was a made-up issue. Even the Minerals Council are admitting that people were getting ripped off. But it was a made-up issue. No wonder we have a wages problem and had a wages problem in this country for nine long years. Take gig workers, paid just six dollars an hour. Former Senator Stoker said that's what they signed up for. 
That was her response. And of course, I remember the former minister, Minister Porter, saying it was too complicated to turn around and give the minimum wage to those gig workers. And talk about then, of course, we then moved to the ABCC, which in six years had received $200 million in funding but only recovered $5 million for workers. Six years, only $5 million in an industry that's rife with wage theft, wage exploitation. And of course, if you then look at what happened with the CFMEU in that particular time, in the last six months, the construction workers in the second half of 2021, the CFMEU got $17 million. $5 million for six years, $17 million, and you can see why they're anti-union for six months. That's what real take-home pay that was being affected by this government under this government's previous government's watch. Now take their approach to migrant workers who were ripped off and exploited with full immunity under the, real, the previous government. As we heard in the Job Security Committee inquiry, Pacific workers earning just three dollars an hour living in crowded rooms with 10 other people on a farm, in one case, run by the former Liberal minister, Richard Alston. Surprise, surprise, surprise. It is just fundamentally in their DNA. They don't want to see workers getting a decent wage. They don't mind them seeing people getting as low as $6 an hour. They don't mind turning around and saying, spending $200 million whilst getting no recompense, uh, a measly recompense for an industry that's been ripping people off in the particular in the construction industry. And of course, they sat by when they said that's part of their architecture, to make sure that wages are kept low, kept low, and people are exploited in such a way. But then let's look at the you know, Liberals. You know, will they change? Well, Liberals thought it was a bright idea to campaign against the lowest paid workers in Australia getting a one dollar an hour pay rise. They campaigned against it. And they have the hide to come in here and say, what are you doing about wage increases? Well, I'll tell you what, we'll always do more than you and we'll deliver what we've said we're prepared to do. Now, you might think the Liberals would have learned from the election that their low wage agenda is deeply unpopular with Australian workers. But there you are again. They're defending the ABCC, an agency that exists to keep wages down, safety conditions low in the building industry. They continue to attack the trade unions. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, it's pretty telling, really, that it's the Labor Party who constantly sought to undermine the economy whilst in opposition at every opportunity, but now realise there's a lot of things out of their control, a lot of things that impact what happens in our economy occur globally, but that government is hard and that you actually have to be the ones to make decisions, to put in place policies. Now, on this side of the House, we don't ignore that there are global challenges, but what we're seeing from this new government is that with every decision they make, they make a bad situation worse. Senator Gallagher stood in here today after long platitudes through the campaign from everyone who made an appearance, usually to tidy up Mr Albanese's recent gaffe through the campaign, but then to make a promise that they would guarantee that Australians would see real wage growth. We now know that that's not going to be the case, and that is now being acknowledged by the Treasurer himself. They ran smear after smear after smear, and we just heard them continuing against the coalition's record whilst in government, but are now failing to live up to their own promises and guaranteeing Australians a real wage growth. The hypocrisy is unbelievable, but unfortunately not surprising. Now, as I just said, we know on this side of the chamber that not every problem in the economy lays at the feet of the government of either persuasion, not that you would ever give that grace when you were in opposition. But we will hold you accountable for how you respond to these challenges. But the fact of the matter is becoming increasingly clear that you have no plan. You keep reciting a plan, which is apparently a plan for a plan, but that does nothing to instil confidence in the Australian people that you will be there to support them and alleviate these current cost of living pressures that they're experiencing. 
And today we saw Senator Gallagher also walking away from Labor's promise to, pre to reduce power bills by $275. Now, I will acknowledge that Senator Gallagher is the first Labor minister who's perhaps moved off the talking points that did offer a guarantee to lower power prices, but actually articulating a figure seems to be beyond the scope of this new government. We've seen Senator Watt can't say a number, and Senator Gallagher here today could not mention the $275 reduction that was promised to all Australian households by the end of 2025. She talked about being honest with the Australian people, but danced her way around guaranteeing the exact figure. But again, the important thing here to note is for all of talk, Labor's talk on easing the cost of living crisis during the election campaign, they don't have a plan to make this a reality. They don't understand how to address inflationary pressures. And I just note Senator Brockman's contribution of perhaps like the West Wing and they're taking their lead from Josh Lyman, that they've got a secret plan to flight inflation. Unfortunately, though, looking at those opposite and their performance over the last week and a half in this place, uh, that they may actually be trying to emulate Veep more than the West Wing. Uh, but uh, well, I'm sure there's a couple over there with the House of Cards rhetoric ready to go. There's a little, someone who fancies themselves a Frank Underwood, but uh, at the moment I think we're just seeing Veep being played out in each act. At least if they were following the West Wing episode by episode, we'd know what was coming next. Uh, and uh, we do know that some of them have a penchant, we might say, for plagiarising of speeches. So we should probably run a few of them via some of those checks to see how many West Wing lines they pull out as they make their presentations. But this is part of a broader pattern here. The Labor Party complained that the previous government, that we weren't doing enough, Things weren't happening, and they arrive in government with absolutely no plan to address any of the issues that they're facing. They complained about debt and then proposed to add more debt than the coalition. They said real wage growth wasn't good enough under the coalition. Now they refuse to guarantee Australians will see wage growth under their government and have acknowledged that is highly unlikely. They've also said that we refuse to, re to address the cost of living crisis and have now broken their promise to reduce power bills by $275 for families and business. So, given Senator Gallagher's answers today, I can assume that there's a lot of Australians out there, a lot of small businesses, are starting to have a look around and that buyer's remorse might be starting to creep in. They might be seeing they've been sold a pup because it's clear Labor has no feasible plan, drive up wages, reduce power bills as they promised they would. Senator Hughes, thank you. I'll put the motion as moved by Senator Rennick. Those the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. Do I have someone? Senator Cox. Uh, I move the, that the Senate take note of Senator Wong's response to Senator Thorpe's question. Thank you. Senator Cox. You have um, my colleague Senator Thorpe asked a very, very simple question about how Labor proposed uh, the voice to parliament, which will impact on First Nations sovereignty. Unfortunately, Minister Wong refused to answer this question straight, in a straightforward way. And instead, Minister Wong said that the government are taking a pragmatic approach to what, uh, when it comes to the voice to parliament. Now, we as First Nations people of this country um, cannot risk our sovereignty because the government thinks it's pragmatic. That is completely unreasonable. And sovereignty is the underpinning principle that we can afford and should not afford to um, make history making changes through truth treaty voice when we are talking about the constitution. When we talk about sovereignty, we're talking about the relationship of being a sovereign First Nations people. And that is linked to our, our connection to our water, our skies, our totems, and all of our systems, our kinship, our law, our language, our culture. It is all embedded in that. First Nations sovereignty is not about, um, <clears throat> is about putting First Nations people in the driver's seat when it comes to making decisions about our community, and it's not about selling that out. Our culture, our country and our sovereignty are important and should be the primary aspect of what drives all of this change. Mm -hmm. It's about being part and being in charge of our own destiny because that is, in fact, what truly represents self-determination. 
First Nations people have an inherent right to protect our lands, our waters and our skies, as well as our totem, because we can't survive without these things. We care for country and it will care for us. We cannot survive without that, and it's an assertion of our rights to our lands that all First Nations people have. And this is what led to the Mabo decision. It reasserted that this land was never terra nullius. And I've got a quote here from Bunjalung Wurma saltwater woman Phoebe McIlwraith, who writes that my sovereignty predicates the creation of the English language, and it does not come from the crown or the throne, but from the sea and the soil. No parliamentary oath could ever take that away from me. And this is in fact true, and we saw this being enacted just right here in the chamber this morning by Senator Thorpe. There's another quote from Aileen Roberts, Robertson, Morton Robinson, sorry, a Gulpa woman, who says their sovereignty is incommensurable <clears throat> to ours. They cannot see nor understand our sovereignty and therefore can never recognise it. These are all true parts. And unfortunately, the incoming government don't understand that and have not been able to articulate that and certainly didn't answer the question today um, on behalf of the, uh, the Minister for Indigenous Affairs. And author Amy Maguire, a Durrambul woman, South Sea Islander woman, notes the extent in which First Nation dissenters feel that there is a great cloak that has been put over sovereignty and treaty, which has been now it's almost rendered invisible in the ways of what people are calling the positive coverage of what was the Labor's first attempt, the recognised campaign, and now constitutional recognition. Amy Maguire also suggests that despite efforts to repress these views, there's still no calls for a treaty or sovereignty, and they are not white noise. I also want to touch on the second question Senator Thorpe asked today about how the government's proposed proposal honours the principles of free prior informed consent. Well, of course, Senator Wong thought that we needed consent to actually make sure we were moving forward with the Uluru Statement, and that's in fact not what it means. Informed, free prior informed consent actually has to be at the heart of decision making. It's at the heart of everything that impacts on First Nations people and their issues. So how can we pretend that these First Nations, um, giving First Nations people a voice, that they aren't even deciding the voice to parliament themselves is about self-determination. In the current proposal, the colonising parliament would have the powers to decide on the vote's composition, functions, procedures, and it's definitely not self-determination, nor is it free prior informed consent. When it comes to treaty, Minister Burney has said that the truth and treaty processes can be un undertaken simultaneously to the voice and that truth and treaty will take time and they need to be started now. So it's time for the federal government to show some leadership and back the Makarata uh, Commission and put it back on the federal agenda. We need to see a clearer commitment on all the elements of the Uluru Statement, and Thank I urge the government Cox. to— I'll move the, mo the motion. <clears throat> um, I'll put the motion moved by Senator Cox. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Uh, I, I, my, I'll, catch, I'll come to you in a minute. I, uh, Han, Senator Han, Hanson Young. Hanson Young, sorry, Thank I just got. Uh, no, that's fine. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President, and congratulations on your appointment. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999 for the related purposes. It will be called the Environment Protection Biodiversity Conservation Amendment Climate Trigger Bill and I look forward to debating it in this place very soon. Yeah. Senator Roberts. So, uh, um, Mr. Deputy President, I'd like to see some clarification because my understanding is that I'm on the roster to speak to uh, motions to take note. Uh, I don't have a roster. I don't have a whipping a whipping sheet that indicated that you were going to speak. I had a message I, on the MPI. We're not. We're not. No, 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 no. Not the MPI. M uh, motions to take note of answers from question time. Time has expired for that. Uh, I wasn't aware that you were intending to speak, so I'll, I'll consult with the whips Thank you. at another time. Are there any other notices of motion to be given? I shall now proceed to the placing of business. 
Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Ah, Senator Kirk. Um, I seek leave to move motion relating to leave of absence for Senator Ayres. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Ayres from the 1st to the 4th of August 2022 on account of parliamentary business. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against aye. no. The ayes have it. Um, I also uh, seek leave to move a motion relating to the presentation of reports from legislation committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the time for the presentation of reports from legislation committees on annual reports tabled by the 31st of October 2021 be extended to Friday the 12th of August 2022. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Senator Askew. Thank you. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senator Cavan Canavan for 1 to 3 of August for personal reasons and Senator Little for 1 to 4 of August for the personal reasons. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Clark. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. Uh, business of the Senate notice of motion number one in standing in the name of Senator Faruqi, postponed to the 4th of August 2022. And general business notice of motion number 10, standing in the name of Senator MacDonald, postponed to the next day of sitting. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions? I understand that they have now been postponed and we will move to the MPI. Clark. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 34 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Payne proposing a matter of public importance was chosen. It is shown at item 14 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? I note Four senators are standing. A uh, five. Uh, sorry, Senator Scar, you were behind Senator Dunningham. I understand that the informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask, ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. And can I thank uh, my good, good friend, Senator Payne, who I've known a long, long time, uh, for proposing this MPI. And the need for the government—this is what the matter of public importance is—the need for the government to adopt a plan to ease pressure on cost of living for Australian families and small businesses now, not in October but to actually address the issue now, because we know, Mr Deputy President, that Australians are facing those cost of living pressures today. And we know that because the economic statement released last week and also the most recent inflation figures. Australia now has, for the year ending 30 June 2020, 2022, an annual inflation rate CPI of 6.1%. This is the largest CPI rate since uh, Australia, the Australian government introduced the uh, goods and services tax, 6.1 per cent. And even if you take out, even if you take out some of the outliers in terms of the inflationary pressures and trim it down, the trimmed mean inflation, the trim mean inflation rate is at 4.9 per cent. So even if you take down the, the factors which are pulling that inflation rate up to 6.1 per cent and maybe on the other side pulling it down, so you take the trim mean inflation rate, it's at 4.9 per cent. 4.9 per cent. And that's the highest, that's the highest level 
since that particular measurement was actually used uh, from 2003. So the highest level, the highest level in nearly 20 years. And the forecasts are even more grim. The forecasts are even more grim. By the end of the year, by the end of the year, Treasury forecast is that Australia will be facing an inflation rate of 7.75 per cent. 7.75 per cent. That's the forecast for the end of the year. So Australia is crying out, is crying out for a government that actually has a positive plan that will actually counter these inflationary pressures. And we simply do not have it. We simply don't have it, Mr Deputy President. In fact, we have the contrary. We have the contrary. Just, just at a point in time when Australia is facing these inflationary cost pressures, what is the obsession of those opposite? The obsession of those opposite is with the Australian Building and Construction Commission abolishing the powers, gutting the powers of the ABCC, and then ultimately seeking to, when they take the time to actually present legislation to this place, to abolish the Australian Building and Construction Commission. And that will actually feed in. That will actually feed into inflation. And you don't need to believe me for that. You don't need to believe me. You can look at an independent report that was put out by Ernst & Young, because the ABCC is the cop on the beat at our construction sites around Australia. They're the cop on the beat at our construction sites around Australia. And the work they do is incredibly important in terms of keeping those construction costs down for our schools, for our roads, for our hospitals, for our important social infrastructure. And the result, the result of abolishing the ABCC will be to increase those construction costs. And I quote from a study released by Ernst & Young in relation to their economy-wide modelling in relation to the impact of abolishing the ABCC. And I quote, key economic costs indicated by the modelling involve output in the construction industry could fall by around $35.4 billion by 2030, as higher cost inflation makes fewer projects possible and capital is reallocated to other economic activities. Why would you introduce that sort of policy in a high inflation environment? What is the sense of it? What is the sense of it, apart from providing a SOP to the CFMEU? There's no sense to it in this environment. It's entirely the wrong thing to do if you want to take those cost pressures off the Australian economy. Ernst & Young says, overall economic activity as a result of Labor's policy could decline by $47.5 billion by 2030. $47.5 billion as higher costs and lower productivity act as a handbrake on other sectors. So those costs that will increase through the construction industry as a result of the Labor government's policy to abolish the ABCC, they are going to infect all sorts of sectors across the whole of the Australian economy. And it goes on. It goes on. If the ABCC were abolished, and that is what the Australian government's, the current government's, Albanese's government's intention is, this could lead to a total economic loss of around $47.5 billion compared to baseline estimates to 2030. Employment and labour cost impacts. Ernst & Young go on. The construction industry is one of the largest employers in Australia, employing almost 1.15 million people. The industry also directly supports jobs in other Australian industries, such as timber, steel and cement manufacturing. Modelling suggests that abolishing the ABCC could cost, again cost, the Australian economy up to 4,000 jobs. Job losses are felt immediately as output in the construction industry falls and labour costs rise. And then there's the fiscal cost. There's the fiscal cost. When every school, every hospital, every road project is going to cost 30 per cent, estimated 30 per cent more because of the lawless behaviour of the construction division of the CFMEU, whose representatives sit around the Labor Party's national executive. And as a result of those costs. Point of order. I know that the, um, the MPI specifically talks about electricity prices. I haven't heard one mention of any electricity. I've heard a beat up on unions, I've heard a beat up on the CFMEU, I've heard him talk about the ABCC, but there has not been one mention. to what the MPI is actually based on and ask him to point his remarks to that point. 
to the sky? Uh, to make a submission? Uh, uh, well, I'm happy to talk about electricity costs. Absolutely happy to talk about electricity costs. I didn't see, Mr. Deputy President, the $275 supposed supposed saving, which is going to flow through, which is going to flow through to electricity users across Australia, that was promised by the Labor Party during the campaign. I saw absolutely no mention of that when the Governor General attended this place and actually gave and actually gave his presentation in relation to the Labor Party's agenda in government. Uh, there was not. Guy, you, you've moved on from the point of order, have you? Yeah. I can return to your speech. Thank you. I'll, I'll just clarify. I saw. We've, we've moved. The, the caravan moves on. Uh, I saw absolutely no mention. Absolutely no mention of electricity price savings for the Australian consumer when the Governor General attended in this place last week for the opening of this parliament and effectively laid down the government's agenda. Absolutely no reference to that $275 electricity price saving. And I will be happy, I will be happy, Senator Urquhart, to come back to that $275 supposed saving that those opposite are going to deliver to Australian electricity users every week this parliament sits between now and the next federal election, because I do not believe that you will deliver that cost saving in this inflationary environment. I don't believe you're going to deliver that cost saving at all. And it'll be fascinating to see. It'll be fascinating to see how the construction costs, which are going to blow out as a result of your policy with abolishing the ABCC, it's going to be very interesting to see how those construction costs, additional construction costs for every single transmission tower that is built in this country, every single transmission tower built in this country will cost more approximately 30 per cent more as a result of your abolishing abolition of the ABCC. That's what's going to happen to electricity costs. That's what's going to happen because those construction costs feed into every single cost across the whole of the Australian economy, including, including electricity prices. Because you've got to get the electricity from point A to point B. So when you construct your solar panel farm, your wind farm, whatever it is in terms of renewables, you've got to construct the transmission lines. And that's where the construction costs are extraordinarily relevant. And I do not believe, I'll be happy to be corrected at the time, but I do not believe that those opposite will deliver that $275 saving in terms of electricity costs. And we will wait and see. And those including those in the gallery who will be receiving their electricity bills between now and the next election, they can be the judge. They can be the judge. And they should ask themselves before the next election whether or not their electricity prices have actually decreased, have actually decreased by $275. And we'll actually see what happens. And those electricity costs, those electricity costs are affecting every single part of Australian society, not just the retail consumer but also the business consumer. And it also includes small businesses where I have my patch in Queensland. I was speaking to a small business just this week about cost pressures on their small business. And Nick runs a cafe and he's being hit with the cost increases in terms of electricity, in terms of wages, but also but also in terms of rent, small business rent increases, which are which are going to go up, which are going to go up as a direct result of the inflationary impact which is provided for under his lease. And that's what we're facing in this country. That's what we're facing. We're facing increased costs across the board. And in that environment, it is simply not credible, given the government's own plans, that electricity prices will fall by $275. In fact, all the evidence, I believe, will be to the contrary, especially when you consider, especially when you consider the cost of transmission and actually getting, providing stability to the electricity grid and getting the renewable energy sources fed into the grid. And that, that $275, Senator Urquhart was keen for me to mention it, and I'm happy to, that $275 guarantee, that promise, I suggest, I suggest that it will haunt those sitting opposite between this day up to the next federal election. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, talk about leading with your chin. This is a really quite extraordinary choice of uh, a matter of public importance for the opposition to propose, isn't it? 
because if we think about their record for just the tiniest of moments, and I'm surprised that somebody on their side didn't do that before they submitted this as a, as a topic for discussion, this would be your conclusion. If you were trying, if you set out deliberately to design a scheme to undermine Australia's electricity and energy sectors, you couldn't do it better than what the Liberal National Government did during their time in office. They basically had a three-part recipe for higher electricity prices. First, announce plan after plan after plan after plan, 22 of them, but never implement any of them so that industry has absolutely no idea what is going on and has no real way to plan for the future. And consequently, critical investments are not delivered. Second, stymie, obstruct, disable consideration of climate change by the public service and key regulators, banning the use of the term climate change in key organisations so that Australia's policy development can't properly respond to what every other G20 country has basically accepted to be the key factor driving energy uh, market issues over the long term. And third, and this is the killer, mismanage every energy project that has the misfortune to cross your path, like Snowy Hydro 2.2, which by the time they left office was running 18 months late. The member for Hume's signature project, running 18 months late, not confessed, hidden during the election period. The coalition promised a billion dollars billion dollars, which they claimed was going to support 3,800 megawatts of new generation over three years ago. Can anyone tell me how much of that actually was delivered? The answer for those playing along at home is none. Absolutely no dollars delivered at all in relation to that promise and not one kilowatt of power. Under the previous government, Four gigawatts of capacity left the system. One gigawatt was created. It is a record of failure, crippling failure. And if the coalition had any self-awareness whatsoever, any situational awareness, they would never talk about energy prices again, let alone put an MPI like this up for debate. Instead, what have they done? They've put forward the man behind this debacle. Mr Taylor, as their putative alternative treasurer. This guy who ran the Australian electricity system into the ground is now being proposed as someone who ought to run the economy. The shamelessness is actually quite incredible. Fresh out of office, the coalition are looking back on the damage caused by their last nine years with wide eyes and a faux innocence. Saying the equivalent of who me? Australians know that the coalition significantly diminished Australia's capacity to respond to changes in the energy market. Changes like the ones we've seen over the past few months as a result of international developments. We have been left vulnerable and more exposed to high global gas and coal prices. The miracle is the very many good people and good institutions that survived this campaign of destruction by the former government. But it is households and businesses who have been left to pay the price. Now, our government is doing what we can to clean up the mess that we have inherited from the coalition. And there isn't a quick fix. There are nine years of chaos nine years of inaction to undo, and the problems run deep. And it's not just electricity, it's the broader energy market. Today, the ACCC report that was released confirms what many Australians already know, that they're paying the price for the crisis in the market that's been left by a decade of division and chaos. We are working to resolve these issues. AEMO released a notice of threat to system security, and they're working with the market. Over the medium term, our government is progressing a capacity mechanism with the states and empowering AMO to buy and store gas supplies. And I welcome the announcement from the Minister for Resources that the government will extend and improve the Australian domestic gas security me mechanism. There is work to do 
across the entire energy system, from generation to distribution. Minister Bowen and the government have helped navigate this tailor-made energy crisis without any load shedding, without any blackouts, getting agreement among state and territory ministers on a way forward for firm for renewables. But a key part in our work going forward is to take a part and to resolve the uncertainty, the mismanagement and the blindness to climate change that has weakened Australia's energy system during the previous term of government. We're not wasting any time. We have already notified the United Nations of our intention to increase our emissions reduction target. And as we've made clear, 43 per cent reduction by 2030 is the minimum that we'd hope to achieve. As we said in the documentation, our aspiration is that the commitments of our industry, states and territories and the Australian people will yield even greater emissions reductions in the coming decade. We scrapped Mr Taylor's dodgy regulation that directed the Renewables Agency to fund fossil fuels, and we've also improved its ability to fund electrification and energy efficiency. We've got moving on the review of the integrity of the carbon offset system, including by appointing Professor Ian Chubb and an esteemed panel to lead that work. We've signed a net zero technology partnership with the United States, which focuses on storage, green hydrogen and integrating various renewables into the grid. We've brought forward well overdue changes to fuel quality standards from 2027 to 2024. There is so much more to do. It's an ongoing project, but we are determined to show leadership where our predecessors showed none. And we stand by our election commitments, and our climate change and energy commitments are no exception. Our plan will create hundreds of thousands of jobs, with five out of six of those to be created in the regions. It will generate $76 billion in investment, and it includes modernising Australia's electricity grid through a $20 billion rewiring the nation plan. It includes up to $3 billion to invest in renewables, metals, renewable energy component manufacturing and renewable hydrogen electrolysers. It includes 85 solar banks and 400 community batteries across Australia and 10,000 new energy apprenticeships. Most importantly, it will deliver an 82 per cent renewable energy uh, by 2030. That is the modelled outcome of our policies, and it is consistent with AEMO's step change scenario. This will help drive down prices. It will put downward pressure on prices for this very simple reason, a reason denied by the opposition. We know that renewables are the cheapest form of energy and getting cheaper. The CSIRO, CSIRO and the AEMO Gen Cost report uh, for 2021-22 confirmed that wind and solar are the cheapest source of electricity generation and storage in Australia. It is worth noting that here in the ACT, which is 100 per cent renewable, power prices have actually fallen. More renewables will mean that we are less exposed to changes in fossil fuel prices, like the high global gas and coal prices that have affected Australian energy markets in recent months. Investing in cheaper forms of generating power, like renewables, means that power prices will be lower than they would otherwise have been. There was an opportunity, of course, when the coalition could have talked about electricity prices, and that opportunity was before the election. But what did they do? They didn't want to have the conversation then, did they? No. In fact, what they did was that they intervened to hide the increase to electricity prices accumulated under their watch and to hide it from the Australian people to conceal it until after the election. The Australian Energy Regulator has been required to release its default market offer on 1 May each year since the price safety net was introduced in July 2019. However, fancy this, what a coincidence, just days before the election was called, Mr Taylor signed a regulation that delayed when that default market offer was made public. And when was the new date? The first business day after the 25th of May, after the election. A fig leaf of a reason to allow more consultation, as if this government, the previous government, ever, ever wanted to consult on anything. In some parts of the country, the price increase was 19 per cent. This is what Minister Taylor wanted to hide. I wonder if he shared it with his colleagues. I wonder if he shared it with some of the senators on the other side, because Senator, this government was addicted to secrets. I'll move to Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. 
As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I support Senator Payne's matter of public importance. Prime Minister Albanese's promise to reduce electricity bills $275 and his promise to reduce Australia's carbon dioxide output 43 per cent are mutually exclusive. High energy prices will reduce energy usage and assist Australia to, re to reach the 43 per cent figure. Lower energy prices will increase energy consumption and that will work against the Albanese government's target. That's why the Albanese government so quickly ran away from, it, from his promise. The Prime Minister never intended to honour the promise, making his actions cynical political expediency. One Nation believes any attempt to implement a 43 per cent carbon dioxide reduction is a policy based on lies and distortions which do not stand up to rigorous scrutiny. Prime Minister Albanese has already signalled across several issues his government will be a government based on virtue signalling, not sensible policy. For senators with no data on their side, the only option is to sell a policy on feelings. Feelings will not keep the lights on, supermarket freezes cold or hospitals open. Feelings will not warm Australia in winter or cool us in summer. Evidence-based policy will. Energy deficits in several areas of Australia have already caused blackouts. The 43 per cent target will cause many more blackouts. Rapidly increasing electricity costs will reduce consumption of electricity and buy the government time, while it asks around for a permanent solution, which is why the government is allowing this to happen. Closing down and sabotaging baseload coal has led to the national electricity racket, oh, sorry, market showing unprecedented average wholesale power prices. The average spot price of $264 per megawatt hour last quarter is more than triple the average spot price of $85 per megawatt hour this time last year. Prime Minister Albanese knew this when he made his promise. Now, clearly economics is not the Prime Minister's strong suit. If the cost of an item is up 300 per cent, the chances of being able to make it cheaper without the government paying for it are zero. Perhaps the Prime Minister can extend his, his employment talk fest to more aspects of government business. Let's see if anyone knows how to use wind and solar to replace baseload coal and save Australia from electricity and energy Armageddon. Because all I'm hearing so far is build more wind and solar. Building more will simply add more capacity when we don't need it during the day, when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing. Solar and wind will need to be paired with some form of battery technology to move that generated electricity from the day when we don't need it to the evening when we do. Coal sitting in, in hoppers ready to generate power on demand is the battery we have used successfully for 120 years. Alternatives to coal are thin on the ground. Battery storage costs are st staggering and unsustainable $1.5 million per megawatt hour. We need around 60,000 megawatt hours of energy in storage to ensure any 24-hour period is not subject to blackouts. Yet batteries need 20 per cent above rated capacity to achieve full charge due to heat loss, which is why they catch fire a lot. This means we need 72,000 megawatt hours of storage at a cost of $108 billion every 12 years, the life of a Tesla II battery, big battery. $9 billion every year. The Snowy 2 big hydro battery, currently under construction, will provide 1,000 megawatt hours daily for 355 days a year at a cost of $5 billion. This means that pumped hydro will cost $300 billion to carry enough power for just one day. And of course, adding electric vehicle charging to the mix means a whole lot more of blackouts and a whole lot more of electricity price increases. Net zero is an unaffordable fairy tale that will destroy our standard of living and destroy our lifestyle. We are one community, we are one nation, and we know what the hell's needed to get back to affordable, reliable, stable electricity. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Australians are hurting. The cost of living is rising through the roof, and we have a government who is refusing to do anything about it. Even worse, we have a government who went who went to the most recent election with a promise to reduce electricity prices by $275 for households by 2025. However, as the, matter for, um, as the MPI points out, after only a matter of weeks, they were walking back on their promise. Prime Minister Albanese said he would take responsibility, but all he seems to be doing is blaming others and making personal attacks. 
the Prime Minister is doing anything but taking responsibility for the energy crisis we are currently facing. And it seems clear from the contributions in the chamber from the other side. This is largely because they have no experience in the energy sector whatsoever. At least I can say I've spent 20 years plus in, in the energy sector, on and off, including two stints at AEMA. So I bring a little bit of knowledge to this matter. The energy crisis is largely due to a number of factors, partly the war in Ukraine and our capacity for coal-fired power generation being at the lowest level in over a decade. However, we are also facing a gas shortage crisis that has the potential to drive power prices through the roof. As the ACCC report that was released today states, the East Coast gas market is facing a 56 petajoule shortfall in supply in 2023, signifying, and I'm quoting this, and signifying a substantial risk to Australia's energy security. Now, for those of you who don't know a petajoule from your pet pet, this is equivalent to about 10 per cent of next year's forecasted demand. And I quote also from the HLC, the effects of these changes are concentrated in the southern states, New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Tasmania and the Australian Capital Territory, where gas resources have been diminishing for some time. The ACCC report specifically states that to address the projected shortfall of gas in 2023, significant additional volumes of gas will need to be produced. Now, I don't see how the government will be able to stick to th their promise of reducing power bills if they do not specifically support the additional production of gas. And it is this lack of support that is hurting Australians already, with the report highlighting that users are now receiving offers at higher prices with less flexibility. Australia is now paying the price of some incredible mistakes by the Andrews Victorian government. That government's ban on onshore gas exploration, as well as fracking and coal seam gas exploration, has exacerbated this problem. We only have this supply problem because the Andrews government cut off supply without a thought of how it was going to be replaced. This is a problem entirely of the Andrews government's making, and now at a time when cost of living is increasing. Australians are paying for that incompetence and the lack of, and the, lack of the Albanese government's willingness to do anything about it. Quick history lesson. Victoria has had a long history of cheap, abundant natural gas, one of the strongest gas industries in the world. The Bass Strait uh, oil wells, the gas and oil wells, powered Victoria, turned it into an industrial powerhouse because we had cheap, available gas. Now, with those Bass Strait oil wells drying up and no replacements because of the bans and moratoriums, we are bringing gas down from Queensland, paying extra and, more, and expending more energy to transport that via the distribution transmission network. Yet what a lot of people on that side and across the, the chamber seem to forget a lot of the gas coming out of Queensland is from coal seam gas, fracked coal seam gas. A little bit of an inconvenient truth there for you, maybe, but it's the actual truth. The only way to drive a disconnect between high global gas prices and our domestic East Coast prices is to invest in more supply, which my home state of Victoria has an abundance of but is not being allowed to access. As published by the International Energy Agency recently, the world has experienced the first global energy crisis in history. Now, the 1970s oil crisis, I don't know how they missed that one, but let's put that to the side. Yes, in a large part, this is because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. However, it highlights what should be a bleedingly obvious point. There are, and always will be, unexpected events and outcomes. If the last three years has taught us anything, it is that we really 
is that we really do not know what the future holds and that we can only be, be prepared for the future by ensuring we are protected against a whole range of scenarios. While they, while they are not responsible for a surge in global prices, this government is responsible for how they respond. Australians expect that this government act to fulfil their promise to the Australian people and lower their power bills. Now, the Labor Party are correct when they state that renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy. On a plant-based level, when the wind is blowing, the sun is shining, and solar, wind and solar is the cheapest form of generation. However, as signed in JP Morgan's 2020 annual energy paper, putting more renewable energy on the grid will not guarantee lower prices. I repeat, will not lower, uh, guarantee lower prices because energy prices rest on an average cost of generation, not the actual cost of sustaining a power source that cannot deliver energy on a continuous basis unsupported. The term we use is firmed. <coughs> Pardon me. The report notes that the costs include transmission, backup thermal power, potentially if it ever comes, utility scale um, battery storage. Now, none of this will come cheap and ultimately costs will be passed on to the consumer. Whatever fills the intermittent power void will initially be expensive and it most definitely won't be easy. Labor's community batteries for a household policy is to fund 400 community batteries of 500 kilowatt hours each, which is supposed to provide power for 250 households. Assuming that the 22 kilowatt hour nightly load it would take over 80,000 batteries to meet the power consumption of Melbourne's 1.8 million households. Even if the 400 proposed batteries were all built in Victoria, they would only meet 0.5 of the city's winter nighttime demand. A 500 kilowatt hour battery could provide sufficient power overnight for only 23 households. This is equivalent to needing one on every street, not in each suburb. Snowy 2.0 has a capacity of 350 million kilowatt hours, the capacity to meet Melbourne's nightly demand for over a week. Labor suggests they can source batteries at $500,000 each which equates to $1,000 per kilowatt hour. Snowy 2.0 costing $4.5 billion for 350 megawatt hours comes out to only $12.90 per kilowatt hour. This $500,000 estimate does not reflect market prices and is unlikely to include costs for installation and maintenance. AEMO's latest integrated system plan released in June states that we're going to have to double electricity by 2050 as we electrify the economy. As coal-fired generation withdraws, and it will and it should, whether dependent generation starts to dominate, investment is needed to treble the firming capacity provided by new low emission firming alternatives that can respond to a dispatch signal with efficient network investments to access it. Right now we're seeing the economic risks of mismanagement playing out before our eyes. Despite Labor, Labor claiming they conducted the most comp comprehensive ever done uh, uh, in opposition, it is clear that their plan cannot work and will not work. Europe serves as a good example. They severely miscalculated by reducing production of fossil fuels faster and is now caught off guard and suffering at the hands of Russia due to their energy reliance. We should not make the same mistake. Senator Grogan. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, I want to thank Senator Payne for this opportunity, for giving this chamber the chance to talk about the Albanese government's comprehensively modelled and thoroughly developed Powering Australia plan. I invite members to have a look at that plan and the modelling rather than throw around baseless um, emotive accusations. I want to thank Senator Payne because I welcome any opportunity to talk about the Labor government's plan to create 604,000 jobs, five out of every six which will be delivered in the region. 
I welcome any opportunity to talk about the $56 billion in investment that will be spurred by this plan. And I welcome any opportunity to outline our plan to deliver 82 per cent renewables by 2030. That means $20 billion to modernise our ageing electricity grid. It means $3 billion to invest in renewable metals and energy component manufacturing. It means 85 new solar banks and it means 400 community batteries across the country. Program. Now we've heard a lot of debate in this chamber um, over the last couple of hours about this. And a lot of the argument that I have heard disconnects a range of the policies and looks at them in isolation. The utilisation of renewable energy requires the upgrade in the grid. So no, to those opposite, the investment in modernising our grid is not a waste. It is not fruitless. It is actually the sensible plan that should have started long ago to make sure that the cheapest power that we can possibly get in this country is delivered in the most efficient way. And that is exactly what an Albanese Labor government is going to do. We have laid out the plans, and that is what we are going to deliver. And that is what will impact those energy prices and the bills that Australians are paying across the country. These are the plans that will make a fundamental difference. Now, I've no doubt that the Chamber and the Australian people would have liked to know a range of things before the election. Obviously, the outcome is that we are in government on this side of the Chamber, but I believe the clarity and honesty should have been there. There were a range of things that were hidden from the public in the lead-up to the election, and the manner in which they, could done, they were done can only be seen as a political stunt to hide information. We know that there were price rises that were well and truly locked in, but the minister decided not to advise the Australian people of that. The minister decided to hide that information, and that information would have told small businesses in New South Wales that their energy prices were about to go up by 19.7 per cent, while at the same time saying that they are the ones looking after business. I don't think that really can be true. And in my own home state of South Australia, domestic household bills were projected to go up by 7.2 per cent. Well, of course they weren't going to tell anyone that. And if you're a Tasmanian, they were going to go up by 11.8 per cent. So it seems quite obvious that that stunt was purely and utterly political. This is information that is released every year at the same time, apart from this year when the previous government hid it. And when we start talking about gas, the former energy minister had promised a gas-led recovery. What we've actually seen is industry and the community left vulnerable as we faced a global gas crisis. We've seen the lack of a clear policy framework stifle investment and prevent cheaper renewables that could have filled that gap as we are facing this crisis. When senators opposite talk about energy security and prices, I think the Australian people know not to take them seriously. They know that they are using this as a political plaything. They knew that their signature energy policy, Snowy 2.0, was running 18 months late. They never mentioned that either. They knew that when the former government proposed $1 billion to support 3,800 megawatts of new generation, that come the election, not one single dollar and not one single kilowatt would have been delivered. The Australian people knew not to trust those opposite to maturely provide policy certainty to the Australian community.
They trusted us. They trusted an Anthony Albanese Labor government. They trusted us because we have got a plan. And as the senator opposite's motion indicates, it is a comprehensively modelled plan, well pointed out. And it is a plan that can be delivered. It's a plan that will ensure that the renewable energy future is very, very bright. We know renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy. This has been proven by CSIRO, AEMO and numerous other sources. It is the cheapest form of energy, and it is the form of energy that we should pursue. I'm proud to be a South Australian and to have seen the significant leadership in our state with a new Labor government in, their, in, in South Australia. And they have shown the renewable sector to be a prominent piece in their plan. The opportunity presented now by the joint work of an Albanese federal government and the Malinowskis state government is so exciting. And we're already, to, we're already starting to see that gap being filled and the hope in our community and in business that the policy malaise is in the past. I know that regional communities see their future in the renewables industry. Investment in solar, wind, grid-scale grid battery technology and, notably for South Australia, hydrogen, means that those regional communities have a pathway to lead us out of the uncertainty that has plagued us for years. The excitement that I see when I travel to towns like Wyala and Port Augusta is palpable. They can see what the opportunities are here. They can see that it's real and they can see that we can deliver on it. The excitement will be underpinned by a very sensible, mature policy approach from the federal and the state government that will actually look at energy that is stable and affordable and will help boost the industry developments that are planned for those regions and in broader regions across Australia. But we know there's no quick fix, and we are taking the short-term and the long-term steps necessary to ensure that we do not again end up where we have been for the last long nine obfuscating years. We've taken the short-term steps necessary to stabilise our gas market. AEMO has taken steps to work with the market, using mechanisms available to ensure gas supply is shifted appropriately between the states to meet demand. The Minister for Resources has announced that the government will improve and extend the Australian domestic gas security mechanism, and as well as progressing a capacity mechanism within the states. Long term, we have embarked on the policy agenda I outlined earlier our Powering Australia policy, one that we are all very, very proud of. It is a policy that means the generations that come after us can be confident that we have a secure energy grid, that we have secure plans that are not going to threaten our environment, a policy that makes sure that families, small business and industry can keep the lights on and keep the manufacturing plants running without breaking the bank. A policy that means jobs, particularly in regional communities, that divine our community's character will flourish into the future. And that is what Labor brought to the election, and that is what the Australian people wanted. So I thank you for the opportunity to stand here and talk about this matter of extreme public importance and talk to you about the Powering Australia plan that will deliver. It will deliver stable, reliable, affordable electricity into the future. Senator Pocock, are you seeking the call? Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This is not my first speech. I rise today to speak about the need to reduce electricity prices. High and ever-rising prices contribute to the significant cost of living pressures that are being felt by people across the country. I would like to talk about the solutions, renewable energy and electrification. These solutions are right in front of us. Across the ACT, households are enjoying the benefits of the clean energy transition. 
While electric electricity prices soar across Australia, they are falling. Yes, falling by more than 5 per cent when you account for inflation here in the ACT. The ACT is the only jurisdiction in which, in which prices are falling, prices that are already cheaper than most places across mainland Australia. Just across the border in New South Wales, households pay as much as $800 more on electricity each year. This saving is just the start, with further and more significant savings to be had as households start to enjoy the benefits of electrification. These benefits are set out in a proposal I put forward for a suburb zero pilot. Under that two-year pilot, participating households would be fully electrified. EVs, rooftop solar, battery storage, storage, all electric appliances and heat pumps. All of these technology exist and are available off the shelf today. Modelling by Rewiring Australia shows that electrification would save participating Canberra households more than $5,000 each year. $5,000 every year. This will put downward pressure on electric prices and deliver real savings for households. And just as household electrification reduces cost of living pressures, it will also put downward pressure on inflation. We have heard a lot about inflation recently on the news and indeed here in this, in this chamber. A clear way to ease inflationary pressures is to reduce the cost of electricity prices, particularly to residential customers. This has been recognised by the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, which commits some $369 billion of investment in clean energy to reduce the inflation caused by reliance on fossil fuels. The economic argument for renewable energy and electrification is clear. Electrifying our households is a capital investment in the future like buying a mortgage or an education. Businesses should be given confidence to invest in renewable energy and electrification should be incentivised for consumer uptake. I am proud to represent a community that has seen the opportunities and been a leader on some of the opportunities the clean energy transition presents, with us, presents us with, but we still have a long way to go. And I want to work with everyone in this place to maximise the benefits for all Australians. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Bragg. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to make some remarks about this matter of public importance. Now, it was a big mistake that the Labor Party decided that it would promise to make a particular saving on people's electricity bills, because, of course, uh, in this country it is the market that is going to be funding the transition. Well, that's what we want to happen, uh, not the government. So, without knowing how much capital the uh, country was going to be able to attract, it was always going to be quite a fraught calculation. Now, of course, the reality is that this whole area of public policy has been a real nightmare for the country over the last 10 years. Uh, there has been too much politics, and that has hurt the country. Now, this is another example where a cheap, glib political attempt uh, is going to unravel and damage the argument, because, of course, the promise that uh, was made by the Labor Party before the last election will not be delivered in this parliament. Uh, it won't be delivered in the, in the short term um, because of the reason I just gave you, that the government has no idea how much private capital the country will be able to attract to fund the transition. Now, anyone who's read the AEMO reports knows that this transition is going to cost an absolute bomb. So um, this is a government that has already broken one promise on this issue. But of course, the promises that it has delivered, it has delivered on behalf of its owners, its parent companies, the union movement and the super funds. It has already delivered on its promise to abolish the ABCC, and it has already delivered on its promise to hide the superannuation funds' donations to the Labor Party and to the union movement. So it is a government for vested interests, delivering for the union movement delivering for the super funds and, of course, breaking promises that they made to Australians. Now, on the matter of emissions reduction, which is a, a, a matter of uh, great national importance, uh, what is important is the outcome. It is the outcome that is important, not the embroidery. And, of course, one of the key outcomes we're seeking here as a country in a race for global capital is capital. 
We want the capital, and so we need to evaluate and make a judgment about what is going to be the best way to get that capital. Now, one of the ways to not get the capital is to engage in cheap, juvenile, uh, glib promises that you break only a few weeks after the election, because, of course, you don't know what's going to happen in global markets. You don't know how the country will get the capital. And so, uh, Mr Bowen, who's the minister who said about the legislation that he introduced last week, uh, I have repeatedly said that we have designed our Powering Australia plan so that it can be implemented whether the legislation passes or not. So um, apparently the legislation is a, is a maybe, is it could be something that's important, maybe not be. Don't know. We don't know yet. We'll see. Um, we'll see how um, how that goes. Uh, but what is very important, and what is most important to me, is that we get the country on the medium to long term plan for having an accelerated emissions reduction. Uh, because the 26 to 28 position uh, is not a credible position. Uh, it needs to be higher than that. Uh, and so what we need to do is to try and find some sort of a accommodation where we are sending the right signal to the rest of the world that we are committed to emissions reduction and we're committed to enhancing our position over the, over the long term. But in the short term, this matter of public importance is about a broken promise. It is about a broken promise to the Australian people uh, that their bills will be cut in the short term, uh, whereas in fact their bills will go up. Now that is very regrettable when you consider that the promises that have been delivered in full for the donors and the owners of the Labor Party at the unions and the super funds have been delivered in full. The Labor Party has already gutted the Your Super, Your Future reforms. The Labor Party has already gutted and abolished in uh, some form the ABCC, and it said that if it can't abolish it in law, it will just defund it. So it will go around the democratic process. So uh, if you are a person in Australia, uh, you are not likely to have your election commitment fulfilled. But if you are a donor or if you are an owner of the Labor Party, if you are a trade union or you're, you're a super fund, you will have your promises delivered in full. Thank you, Senator Bragg. The time for the discussion has expired, and I shall now be proceeding to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page three of today's order of business. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to take note of document number two, the Auditor General's report for 2021, uh, on page three. And I welcome the Australian National Audit Office report on the performance audit into the effectiveness of the management of contract contractors within the Department of Veteran Affairs (DVA). DVA has relied heavily on a non-APS workforce in recent years to manage the growth in demand for its services. Its use of labour hire contractors is reducing, down from 38 per cent at 30 June 2021 to 30 per cent at 30 June 2022. I note the audit found that DVA has established largely fit-for-purpose policies and processes for the management of contractors. I understand the ANAO has made three recommendations relating to how DVA is implementing the protective security policy framework. framework. Recommendation one suggests that policies and practices be updated to better reflect requirements of policy 12 of the um, PSPF eligibility and suitability of personnel. DVA has com committed to updates that ensure all personnel agree to comply with Australian government policies and protocols and all future requests for citizenship waiver are delegated to DVA's Chief Security Officer. Recommendation two relates to governance updates relating to policy 13 of the PSPF ongoing assessment of personnel. DVA has committed to updating policies and procedures to ensure better compliance with annual security checks for clearance holders, and DVA has put, uh, has put um, and is putting in place processes for better compliance with eligibility waivers for security clearances. Recommendation three relates to policy 14 of the PSPF, separating personnel. 
DVA has already updated cessation procedures to ensure de uh, departing staff and contractors acknowledge enduring confidentiality requirements and policy is being updated to ensure adverse security information related to employees and contractors is provided to new Commonwealth employers. DVA will update these policies by the end of September this year, 2022, and report this to its Audit and Risk Committee. I understand the report also identified that DVA has implemented an effective quality assurance program relating to security. I am advised that this is being implemented and monitored and will incorporate the recommendations of the audit. The annual PSPF maturity assessment is also underway and I, uh, we will be reviewing this before it is submitted. I am pleased that the security of veterans and families information has not been exposed to any additional risks through the policy non-compliance identified by ANAO. And we're satisfied that DVA continues to manage the contractor workforce safely and in accordance with Commonwealth requirements, and that veterans, veterans and families are well supported. And I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Is any other senator seeking? Is leave granted? Yep, leave is granted. Do we have any other senators seeking to speak on this document? Okay. Is any senator seeking the call on one of the other documents listed on the notice paper? Okay. Just to confirm, is any senator seeking to speak on any of the other documents? Okay. Um, we'll now move to committee memberships. The President has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. There are two nominations for the one position on the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters and the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade. In accordance with standing orders, ballots will need to be held to determine which of the two senators are to be appointed. Other committee memberships may also require ballots. The ballots will be held later in the week at a time convenient to the Senate. vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. So moved. Is that agreed? Yep. So moved. I will. Sorry, Minister. Assistant Minister. Oh. I will now move to ministerial statements. Are there any ministerial statements? Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I table a document relating to the order for the production of documents concerning the Australian Building and Construction Commission. Do any senators wish to take note of that statement? I wish to take note and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Okay. Is any other senator seeking the call? No? Okay. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of the appointment of members to various joint committees. I call the clerk. Government business orders of the day, number one, aged care and other legislation amendment, Royal Commission Response Bill 2022, resumption of the second reading debate and on the amendment moved by Senator Rustin. Now. Senator Pratt. Quorum isn't present. Please ring the bells for four minutes.
quorum is present, please stop the bells. I call on the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, aged care and other legislation amendment, Royal Commission response bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate and on the amendment moved by Senator Rustin. Senator Payman. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Before I start, please note this is not my first speech. I'm proud to stand here in this place as a member of United Workers' Union, a union which represents incredible, hardworking and professional aged care workers. In my previous role as an organiser, I have heard stories, countless stories, of members witnessing firsthand some of the worst crises facing the care sector today. Aged care workers have been overworked, underpaid and undervalued, like other care industries which are highly diverse and feminised. These sectors were in crisis even before the COVID-19 pandemic, and the last two years have put extraordinary pressure on staff who have been at the forefront of the pandemic, resulting in a worsening of staff shortages and increased pressures on workers and the families who rely on these services, all at a time of record low wage growth. They are struggling to cope. They are suffering from a lack of staff, lack of care time, lack of recognition and respect for their skills and experiences, and to top it, up, and to top it all, poor wages. They are pushed to the limit to cover with extra duties due to staff shortages and skilled staff. I heard Marina Webb cry as she exclaimed, we have no time available to provide residents with social and emotional support. We cut corners and quality, with the quality care they deserve. It's heartbreaking." End quote. Aged care workers find themselves sacrificing their own quality family time as they work two or three jobs during the week and or weekend to ensure they make ends meet and put food on the table for their families. They deserve better. After 48 years as an aged care worker, Jude Clark is tired of the jobs, of, of the jobs cut, hours cut, workloads increased, a high, a high turnover of staff, less care hours and more profits for CEOs. Shame. She believes workers and the elderly are take, that they take care of deserve respect and dignity and time. And I quote, the residents should never be hurried or told to wait because I'm too busy. We as workers deserve more time to say our hellos and our last goodbyes. Sometimes we are the only family that the residents have. Is that too much to ask for? End quote. They deserve better, Madam President, uh, Deputy President, Deputy Acting President. Excuse me. <laughs> that order, yes. After being assaulted by a high care dementia res resident, Emma Bowers was left traumatised and could not return to work. Even though the cut had healed, the damage was done. She recalls, and I quote, I was attending to a male patient in the high care dementia ward at an aged care facility when I was assaulted. Hit on the head, I only realised I was injured when I saw blood flowing down my face. My initial thought of concern was towards the resident to make sure he is safe and not hurt. This was due to the understaffing of that facility. If we had enough staff that night, we would not be put in situations where our health and safety is at risk." End quote. They deserve better. These workers have advocated and fought the good fight of recognition, dignity and a day's fair pay. We joined thousands of aged care workers across the country, walk off the job on Tuesday 10th May with the United Workers Union across the nation just before the election 
taking action for improved conditions, pay, a, a good pay rise and an increased care time. There has been a decade of neglect by successive Liberal governments who have overseen overstaffing, low pay and insecure work for these overwhelmingly female workplaces, workforces. The previous Morrison government neglected older Australians and the aged care system. It's, an, it's a national disgrace. Just as the workers deserve better, so do older Australians. They helped build this country. They worked hard, paid their taxes and raised their families. They deserve better. The previous government did not support them, but this Albanese government will. Both the workers and older Australians deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. Aged care workers regularly report that in some cases just one staff member has been left to take care of up to 40 residents. That's 40 residents. Inadequate staffing means dedicated nurses and care workers are forced to make heartbreaking decisions every day about who will receive care now and who will have to wait. Too often, residents are being left in soiled pads, waiting too long when they call for assistance and not being helped in the toilet, to go to the toilet in time. Avoidable falls, substandard care and accidents are way too common and it needs to stop. People are also missing out on regular showers or require assistance to eat or a helping hand to call family and friends through phone calls or video calls. The Royal Commission concluded that the aged care workforce has the foundation of any successful reform in aged care. They said that high quality aged care cannot be achieved without having enough staff. The Albanese Labor government will take practical measures to ensure older Australians receive the aged care they deserve and to address the structural problems facing the care sector. That includes registered nurses on site 24-7 and ensuring that every aged care facility will be required under an Albanese Labor government to have registered qualified nurse on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This will save thousands of stressful, expensive and ultimately unnecessary trips to hospitals, hospital emergency departments for issues a nurse could solve on the spot. More carers with more time is what we're calling for. Labour will raise the standard of aged care across the board by ensuring there are more carers who have more time to care. We will mandate that every Australian living in aged care receives an average of 215 minutes of care per day, as recommended by the Royal Commission. That means more care for every resident every day. Not just essential medical treatment, but basic important things like helping people take a shower or getting people dressed or helping them eat a nutritious meal. Labor will see a pay rise for aged care workers. We will back a real pay rise for aged care workers and we will support workers' call for better pay at the Fair Work Commission. The Labor government will fund the outcome of this case because if we want higher standards of care, we need to support higher wages for our carers to pro to, in order to provide safe, quality care to a growing number of older Australians. We will also ensure there's better food for residents. Since the Aged Care Royal Commission was called, we've heard one shocking example after another of outrageous and unacceptable breaches of care standards, including Homes reserving uneaten food from one resident pureed to other residents. 
delays in identifying and treating wounds leading to severe pain and chronic conditions, overuse of restraints, demeaning practices such as floor time, managing management um, ignoring family complaints, and failures in maintaining clinical standards and audits. This is also a sector which the public believe lacks transparency around taxpayer funding. A recent report found just 16 per cent of people thought it was open and transparent. There have been too many high-profile stories of dodgy providers misusing funds meant for the care of older Australians. Older Australians need a government that isn't afraid to put the dodgy providers on notice and take tough stance on protecting their safety. The Albanese Labor government will ensure that there is better food for residents of aged care homes and we will ensure and work with the sector to develop and implement mandatory nutrition standards for aged care homes to ensure every resident gets good food. Dollars going to care. Labor will make residential care providers report in public and in detail what they're spending money on. And we will give the Aged Care Safety, Commi Aged care Safety Commission a new powers to ensure there is accountability and integrity. The Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Royal Commission Response Bill 2022 will see the establishment of a new code of conduct setting high standards of behaviour for aged care workers, approved providers and governing care in a way that is safe, competent and respectful. The bill will ensure improved information sharing between care and support sector regulators will enable proactive monitoring of cross-sector risks and better protection of consumers and participants from harm. The bill also includes a series of measures that provide greater transparency and accountability for providers. Star ratings will be published for all residential aged care services on My Aged Care by the end of 2022, and those star ratings will enable senior Australians, their families and carers to make informed decisions, uh, decisions about aged care. After a decade of neglect, aged care workers and older Australians deserve better. Labor has a plan to put security, dignity and quality back into aged care. Only the Albanese Labor government will treat aged care residents and workers with the respect they deserve. This government will fix aged care through practical measures. Registered nurses on site 24-7, more carers with more care time, backing a pay rise for aged care workers, better food for residents, more dollars going into care and more transparency and accountability. I have faith and confidence in the work of Minister for Health and Aged Care Mark Butler and Minister for Aged Care Annika Wells. I am proud to be a member of the United Workers Union which has been fighting for these changes and I am proud of being part of a government that will ensure no one is held back and no one is held behind or left behind. I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Payman. Pursuant to order, I now call Senator Ormond Payne to make her first speech and ask senators that the usual courtesies be extended to her. I call Senator Ormond Payne. Yeah. Thank you, President. I begin this evening by acknowledging that we are meeting on the sovereign and unceded lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples. I also wish to acknowledge the Balai, Garang, Garang Garang and Tarabalang Bunda peoples who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work in central Queensland. The consequences of invasion and colonisation are still being felt throughout this country and we must always remember that we are standing on stolen lands 
and centre First Nations justice in all of the work that we do in this place. I hope that this is a parliament that will make significant steps toward addressing the centuries of injustice against First Nations people. I am humbled and honoured to be the 100th senator elected to Queensland and only the third Green senator to represent our state. I have been an activist for most of my life. My first act of civil disobedience took place in year nine at Tully State High School. For six weeks, I stood at the back of our classroom, refusing to participate in mothercraft lessons, unless the boys were required to do it too. In the years that followed, mothercraft became parentcraft, and I like to think that my small act of protest played a part in that. I was born in Brisbane, but I've lived and worked right across our state. I spent my school years living in far north Queensland and in the small town of Cardwell. Mum's side of the family hailed from the north. My grandmother was born in Innisfail and my grandfather was one of the sons in Lawson and Sons, which owned sawmills in Tully, Tolga and Mareeba. I loved growing up in Cardwell. Weekends and school holidays were spent on the beach building cubby houses in the trees overlooking Hinchinbrook Island, hanging out down at the jetty or riding our bikes along the many trails in the local forest. Later on, I became a competitive swimmer and so I spent most of my time outside of school, in the local pool or travelling to carnivals across North Queensland. I met my husband Darren at university. Like me, he was studying human movement, having previously qualified as a fitter on the railways in New Zealand. After going out for about three weeks, he proposed and we got married over the summer break. We put ourselves through university by working together in a cocktail bar on the Gold Coast and teaching Learn to Swim at Jindalee. In our second year of university, despite student protests, the government introduced the Higher Education Contribution Scheme. Our first daughter, Erin, was born in our final year. I began my teaching career at Kenmore State High School. Erin was 10 months old and I was pregnant with our second child. I took 10 weeks off in the middle of my probationary year, returning to work when Tara was only six weeks old. I will always be grateful for the help and support my mum gave us in our first year of teaching. Absent universal free childcare, it's unlikely we could have afforded for me to go back to work without my mum's help. 1993 was also the year I attended my first teachers' strike, joining 10,000 public school teachers across the state to push back against the Goss government's proposed cuts to state education funding. At the end of our first year of teaching, Darren and I were given a required transfer to Gladstone. It wasn't easy to begin with. We moved house three times in the first six months and we had difficulty finding appropriate childcare, but eventually we settled in and we made it work. Our time in Gladstone coincided with the most extensive campaign in the history of the Queensland Teachers' Union to defeat the introduction of a new school-based management model for schools called Leading Schools. After six years in Gladstone, Darren and I accepted a transfer to Bamaga. Living and working on country with the communities of Cape York and the Torres Strait brought us face to face with the effects of colonisation and systemic racism on First Nations peoples. And I came to fully appreciate the profound impacts that government policy and decision making can have on people's lives. It was after living on Cape York that I decided to study law. I wanted to better understand how the law and government worked so I could be more effective in helping to bring about systemic change. By that time, we were living and working in Bundaberg, so I took leave from my job at Bundaberg State High School and I worked as a relief teacher during the day and I went to uni at night. In 2007, I started working at a law firm in Brisbane. I loved studying law, but what I learnt from practising law was that I really loved teaching. And so in 2012, I returned to the classroom. Since returning to teaching, I've become increasingly distressed by the growing inequalities in our education system. While public school teachers are forever being asked to do more with less, 
private schools receive ever-increasing funding. Over the past 10 years, government funding for private schools in Australia has increased at nearly five times the rate of public school funding. It's projected that until the end of the decade, private schools will be funded over 100 per cent of their schooling resource standard, whilst public schools won't even be funded to 91 per cent. As education economist Adam Rorris has pointed out, the school resource standard is not an aspirational standard of school funding. It is the minimum amount of funding required to have students reach the minimum achievement benchmarks. When governments fail to reach this funding level, they fail the students of this country. Students like Lachlan, Judy, Hannah, Noreen, Mayella, Brittany, Haley, and Jake, who made teaching my last legal studies class an absolute joy and who will be graduating from Gladstone High this year. Good luck. Every Australian student deserves a world-class education and public money should be for public schools. Over the past decade, I've also witnessed the growing inequalities in our communities. As teachers, we meet everyone. We meet the student who comes to school hungry because their parents' job seeker payment isn't enough to live on. We meet the family at risk of homelessness because the landlords put the rent up and they can no longer afford to live there or there simply aren't enough homes to rent. We meet kids who can't get their homework done in the evenings because their parents literally can't afford to keep the lights on. We meet the mother who is desperately trying to protect herself and her children from a violent partner. And we meet the child who is at risk of suicide but is unable to access appropriate mental health services. In the months before Senator Larissa Waters delivered her first speech back in 2011, 75 per cent of our home state of Queensland was impacted by flooding. 33 people lost their lives and 5,900 people were evacuated from 3,600 homes. Now, 11 years later, I deliver my first speech, only months removed from yet another climate catastrophe. Earlier this year, a year's worth of rain fell in a week across 23 Queensland local government areas. In three days alone, Brisbane received 80 per cent of its annual rainfall. Thirteen people died and thousands of homes were damaged or destroyed. Driving into the suburb of Goodna to help out after the water had receded is something I will never forget. It looked like a war zone, with homes damaged up to their roofs and families' ruined possessions piled high in the street. Climate change is causing more frequent and more severe natural disasters. The cost to the economy of natural disasters will reach $39 billion per year by 2050, and Queensland will bear the brunt, accounting for nearly 40 per cent of the growing national cost. This is a cost that should be borne by the coal and gas corporations that have caused the climate crisis, not by those suffering its effects. Our window to avoid catastrophe is closing. Our future depends on urgent and decisive action to respond to the climate crisis. That means no new coal and gas. Yeah. There are some in this place who would have you believe that the people of regional Queensland don't want to see meaningful action on climate change. Well, that's nonsense. Before the election, the Australian Conservation Foundation conducted Australia's biggest climate poll. It found that nearly two-thirds of the people in the electorate of Flynn, which encompasses my hometown of Gladstone, believe that climate action will produce economic benefits. The results were similar in the seats of Capricornia, Dawson and Maranoa. Workers in regional Queensland know that the world is moving away from fossil fuels and that a transition to renewable energy is inevitable. What they want to know is what comes next and how will they be supported through the transition. 
As a unionist, I have spent almost 30 years advocating for the rights of workers. I am committed to ensuring that as we make the transition to a renewable energy economy, no worker is left behind and our regional communities can benefit from the massive opportunities that come with investment in renewable energy generation and manufacturing. As the only senator based in Gladstone, I will be working closely with my community, as well as others around the country, to ensure that there is a plan for high-quality infrastructure, high-quality services and high-quality jobs as we transition to a net-zero emissions economy. When Larissa delivered her first speech in August 2011, I was sitting up there in the visitors' gallery. I appreciated the enormous significance of Queensland having its first ever elected Greens representative at any level of government, and I wanted to bear witness to such an important moment in the history of our party. I couldn't have imagined back then that 11 years later I would be making my own first speech in this place, and that I'm doing so today is testament to the hard work of so many party members and supporters. I want to thank our 35 lower house and senate ticket candidates, most of whom campaigned to promote the Greens' vision and lift our senate vote with no expectation of winning themselves. To Danielle Mutton, Bernard Lakey, Ian Maslin, Stephen Bates, Mick Jones, Paula Crean, Vinnie Batten, Sally Spain, Sue Etheridge, Renee Wells, Paul Bambrick, Jordan Hall, Max Chandler Mather, Mickey Berry, Scott Humphreys, Andrew McLean, Jennifer Cox, Philip Musamichi, Melissa Stevens, Earl Schneiders, Alyssa Parker, Scott Turner, April Broadbent, Claire Garton, Asha Worstling, Will Simon, Neil Cotter, Elizabeth Watson Brown, Craig Armstrong, Nicole Thompson, Ben Pennings, Anna Shree, Elise Nelligen, Navdeep Singh, and Rebecca Haley. This is your victory. Yeah. Yeah. To Larissa, this Senate seat was only winnable because of the amazing work that you have done for over a decade. You and I are the pointy end of 30 years of political history in Queensland, of which you have played such an important part. Thank you for everything you've done over the years. I'll never forget how proud I was to be in the Senate chamber when you made your first speech, and I'm so pleased and proud that I now get to do this with you. To Asia, Katinka, Emily, Kirsten, Guy, Sean, Emerald, Lyle, Imogen, Mark, Nikita, Marty, Josie, Izzy, Simon, Sam, Ellie, David, Mariana and Will. Thank you for being the best Senate campaign support team I could have asked for. To Jane, Erin and Tammy and all of our Gladstone volunteers, thank you for making this the biggest Greens campaign we've ever had in Gladstone. To my dear friend Kitty Cara, thank you for keeping the whole show on the road and giving me either a confidence boost or a stern talking to when I needed it. Over the past 12 years, I've benefited from the mentorship, counsel and friendship of so many people in our party. The list is too long to include here, but you know who you are. Please know that I wouldn't be here without you. To my family, Dad. Thank you for the countless times you drove me to the airport at 4.30am on a Monday morning so I could be home in time for school after a weekend of campaigning. I think Mum would be really impressed by our efforts. To Erin and Tara, I'm incredibly proud of the strong women you've become, and I hope you're proud of me too. To Billy and Esther, you are the lights of my life. And I'm sorry that Mum, I won't be able to visit you quite as often as I'd like for the next little while. And to Darren, thank you for riding the roller coaster with me over the past 32 years. I love you. This election, the Greens vote grew nationwide and Australian voters returned more Greens parliamentarians than ever before. 
Across Queensland, there was a surge in support for the Greens, which saw us win seats from both Liberal and Labor. Australians are choosing a future in which we place people before profit. They want to see Medicare extended so that it doesn't stop at your teeth or your brain. They want to see safe, secure housing treated as a human right rather than a scheme for extracting profit from desperate people. And they want to see a climate that is safe to live in, which means no more coal and gas and a rapid transition to cheap, reliable and publicly owned renewable energy. We have an enormous responsibility as parliamentarians to represent the people who put us here. Representation is a form of service. We serve the people of our electorates. We are servants. We are not the Australian people's masters. They are ours. The major parties have forgotten this. If the major parties served the people, we'd be talking about how to get to 75 per cent emissions reduction by 2030, not whether we should. If the major parties served the people, we'd be increasing taxes on mega corporations and the super rich and ensuring that no Australian should have to choose between eating or buying clothes, between paying the rent or filling up their car to get to work, between violence and homelessness. The federal election was a wake-up call to every single parliamentarian and corporate lobbyist strutting the halls of this building. People are scared and people are angry. They have had enough of a status quo that delivers record corporate profits while everyone else suffers and they are willing and able to tear it down. I represent Queensland. I represent the people of a state that is suffering the effects of catastrophic global heating more than most. A state where more than 50,000 people languish on the social housing waiting list, some for more than a decade. A state where one in eight people live in poverty. I am a servant of the people of Queensland and I will be judged by the people of Queensland if I fail to serve them and fight for them with the dedication and seriousness that they deserve. I'm up for the challenge. Let's get to work. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Orman Payne.
Um, order senators and visitors to the chamber. The uh, Senate is ready to commence with the next item of business in return to the paper. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, aged care and other legislation amendment, Royal Commission response bill 2022, resumption of debate on second reading and on the amendment moved by Senator Rustin. And Senator Ciccone, you're seeking the call. I am. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Congratulations to our new senator and that was a lovely speech. Um, also, uh, talking about lovely speeches, following on from Senator Payman, who also made her contribution uh, earlier uh, this afternoon and her personal experience uh, as a member of the UWU uh, over in Western Australia and uh, you know, placing on the record uh, her experience um, in, in terms of the aged care crisis that this country sadly has had to confront. Uh, and thankfully now that um, the Albanese government is taking seriously to fix so it's no secret that aged care is in crisis and has been for the last decade. But over the, the past several years, um, Acting Deputy President, the, the terrible state of Australia's aged care system has been a recurring headline, sadly. Advocates, uh, as we've heard, and unions and you know, the Labor Party, uh, when we're in opposition, been calling on the then coalition government to take serious action uh, for a number of years to address uh, to address the, the issues that the aged care sector was facing. Uh, and they were eventually dragged, kicking and screaming, to establish a Royal Commission into uh, our aged care industry. Now, by the time that we got to uh, the federal election this year, it had been well over a year since the Royal Commission had handed down its, uh, its report. The commissioners uh, said in their report, and I'd like to just quote uh, a particular aspect of that report for the benefit of the Senate and those that might be listening uh, uh, this evening. Quote, the extent of the substandard care in Australia's aged care system reflects both poor quality on the part of some aged care providers and fundamental um, systematic flaws with the way that the Australian aged care system is designed and governed. He goes on to say, uh, people receiving aged care, uh, people receiving aged care deserve better. The Australian community is entitled to expect better. Now it's important to sort of uh, pull that uh, recommendation out and, and some of the, uh, the commentary from it, the, the fine commissioners uh, as part of the Royal Commission because it does shine a light on, I guess, the, the, the core issues that uh, we are facing now as a parliament and thankfully an Albanese government that is prepared to roll up its sleeves and tackle the aged care crisis head on. Um, what we saw was awful standards of treatment, awful standards of treatment by those that needed so much from their government in their desperate times of care. We saw examples, sadly, examples where maggots were in wounds of residents and two-thirds of residents who were malnourished, all at risk of being malnourished. This is shocking evidence, absolute shocking evidence that should have been driven by the previous uh, government to take urgent action. But no, what we saw was denial, head in the sand, pretending that there was no crisis, but again dragged, kicking and screaming to finally, finally set up a Royal Commission and take the issue seriously. Uh, but today, over 16 months since the Royal Commission handed down its report, you would struggle to find an aged care resident or worker who would, uh, you, who would um, say that the situation has actually improved. You know, sadly, we have a lot of work to get done, and you know this government is making no qualms about it. We will address the issues and address each of the recommendations that were put by the royal commissioners. Um, sadly, those opposite um, the conservative side of politics were so resistant to a royal commission into aged care because they knew it would show a very ugly picture, a very ugly picture. Even without a royal commission, there were horror stories in the media every week and it was completely shameless that the coalition resisted calls for a royal commission because they knew it would be politically inconvenient. Uh, but that was what was always the, the case and the approach that the, those opposite the coalition took. A crisis was never a call to action, it was a political inconvenience. And that was how the Liberals and Nationals treated the report that was handed down by the Royal Commission. Maggots and wounds, malnourishment and in 2020, 
11,000 people died waiting for an aged care package. This situation was all laid out in front of the coalition and they failed. So it's great that they expected to vote for this legislation today, but I think it's important that we all remember how we got here, what it took to finally get real action to improve our aged care sector. It took a change of government, a Labor government that has brought forward this legislation, one of our first pieces of legislation, Acting Deputy President. This bill responds to several of the recommendations from the Royal Commission into Aged Care. It makes a series of important changes that will improve the health, the safety and the well-being of older Australians. People have paid taxes all their lives and all they expect, if they're ever put in, in a vulnerable situation, is that the government is on their side. That the government is on their side. Uh, now, these changes that, that the Albanese government is proposing, I believe, will assist older Australians and their families. It's not just those who are in aged care facilities, but it's actually trying to take some of the burden off those families who are helping their loved ones while they are in the care of our fantastic uh, aged care workers who do an outstanding job and have done so for the, particularly the last couple of years in the midst of uh, COVID. Uh, and I also want to give a shout out to those who are looking after my, my aunt and uncle who are currently in an aged care facility. And I know there's always continuous uh, outbreaks of COVID and they do an outstanding job. You know, and, and, and the fact that what they've had to go through, particularly in my home state of Victoria, uh, I, I can't thank them enough for the great work that they do day in and day out. But the changes that the Albanese government uh, is proposing before the parliament is to introduce a new aged care subsidy calculation, providing a legislative basis for the star rating system, introducing a code of conduct and banning order scheme, extending the serious incident response scheme to aged care delivered in home settings, strengthening the governance of approved providers. And I think that's a very important area of concern that uh, we saw play out over the last couple of years. Enhancing information sharing across related sectors, increasing the financial and prudential oversight, broadening the functions of the renamed Independent Health and Aged Care Pricing Authority, and addressing the issues with the informed consent arrangements in respect to the use of restrictive practices in residential aged care. Madam Acting Deputy President, I don't propose to go into any more great detail. I just wanted to provide a very brief uh, contribution today in the Senate. I know there's been others, uh, particularly those, um, as we heard earlier today, um, who have been very involved uh, in this sector. And I just want to stress that it is important and good to see that uh, colleagues on, on this side of the chamber uh, are looking at, at supporting the uh, um, legislation that the government has put forward. These are very, very important uh, changes, important reforms, and many were recommended some time ago by the Royal Commission into aged care. But now that we do have a Labor government, I am glad that we are finally getting on with the job of implementing these essential changes, and I hope that everyone in this chamber can support this necessary and urgent legislation because, quite frankly, older Australians deserve so much better than the neglect and the abuse that they've experienced over many years. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to uh, talk about the Aged Care and Other Legislation Royal Commission Response Bill 2022. As its title describes, this bill legislates several recommendations from the final report of the Royal Commission into aged care quality and safety. All but one of the measures in this bill were concluded in the former government's bill, which lapsed when the last parliament was prorogued. The one, measure, the one new measure relates to star ratings that will provide greater transparency and accountability in the aged care system. Star ratings will be published online for all residents of aged care uh, services so that everyone will be able to make more informed decisions about aged care providers. I agree with the Royal Commission's observations that it's critical for the public to have, a good, information, to have good information about the performances of individual services. 
A system of star ratings will be an essential tool in differentiating between aged care services. Essential both for those who are needing to choose an aged care provider and those who are requiring them. As the Royal Commission said, people receiving aged care have a right to know about the performance of their service provider and alternatives that they can make informed decisions about whether to change providers. Then, of course, families and friends, advocate organisations, policy makers, legislators and the media should also be able to assess the information and guidance that a star rating system will provide. The star rating system that Labor's legislation will deliver will replace the service compliance rating system which the last government introduced. That system, as the Royal Commission reported, falls well short of what's needed. That's because under that inadequate and discredited system, services that meet all minimum standards and have no current sanctions are automatically are given the highest ratings. That's not good enough in our books because that rating system does not differentiate between providers who just meet the standards and those who are outstanding. Our scheme will allow older people and their families to make meaningful comparisons of the equality of the quality and safety performances of providers. Our rating system will give comfort and confidence both to those needing to enter aged care and those who are already receiving care. A good rating will be a reflection of good governance and this bill will serve to strengthen the governance of approved providers. The Aged Care Quality and Service Commissioner will be given powers to take enforcement action for, for substantiated breaches such as being able to issue a civil penalty or a banning order. The Royal Commission was not impressed with the quality of governance across aged care sector. It's pretty clear that was the case. The Commission gained plenty of evidence to support its findings that the level of substandard care was, to quote, unacceptably high, to put it mildly. As it said in its final report, in all aged care providers had good governance, if all aged care providers had good governance arrangements in place, it is highly likely that the level of substandard care would reduce significantly. <coughs> the final report quotes the Governance Institute of Australia, which explains that values and behaviours determine the, the, and define the organisational culture. The governance arrangements reflect and promote the culture of an organisation. We in government agree with the Royal Commission that the existing governance arrangements and requirements do not provide a sufficiently strong basis for the governance and leadership of aged care providers. From the 1st of December this year, approved providers and their governing bodies will be required to meet new responsibilities. The new measures will improve leadership and culture. The emphasis here will be on transparency and accountability to ensure that the focus of approved providers from the top down is in the interest of those in care. New reporting responsibilities will help those in care and their families better understand the operations of providers. Approved providers will be required to notify the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission of changes to personal to keep personnel. Further, there will be increased financial and prudential oversight of the aged care sector. In particular, this legislation will increase financial. Uh, it will increase um, the uh, oversight of the refundable accommodation deposits and bonds. The Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner or the Secretary will be able to request information or documentations from a provider or borrower of a loan made uh, using a refundable accommodation deposit or bond. 
It will be an offence for a borrower who does not comply with a request. Rigorous financial and prudent prudential oversight was seen by the Royal Commission as critical if we were going to see any improvement in the aged care system. It will protect taxpayers' investment in aged care services and will help identify potential risks to the quality and safety of aged care. While, while I'm on the subject of safety, it is important to note that this bill will expand the Serious Incidents Response Scheme from residential care to home care and flexible care delivered in a home or community setting for the first time from December 2000, from the first time since December 22. The Royal Commission noticed that the need for oversight of allegations of abuse and neglect in home settings will increase as more people receive aged care in their homes for longer. Those people will also, will also mostly, most likely have increased levels of frailty, cognitive impairment or both. As the Commission said, frailty is directly linked to vulnerability and any serious incident response scheme must have the capability to detect patterns in reports that indicate an ongoing risk to the safety of people receiving aged care services. The Royal Commission heard a litany of horror stories of abuse and exploitation of elderly people in care. This legislation will ensure that individuals, including persons with a disability, who are subjected to cruelly inhumane or degrading treatment can be assured that the incident will be promptly reported and impartially examined by the relevant authorities. Further, it extends protections for people who report abuse or neglect so that they don't face repercussions such as civil or criminal liabilities for reporting an incident. This legislation is long overdue and that's why the Albanese Labor government has introduced this bill at the very first available opportunity in this 47th parliament. The Albanese government is determined to protect all people in aged care, especially those at risk of abuse and neglect at the hands of unscrupulous and uncaring operators. We are determined that people who place their elderly and infirm family members in aged care should have peace of mind that their loved ones are being looked after and well looked after. The whole nation has been shocked by the harrowing accounts of abuse and neglect that has been revealed by the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety, whose investigations and reports have helped to chart this new course of reform. I commend the Royal Commission for its careful and considered investigation and for its comprehensive re report. This legislation is a first response to that report. We have more legislation in the pipeline that will further improve care and quality standards. The Aged Care Amendment Implementation Care Reform Bill, when it is enacted, will in implement another three of Labor's election promises. Importantly, residential care providers from July next year Will have, to have, will, have to register, will have to have a registered nurse on site at all times. We are also wanting to cap the amount that providers can charge for administration and management. As the Aged Care Minister Annika Wells said when she introduced uh, the legislation in the other place last week, the Royal Commission report is riddled with examples of people whose lives were upended by astronomical fees, by home care packages that were eaten up in administration costs and management charges that reduced care instead of adding, uh, adding to it. And last, the bill will honour Labor's commitment to better transparency about how much providers spend on care, nursing food, maintenance, cleaning, administration and profit. The bill will require the secretary to publish this information. 
This government is serious about bringing about real change to the aged care sector. Legislating our concerns will serve to improve the lives of those in care and get, can give comfort to their families. And that can't come and happen soon enough. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Dodson. And I call Senator Stewart. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Sorry, I need to move the lectern to go the way of my belly. <laughs> I rise to speak on and support the measures contained in the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Bill 2022. For countless generations, elders have provided care, wisdom, guidance and authority over our culture, country and people. Elders have been our story. Their contribution to our culture and to our country is immeasurable. As I touched on in my first speech, I would not be standing here in the Senate today if it were not for my own elders, especially my great-grandmothers, Alice Kelly and Annabelle Jackson, and my grandparents, Elvie and Joe Kelly. Elders, along with all older Australians, including generations of migrant communities, have helped build and create modern-day Australia. Older Australians have worked hard, paid their taxes and raised their families. It is our elderly and their sacrifices who have paved the way for us today and for the generations of tomorrow. Older Australians have every right to expect that the federal government will support them in their later years. That's what they deserve. That's what they've earned after a life contributing to their communities and to our country. However, as tragically exposed through the Royal Commission into Aged Care, Quality and Safety, the care and treatment of our elderly in aged care has been far from acceptable, to say the least. The Royal Commission's findings were clear. It exposed an aged care system that has been in crisis. As the Royal Commissioners wrote, over the last several decades, successive Australian governments have brought a level of ambivalence, timidity and detachment to their approach to aged care. The Royal Commission heard countless stories of neglect, of a system in crisis, of thousands of Australians crying out for just a little bit better, for just a little care, for just a sense of humanity. In particular, it was the Abbott, Turnbull and Morrison coalition governments that have neglected older Australians and the aged care system for the best part of a decade. It is a national disgrace. However, I'm proud to be part of an Albanese Labor government that is committed to fixing the aged care crisis. In this regard, I would like to acknowledge our new Minister for Aged Care, Annika Wells, the Assistant Minister for Health and Aged Care, Jed Carney, and the Assistant Minister for Indigenous Health, Senator Mullandiri McCarthy, for having hit the ground running to begin the hard work of reforming and rebuilding our aged care sector. Just as we promised at the election, the Albanese Labor government will take practical measures consistent with the recommendations contained in the Royal Commission to ensure older Australians receive the care and dignity they deserve. This bill amends aged care law and other legislation to implement a series of urgent funding, quality and safety measures, several of which were recommended by the Royal Commission into Aged Care. The bill replaces the outdated aged care funding instrument with a new model for calculating aged care subsidies called the Australian National Aged Care Classification Model, which has been developed in consultation with the aged care sector and consumer groups. Importantly, the bill includes several measures that will provide additional protections directly to older Australians. These protections cannot be delayed any longer. The Serious Incident Response Scheme will be expanded to establish obligations on approved providers of home care and flexible care in a community setting to report and respond to incidents and to take action to prevent incidents from reoccurring. A new code of conduct will set high standards of behaviour for aged care workers approved providers and governing persons of approved providers to ensure they are delivering aged care in a way that is safe, competent and respectful. Improved information sharing between care and support sector regulators will enable proactive measures, proactive monitoring of cross-sector risks and better protection of consumers and participants from harm. An interim solution for the provision of consent for the use of restrictive practices 
will also be established, established while the state and territory consent arrangements are reconsidered. The bill also includes a series of measures that provide greater transparency and accountability for providers. Star ratings will be published for all residential aged care services on My Aged Care by the end of 2022. Star ratings will enable senior Australians, their families and carers to make informed decisions about their aged care. From 1 December 2022, approved providers and their governing bodies will be required to meet new responsibilities that will improve governance. Approved providers will be required to notify Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission of changes to key personnel and the current disqualified individual arrangements will be replaced with a broader suitability test. Amendments will also be made to increase financial and prudential oversight in respect to refundable accommodation, deposits and bonds. The functions of a renamed independent, and, uh, functions of a renamed independent health and aged care pricing authority will be expanded to include the provision of advice on health care and aged care pricing and costing. The bill makes a series of important and urgent changes that will improve the health, safety and well-being of older Australians and will assist older Australians and their families to understand the quality of care and operations of providers. As a First Nations Senator, I'm particularly interested in ensuring that the policy reform and investment to further enhance aged care access, service and quality is provided for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, as well as other marginalised and disadvantaged communities. As stated by the Royal Commission, with respect to First Nations people's experience of the aged care system, the report stated, when talking about First Nations people, and I quote, they descend from the, from the first inhabitants of the land we now know as Australia. Having developed over millennia a rich, varied, unique cultural her heritage, in contemporary Australia, elders and older Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are cultural knowledge holders. They provide the social glue within their communities. They are central to the continuation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and communities. However, the Royal Commission raised serious concern with the level of access and care provided to support our First Nations elders through the aged care system. And I quote, there is strong evidence that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people do not access aged care at a rate commensurate with their level of need. A combination of factors creates barriers to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's access to the aged care system. These arise from social and economic disadvantage, a lack of culturally safe care, the ongoing impacts of colonisation and prolonged discrimination. Access issues are further compounded by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's additional vulnerability arising from higher rates from disability, comorbid comorbidities, homelessness and dementia. To feel secure, and obtain culturally safe services. Many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people prefer to, re to receive services from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations. However, there are currently not enough Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and other people with high levels of cultural comp competency employed across the aged care system. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people experience earlier onset of ageing-related conditions and disability compared to the rest of the Australian population. Long-term health conditions affect 88 per cent of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over the age of 55 years. Dementia is also more prevalent. By any objective measure, they should be receiving proportionally higher levels of age and health care. The current aged care system does not ensure culturally safe care for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. After a lifetime of experiencing marginalisation, discrimination, disadvantage and racism, the elders and older people of the descendants of the first inhabitants of this ancient land deserve better than this. Furthermore, with respect to non-English speaking communities and other disadvantaged communities experienced with the aged care system, the Royal Commission's report found, and I quote, older people who migrated to Australia from non-English speaking countries find it hard to access care that meets their cultural and language needs. Older people with a disability receiving aged care do not have access to services and supports at the same level as, as those provided through the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Other groups that have experienced trauma, such as veterans, people from the LGBTIQ communities, and care leavers find it difficult to find the care that meets their needs. 
The bill thankfully begins to make a series of urgent changes that will begin to help improve the health, safety and well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders, as well as older Australians from non-English speaking and other minority groups through the aged care sector. As outlined by the Victorian Aboriginal Community Health Organisation, we have a significant opportunity to continue to enhance, enhance aged care services for elders. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population is projected to grow by 59% by 2031, with the 65 and over Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population projected to grow by 200% by 2031, much faster than the population aged 0 to 24, which just sits at 47%. The rapid population growth is even more prevalent in cohort of Aboriginal Victorians of retirement age, with this cohort projected to increase by 142% by 2031. Along with the reforms being introduced today, I look forward to advancing a number of the findings and recommendations contained in the Royal Commission's final report, which will work to enhance options, access and care for the increasing number of First Nations people who will require aged care in the coming years, including the creation of a Commissioner of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Aged Care to oversee the transformation of aged care services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and create a new flexibly funded Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander run service pathway within the aged care program to deliver culturally safe care. The new, a new Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander aged care pathway, which should incorporate the best aspects of the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flexible aged care program, including pooled and flexible funding. The proposed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander aged care pathway should, in, should be embedded in a single national system available across Australia, bringing culturally safe and flexible aged care that meets the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people wherever they, to, um, where they live. I look forward to working with my parliamentary colleagues on helping to progress not only reforms being debated today, but on these future reforms that will help improve aged care services for First Nations elders. In this regard, we do not have to start from scratch. Along with the tremendous work that has been undertaken through the Royal Commission into Aged Care and the many submissions provided by stakeholders, when it comes to First Nations aged care needs, we have pre-existing and long-standing models to draw from and build on. Along with the Rumbalara Elders Facility, which is based in Shepparton Region, and the Aboriginal Community Elders Service based in Brunswick and Victoria, has for 31 years operated and served the specific needs of First Nations elders across Melbourne's northern region. ACES was the first Aboriginal residential aged care facility established in Victoria and was established due to the tireless work of the late Arnie Iris Lovett Gardner and other elders, both past and present. They were concerned that elders were dying in mainstream nursing homes without any Aboriginal cultural practices being observed. Since opening its doors in 1991, ACES has been providing invaluable and tailored care to generations of elders through culturally appropriate services and engagement. I had the pleasure to visit ACES along with our, shadow, our then Shadow Minister for Ageing, uh, Claire O'Neill, and the Federal Member for Wills, Peter Khalil, to announce a $2.1 million election commitment to help them continue providing improved service to the growing number of First Nations elders. While the $2.1 million commitment has been warmly welcomed by ACES to upgrade their facilities, as only a 25-bed residential aged care centre, they will continue to require more investment to expand to cater for the growing number of elders anticipated to require culturally tailored care over the coming years. In this regard, Labor's broader package to support First Nations aged care contains a number of key elements that will assist across the sector, including investing $115 million to build culturally safe aged care facilities over four years, $106 million to provide face-to-face -face support for older First Nations people, implementation of a trusted Indigenous facilitators program to build a First Nations workforce to help individual older First Nations people and their families and carers to access aged care services that meets their physical and cultural needs. In partnership with the federal government, the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation will work with Aboriginal community controlled organisations to assist older First Nations people and their families navigate and access aged care services. A workforce of around 250 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff across Australia will provide this trusted support. This government is committed to delivering aged care and health services that meet the needs of our elders and enables them to remain close to their homes and connected to their communities. The Royal Commission into Aged Care recommended the government ensure that the new aged care system makes specific and adequate provision for the diverse and changing needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and so we are doing just that. Labor has a plan to put security, dignity, quality and humanity back into aged care. 
Only an Albanese Labor government will treat older Australians with the respect that they deserve. I commend this bill to the Chamber and I look forward to advancing these reforms and many others we will progress, particularly to ensure we provide better aged care services for First Nations elders and elders from multicultural communities. Thank you, Senator Stewart. Uh, that's not your first speech, is it? Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, I'd like to join with a range of other speakers from the uh, government side of the chamber in commending this bill and commending both Minister Wells and the government as a whole for bringing this legislation on so early in this term. I think it is a sign of how importantly the government takes fixing the aged care system, that this is one of the first bills that this parliament will deal with. And I think I'm right in saying this is the first bill uh, that the Senate is dealing with in this term of government. Um, it's been too long since we've had a government in Australia that actually cares about the aged care system and actually cares about aged care residents, their families uh, and, importantly, the workers in the aged care system who do so much for those we love uh, with so little recognition and so little value for the work that they have performed. And that is something that is going to change under the Albanese Labor government, evidenced by the fact that we are moving so early in this term uh, on this legislation. Uh, Australians have been waiting for so long to have a government that takes aged care seriously, that is prepared to fund it properly, that is prepared to treat residents, families and workers in the system with respect. Uh, and that is what this legislation is the begin beginning of from this new Albanese government. Uh, so we're in, in introducing this legislation, what we've done is introduce a key piece of aged care legislation delivering on the government's promise to ensure that older Australians receive higher quality care that they deserve. These are our loved ones. These are Australians who have worked, who have raised families, who have paid their taxes and, unfortunately, under the former government, had to experience shocking neglect in the aged care system, uh, despite the number of warnings that were made uh, and given to the former government, had to endure those conditions, um, the maggots in wounds, the appalling food that you wouldn't feed your dog, let alone your loved ones, and yet which was happening far too often in the aged care system under the former government. And that is what we are about fixing, including via this legislation. So, as other speakers have noted, uh, the Aged Care and Other Legislative Amendment Royal Commission Response Bill will deliver critically needed changes for the aged care system. Uh, a few of the key points that this legislation will bring in are as follows. A new Australian National Aged Care Classification funding model, which will replace the outdated aged care funding instrument in October 2022, offering more equitable funding that is better matched to providers' costs in delivering the care residents need. Uh, and before I go on to mention other points that this bill deals with, just to say a little bit more about the importance of addressing the funding model, let's not forget, we should never forget, uh, that, this, that the funding model that is being replaced, the aged care funding instrument, was exactly the funding model that former Prime Minister Morrison, as Treasurer, uh, made adjustments to that starved the aged care system of the funding it so desperately needed. If you want to look for one moment in time that set up the failure of the system, the neglect of the system uh, and the people within it uh, under the former government, it was that decision by former Treasurer and former Prime Minister Mr Morrison, backed in by every other member of the, of the former government, uh, that starved the aged care system of the funding that it so desperately needed. And Senator Polly, if I may, I know that this is something that you took up often in estimates as well. We, we sat through many estimates hearings together talking about this. Uh, and that was the decision by the former government that put the brakes on the funding that the aged care system so desperately needed. So I very much welcome the fact uh, that this government, this new Albanese government, will be replacing that aged care funding instrument to put in place a more modern, more equitable funding system, which will be known as the Australian National Aged Care Classification Funding Model. This bill also 
uh, delivers other changes. The star ratings system will see the Department of Health and Aged Care publish a comparison rating for all residential aged care services by the end of this year, um, something that will be really helpful for members of the public in assessing uh, the standard of different uh, residential aged care services. The bill will extend the Serious Incident Response Scheme uh, to all in-home care providers from 1 December this year, meaning increased protection for older Australians from preventable incidents, abuse and neglect. I think we've all been horrified uh, by those incidents um, where, um, that we've seen of, of, of shocking neglect and, in some cases, downright abuse of residents uh, in our aged care facilities. And extending the Serious Incident Response Scheme in the way this bill provides will go a long way to stopping those kind of things from happening. The bill will also introduce a new code of conduct for approved providers, their workforce and governing persons, setting minimum standards of behaviour to ensure older Australians receive care in a safe, competent and respectful manner. And again, this code will come into force on 1 December 2022. These are things that the former government found it impossible to do. I mean, the former government went to the trouble of setting up a royal commission into aged care under sufferance uh, after all of those examples of abuse and neglect were revealed. They finally moved to set up a royal commission, which delivered some very good recommendations. And what did they do? They sat on their hands, as they had done for the entire time they'd been in office, and didn't act on those recommendations. And that's what this bill does. It took a change of government to implement recommendations of a royal commission that was initiated by the former government. I think there's a lot of older Australians and their families out there and aged care workers who are pleased to see this change of government that occurred on, in May this year so that we could finally get these recommendations of the Royal Commission implemented. The bill will also uh, deliver new provider governance and reporting arrangements that are due to begin at the end of this year, which will improve transparency and provide greater accountability on providers to better focus on the needs of older Australians receiving care. I recognise that there are many good aged care providers out there, but there have been too many examples where providers have done the wrong thing uh, at the expense of residents, their families and workers. And again, this bill will address that through these new governance and reporting arrangements. Uh, as a result of this bill, first steps will be taken towards harmonising regulation of care and support providers across the aged care, disability support and veterans care sectors by improving information sharing between the bodies that regulate these sectors. The introduction of the next phase of the financial and prudential monitoring, compliance and intervention framework will also be delivered by this bill, and that will provide additional protection for older Australians. This will enable greater government oversight of financial risks faced by the sector and help providers meet their obligations to refund deposits to residents. The bill will also rename the Independent Hospital Pricing Authority to become the Independent Health and Aged Care Pricing Authority uh, to recognise its role around aged care, and its functions will be expanded to include advice on health care and aged care pricing and costing. And finally, uh, the bill uh, deals with supporting arrangements that commenced on 1 July last year. Uh, and this legislation will also enable providers to meet more robust requirements on the use of restrictive practices in jurisdictions where limitations regarding consent and guardianship laws exist. Again, another important reform uh, to improve the rights of aged care residents. Put together, these changes will build on the Albanese government's promise to deliver security, dignity, quality and humanity in, in care for every older Australian across the aged care system. I know it's something that I would want to see for my parents as they get towards the age where they will require aged care, and it's certainly the kind of thing that I think all Australians want to see provided to our older Australians. Just before closing, again, I just want to reflect on the, the symbolism of this bill uh, and what it means in broader terms beyond the specific elements of the bill itself. Uh, and again, I think it's really notable 
uh, that this is the bill that this Senate, uh, this piece of government business, uh, this is the piece of government business that the Senate is dealing with as its first order of business. Again, it indicates the importance of putting in place a decent, well-funded, well-regulated aged care systems for our older Australians. Nothing less than they deserve. Nothing less than they deserve. I'll take the interjection from Senator Rust, and I, I am amazed that, uh, with the record of the former government when it comes to aged care, which led to a royal commission whose title and the title of that report was neglect, I am amazed that any government senator would want to interject during this debate. If I was a member of the former government, I'd be hanging my head in shame every time aged care was dealt with in this bill, rather than interjecting. So. Um, Senator Rustin, I'd really urge you to reflect on that. The, um, and as I say, so I am proud of the fact that this is the first bill that this new government is dealing with in the Senate, and it sends a very clear message about the fact that we take the rights of residents of aged care, their families and workers in the system very seriously, a very big contrast to the former government uh, who had to be dragged into a royal commission that they didn't, then didn't imp implement the recommendations of, and that it then took a change of government to see the implementation of those recommendations. The approach of the Albanese government could not be more different to the approach we saw from the former coalition government. Under the Albanese government, we will finally see a federal government in this country that focuses and delivers on the needs of residents and their families and that focuses and delivers on the rights of aged care workers. I remember again, um, De Met uh, Acting Deputy President, you and I sitting in estimates hearings year after year with the former minister, Minister Colbeck, asking whether he and the government supported a pay rise for aged care workers. And he never once, he would not even agree with that basic proposition that aged care workers deserved a pay rise. Not one member of the former government would agree with that proposition, at least publicly. Certain people may have held views privately, uh, but not once did we ever see a member of the former government uh, publicly state that aged care workers deserved a pay rise and that, they, and that the former government would intervene or even offer a submission supporting a pay rise in that case that's before the Fair Work Commission. All the former government would do, all the former government would do, would agree to provide information. Oh, well, what a big step that was provide information to a Fair Work Commission, but you wouldn't once get anyone from the former government say that aged care workers deserve a pay rise. It's something that this government has made clear very early in our tenure. Um, and again, I truly hope that on a, on a local level, from my home state of Queensland, I truly hope that, that as a result of the reforms that this government is now putting in place, we will not see a repeat of some of the absolutely disgraceful aged care uh, situations that we saw in the last term of government. And just to mention too, um, the, the, the Earlhaven nursing home at the Gold Coast, something that I was very vocal about. Th that, that nursing home had seen inspections by the aged care regulator uh, and recommendations made for action, for sanctions against the provider, which weren't taken. And what do you know, in the middle of the night, that nursing home literally fell apart in the sense that there was no workforce. Um, there, were, there were dozens of elderly, vulnerable people in that nursing home who did not have any care, and it took the Queensland government sending in uh, uh, personnel to ensure that these elderly, vulnerable people were looked after. And even more recently that, than that, we saw another example, the Jetta Gardens nursing home uh, in Logan, just south of Brisbane, ripped apart by COVID as so many aged care facilities were under the former government. And again, once you started having a look at it, it didn't take me much time to ascertain that that nursing home had been the subject of investigations uh, and, and recommendations for, for tighter action that never got dealt with. And again, what do you know? Um, that's, then we saw a few months after those inquiries and investigations into that nursing home, we saw COVID rip through, uh, costing people their lives. So that's what happened under the former government, and we should never forget it. Under the former government, we had an aged care system that was starved of funding due to direct decisions made by the former Prime Minister and the rest of his cabinet at the time, uh, and that resulted 
in COVID ripping through aged care homes, in people dying, in people being neglected, in workers not getting the pay they deserved, in people leaving the workforce because they could get better money uh, doing other work elsewhere. That's the kind of thing that this government is serious about cleaning up. We want to put in place an aged care system that Australians can be proud of, a system that people can have confidence in and a system that people can make sure know that when their elderly uh, parents or grandparents go to, they will be looked after. That's what we're going to see under this government. Thank you, Minister. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Royal Commission Response Bill makes a series of amendments to aged care and other laws to implement several time-critical measures that are aimed at improving Commonwealth-funded aged care for older Australians. And I thank other senators for their contributions uh, to this debate uh, today. The Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety heard evidence regarding substandard care throughout its inquiry. This bill supports reforms that will give older Australians back their dignity and the respect and safety that they deserve. The Royal Commission's final report made 148 recommendations to overhaul the aged care system. While a new Aged Care Act and significant change is around the corner, this bill makes some critical reforms that cannot wait any longer. Importantly, the bill introduces many reforms aimed at directly improving protections for older Australians. The bill will introduce a new subsidy calculation method to fund approved providers and replace the outdated aged care funding instrument from 1 October 2022. It also introduces new requirements for the Secretary to publish information in relation to star ratings as recommended by the Royal Commission. Publication of star ratings based on measurable performance indicators will allow older Australians and their families to make meaningful comparisons of the quality and safety of services and providers. The implementation of the Code of Conduct is the government's first step towards implementing a national registration scheme in accordance with the Royal Commission's recommendations. The Code will set high standards of behaviour across the aged care sector and ensure that the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission is able to take appropriate enforcement and compliance action against approved providers, their workers and governing persons who fail to meet appropriate standards of behaviour. This will ensure that older Australians provided with care can have the confidence in the workforce and be safeguarded by regulatory arrangements. The bill extends the scope of the Serious Incident Response Scheme beyond residential care to home care and flexible care delivered in a home or community setting. This will improve oversight of providers and ensure the highest protections against incidents of abuse and neglect for all Commonwealth-supported aged care recipients, regardless of the setting in which they receive care. The amendments will also strengthen the governance of approved providers. The transparency and accountability of providers will be improved through more rigorous requirements for providers' governing bodies and by consumers having greater access to information about the operations of providers. The amendments will give older Australians and the community greater assurance that approved providers and their key personnel are suitable to be involved in delivering care. The bill will facilitate the sharing of information among relevant prescribed Commonwealth bodies about providers and workers across the care and support sector who may not be complying with their obligations. Improved information sharing between care and support sector regulators will enable proactive monitoring of cross-sector risks and better protection of consumers and participants from harm. The bill also includes amendments that enhance financial oversight, accountability and prudential regulation, which will ultimately protect the rights of older Australians, support continuity of services and enhance the viability of residential providers. Expanded functions of the Independent Health and Aged Care Pricing Authority to include the provision of advice on pricing and costing matters for health care, not just hospitals, and the provision of advice on aged care pricing matters will support transparency and evidence-based assessment of the costs involved in delivering care. The bill will enable the strengthening of safeguards for consumers in relation to the use of restrictive practices and the requirement for informed consent to be provided before they can be used. Specifically, the bill will enable the quality of care principles to clarify the existing term restrictive practices substitute decision maker and provide pathways for residential care providers to safely and legally obtain consent to the use of restrictive practices where the care recipients themselves cannot provide consent and where this may be otherwise prevented due to gaps in state and territory legislation. These amendments have been developed as a result of significant consultation with stakeholders as well as through the extensive consultation undertaken uh, during the Royal Commission. I thank again members, um, senators for their contributions to debate 
on this bill, and I commend uh, the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. Senator Rustin. No, I'm just going down. Sorry. Yes, I put the question on the second reading. All those of that opinion say aye. All those against, and declare it ayes have it. Ayes have it. I put the question of Senator Rustin second reading uh, amendment. All of those of that opinion say aye. All those against say nay. No. I declare the aye. ayes have it. No, no, no. Noes have it. Division. Please ring the bells for four minutes.
The question is, the second reading amendment moved by Senator Rushton be agreed to. Those of that opinion move to the right and those against to the left. And I point Senator Sidel as the and Senator Akart. The, res the result of the division is ayes 26, noes 34. The question is resolved in the negative. The Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment, Royal Commission Response Bill 2022. Call Senator Rustin. Oh, sorry, Senator Rice. Thank you. And I wish to move my second reading amendment as on sheet 1598. The question is that the amendment be um, agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Of those against, no. no. The ayes have it. The, the division required. Division required. Um, for ring the bells for one minute.
Dr Dawes. The second reading amendment by Senator Rice. Those of that opinion are moved to the right of the chair. Those opposed move to the left of the chair. Uh, will appoint tell us Senator Seidel and Senator McKim. Cadell, sorry. The result of the division is I 16, noes 29. The question is resolved in the negative. I call. The question now is that the bill be read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against say nay. I declare the ayes have it. Ayes have it. Minister. Clark, sorry. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to aged care, health and aged care pricing and information sharing in relation to veterans and military rehabilitation and compensation and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that we that the bill be taken as a whole? There being the no objection, is that so ordered? The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Rice. Thank you. Um, yes, look, I've just had some questions about the bill that I want to ask um, prior to 
then moving my amendment. Um, and the Australian Greens, you know, as indicated by our vote on the second reading um, question just then, we support this bill overall. We think that it's uh, important in includes some important steps forward in aged care um, in Australia. But we've got three areas of concern that I want to ask some questions about. One is about the availability of um, allied health in aged care, um, particularly physiotherapy under the new funding instrument, the, AN, the ANAC. The second is issues that we've got with the transparency of the findings of the Independent Pricing Authority. And the third area that I want to ask some questions about is about Schedule 9, about restrictive practices. So starting off with Allied Health, um, and I want to read out some of an email that I received on Friday from Alwyn Bays, who is the CEO and principal physiotherapist and the CEO of the Allied Aged Care Health Group, who presented to the Senate inquiry on the previous version of this bill um, under the previous government um, late last year. And what um, Mr Blaze said to me on Friday was that Labor is ignoring the concerns of Allied Health that they recognised in the Senate hearing on November 20, 2021. And sadly, all of those predictions I and others made about the future of Allied Health in our submission have come true. Residents are being claimed for pain treatments not even occurring, and I've got proof, and removed from treatment for economic reasons. Homes have cut hours of Allied Health all over the country and providers like us in regional areas are facing impending job losses. My team and I are doing our best to avoid and bring staff to work in other areas, but we want to stay in aged care. We can't, though, as providers are cutting our lists, not paying us and cancelling contracts using any flimsy excuse they can. And I can share detailed emails on this and that refer to ANAC as the reason. Um, and information from various providers and others um, helping homes read between the lines, lines that allied health isn't required, so cut it and use cheaper wellness and lifestyle instead, which, which risks unqualified staff treating frail people with hot packs and exercise. They aren't even insured or registered to do this. And Mr Blaze continues, this isn't even the top of the iceberg. 23,000 veterans in aged care won't be looked after. You should see the waffling and buck-passing answers I get from the Department of Health and Department of Veteran Affairs simply asking, would veterans be able to have treatment under the ANAC? So my question is, what are we going to be doing about these very serious concerns that allied health providers, particularly physiotherapists, have about this current bill? Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Temporary Deputy President. Thank you. I'm having trouble with. I'm going back to my assembly days. Um, thank you, Senator Rice, for the question about how Allied Health will operate under the new model, the ANAC model. Residential aged care providers are funded for and required to provide Allied Health services to residents in accordance with their obligations under the Aged Care Act. 1997 and the associated quality standards. The Australian National Aged Care Classification removes the inbuilt incentives that exist within the ACFI ACFI to deliver specific allied health treatments such as massages for pain management that are not necessarily the most clinically appropriate or effective approaches for some residents. This allows allied health professionals more freedom to provide the best targeted treatments that directly benefit the individual consistent with their individual care plan for example, treating pain through an exercise program. Existing ACFI funding, which includes funding for allied health care provision, will be rolled into the ANAC funding allocation. The 2021 Stuart Brown survey identified that providers currently spend approximately 4 per cent of their care funding on allied health, or approximately $400 million. Under ANAC, this equates to approximately $700 million of the care funding that will be provided in 2022-23. Furthermore, the 2021 Stuart from 2020 
2021 and moving to quarterly from 1 July 2022, more detailed expenditure information will be collected from aged care providers, including staffing costs and direct care hours delivered across a range of staffing types, including allied health. This will give visibility over the use of allied health services during and following the transition to ANAC, enabling government to respond as necessary. I hope that answers your question. Senator Rice. Um, thanks, Minister. Sadly, it doesn't, because it doesn't give certainty to the physiotherapists, as per Mr Blazer's concerns, are actually having their contracts cut as of now. And it's going to take some time before that, you know, we have that transparency to show that, in fact, you know, whether or not the physiotherapy is continuing to be provided. And the evidence, certainly, that was presented to our Senate committee and what Mr. Blaze has followed up with his email as of Friday, is that there are physiotherapy services that are being cut. So, I mean, what certainty can you give to physiotherapists and other allied health provi providers in the interim before we have that extra transparency information and before there may indeed be further modifications um, under the new aged care legislation that would make sure that all residents get the allied health services that they need? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Rice. I think the answer, and I, I did cover it in that earlier question, um, there will be some changes, but there's extra resourcing going in and extra flexibility, and decisions will be made on the needs of uh, particular residents or residents' individual needs. Um, so, I mean, if you're getting advice that providers are making decisions about what services will be offered, um, you know, I'm not in a position to to um, argue with that, but the position is, as outlined in my earlier answer, that there is additional resourcing going in and additional flexibility about how that resourcing is used to match the needs of individual residents, whether that be physiotherapy or some other type of allied health um, care that's required. But there, I, I don't think it's fair to say that resourcing would be reduced, um, but certainly changes may be made about the type of um, therapy or allied health care service that residents might receive based on their individual needs. Senator Rice. Look, I mean I certainly hope that you're correct, but certainly there is grave concern from the allied health sector um, as of now about the allied health services that residents in aged care facilities need not being provided. So at this stage, I mean I think you know we are, it is going to be a situation where we're waiting, I think I would have liked to have seen some more certainty being able to give, be given to these allied health providers, but it sounds like you were not able to, to give me that, that certainty. Um, I want to move on to my, some questions about, the, about Schedule 8, the Independent Pricing Authority. Um, one of, as we've just been talking about, talking about further transparency and further, you know, so that the information is on the table about what money is being spent on in the, the aged care sector. And one of your key election commitments was to increase transparency in the aged care sector. So what I want to know is why you haven't made it a requirement that the Independent Health and Aged Care Pricing Authority has to publish its findings rather than leaving it to the discretion of the government. Minister. Uh, thank you very much. And um, just to finish off in that final um, question in the area that you're asking about allied health, I would uh, say that um, you know, certainly from the government's point of view, we acknowledge that concerns have been raised and are actively engaging uh, with the sector and will continue to do so during the transition uh, to the new arrangements. Um, in relation to your question, Senator Rice, about the Independent Health and Aged Care Pricing Authority. Um, both of the aged care amendment bills currently before the parliament will contribute to increase transparency in the aged care sector. The provisions in this bill ensure that the parliament and the public will have visibility of the work of the Independent Health and Aged Care Pricing Authority. The pricing authority will independently and transparently advise on aged care pricing, supporting the transparent and evidence-based assessment of the costs of delivering aged care to older Australians. Schedule 8 of the bill specifically provides for the pricing authority to report annually to the parliament its health care costing and pricing advice. This is not discretionary, and that advice will also be the result of an extensive annual uh, public consultation and fact-finding process. These arrangements will enhance community confidence in aged care and the funding allocated to aged care and the government remains accountable to the community for the expenditure of resources across health services, including 
aged care services. As a result, having considered the pricing authority's advice, the government will continue to determine aged care prices through a legislative instrument. Senator Rice. And I'm, thank you. And I'm sorry I got distracted with sorting out our logistics here. I mean, in terms of then, you're saying that yes, the government will retain that decision-making process, but why won't, as part of that, you commit to actually publishing the findings of the Independent Health and Aged Care Pricing Authority? I mean, will you commit to making the pricing authority's findings public? Minister? Um, yeah, I did say that earlier in my comments, that it would be um, tabled annually or reported annually to the parliament. Senator Rice. Thank you. I'm sorry I missed that in amongst all of the things going on here. Okay, then I want to move on to um, Schedule 9, res Restrictive Practices, which is sort of one of the biggest areas of concern that many um, advocacy groups have raised with me and the concerns with Schedule 9, both about the hierarchy of decision makers in order to authorise restrictive practices and then the immunity from prosecution. I mean, as we know, um, the issue of restrictive practices was a massive issue that was covered in the Royal Commission, the use of physical and chemical restraints, and the Royal Commission made some very strong recommendations about reducing the um, amount of restrictive practices. We also have evidence since the Royal Commission is that, in fact, the use of restrictive practices has not decreased. The data has shown that there has it's continued to be unacceptably high use of physical and chemical restraints. Um, I've been certainly having quite a lot of communication with the minister's office about um, this Schedule 9 um, and about the, who gets to decide whether restrictive practices um, are going to be put in place. And as I understand it, there is going to be you know, subordinate legislation that will be put in place that will outline um, that hierarchy of decision makers and quality of care principles. So my question first is, when are you, we are discussing this legislation now, but it is not those quality of care principles and the hierarchy of subordinate decision makers is not yet public. So I want to know when are you going to make public? those quality of care principles and the hierarchy of subordinate decision makers. Minister. Thank you. I'm just getting some wise counsel before I jump to my feet. Thank you, um, Madam Temporary Deputy President. Um, so, on the quality of care principles, um, an exposure draft of the amendments to the quality of care principles is expected to be made pu um, publicly available imminently, so very soon. Um, publication is intended to assist with sector preparedness and is also aimed to alleviate any concerns regarding the proposed immunity provision, as it will confirm how the immunity is proposed to be limited. And in relation to the hierarchy, of subordinate decision makers in the quality of care principles, um, and the answer there is the same, that it will be um, released in very soon. Um, and I can talk a bit about the, the um, hierarchy of subordinate decision makers if you want, but the answer to, to your question is very soon. Senator Rice. Um, if you were able to share some more information um, for, about the hierarchy of decision makers, that would be helpful. Minister. I, I led led into that one. Um, <laughs> so I'm not sure I'm going to tell you anything that you might not be already aware of, but um, here's, a, here's let me have a crack. Where an individual cannot provide informed consent to restrictive practices, it's considered that the person who knows the person best be identified as someone to consent to this specialised care of their loved one. The amendments in Schedule 9 create a pathway for the quality of care principles contained in subordinate legislation to establish a hierarchy of substitute decision makers from a person's partner to family and friends with a close connection to the person. It will also be possible for the person where they have capacity to nominate a person to take on the role of substitute decision maker for restrictive practices in the event that they uh, lose capacity. But I understand you have had a briefing, Senator Rice, so um, that's probably more information for the chamber rather than for you. 
sent to us. And, uh, yes, and I think it is important for information to the chamber and all of the advocates and organisations who are listening who are very concerned about this. And yes, and given the briefing, and I'm willing to put on hold our concerns about how that hierarchy works. Initially, I was proposing to amend the legislation to remove all of Schedule 9, and I have um, changed from that to now um, only be addressing the area that I want to go on to now, and that's okay. We've got these hierarchy of we've got the quality of care principles, we've got the hierarchy of decision makers, but then if aged care providers you know, have followed all of this, they are then given immunity from prosecution if anything um, of, if, if things go wrong and if harm is still caused, despite having gone through the quality of care principles and uh, complied with those and gone through the, the hierarchy of decision makers. And I want to know first what the rationale is around the immunity from prosecution. Again, in briefings, it's been very unclear and no one seems to have a good idea as to how many cases you'd be talking about, you know, the significance of offering immunity from prosecution. But offering immunity from prosecution is a really significant stripping away of rights. It's not something that should be done um, lightly at all. And I have yet to be given any evidence that this is needed. And in particular, I um, note the comments from the, the Parliamentary Joint um, Committee on Human Rights in their comments on this bill earlier this year, where they said that any limitation on the right must be shown to be aimed at achieving a legitimate objective. A legitimate objective is one that's necessary and addresses an issue of public or social concern that's pressing and substantial enough to warrant limiting the rights in question. While addressing gaps in legislation and ensuring consistency in consent arrangements would appear to be an important aim, it is not clear that the measure addresses a pressing and substantial concern as required to constitute a legitimate objective for the purposes of international human rights law. It is not clear why providing a blanket immunity is necessary, um, noting that seeking an outcome regard, required, uh, regarded as desirable or convenient, such as alleviating fears of prosecution, is in and of itself unlikely to be sufficient to constitute a legitimate objective, and that furthermore, by depriving care recipients who are deemed to lack capacity the ability to pursue a remedy for any violation of their human rights arising from the use of restrictive practices, the measure has implications on the right to an effective um, remedy. And by granting immunity from any civil and criminal liability, care recipients who are denied legal capacity do not appear to have access to an effective remedy for any violation of their rights arising from the use of a restrictive practice against them. So, I mean, what is the rationale for taking this, what's basically a sledgehammer, using this immunity from prosecution in these circumstances? Minister, uh, thank you very much. And I would say it's it is not it's not correct to say it's a, a blanket immunity that is um, given in this area. If aged care workers have utilised restrictive practices where they are unnecessary, they will not be protected from prosecution. This has been widely misunderstood and misrepresented. The immunity provision does not give general immunity where restrictive practices are used. It only protects people where all of the strong legal requirements around using restrictive practices are strictly followed. Schedule 9 of the bill has to be viewed in the context of the whole scheme that governs the use of restrictive practices in aged care. It is a temporary it, it is as a temporary measure included in the bill to clarify requirements in relation to the consent to the use of restrictive practices until the matter can be revisited as part of the new Aged Care Act in 2023. It addresses a gap between Commonwealth legislation and state and territory guardianship and consent laws, a gap which has the potential to prevent restrictive practices being authorised, even when required to prevent harm to aged care residents. So without it, harm to old care, older Australians uh, could occur. The bill authorises new persons and bodies to consent to restrictive practices who would not otherwise be authorised under state and territory law. It also includes an immunity provision to cover these circumstances. But immunity from civil or criminal liability only applies where consent is provided by an authorised person and these practices are used consistently with the principles, that is, where restrictive practices are used as a last resort and only to the extent that is necessary for the shortest time and in the least restrictive form and to prevent harm to the care recipient. 
Where there are state and territory laws on restrictive practices, that legislation also still applies. Senator Rice. Thanks, Minister. And look, I mean, a lot of what you read out there, what, in terms of addressing the gap, is covered in the first part of Schedule Nine, and doesn't address why you need to have the immunity from prosecution. It's the quality of care principles and the hierarchy of decision making that, yes, that sets out covering the gap that's not currently covered in state and territory laws. But once again, that's not giving me a rationale as to why that. Okay, after all of these processes are followed, it is still possible that harm has been done. It's still possible that you know, the boxes have been ticked, but you know, determination of what is necessary um, is, you know, quest may be questionable, and that there, there could be a case where people say that, okay, you've ticked all the boxes, but still harm has been done from use of restrictive practices. And the Australian Law Alliance today in a media statement called upon us in the Senate to remove this clause from the bill, um, saying that, like the rest of the community, aged care residents must retain the right to seek justice for a wrongdoing. The current aged care bill includes a clause that will unfairly strip legal rights away from aged care residents in situations involving the use of restrictive practices. It was not a recommendation of the Royal Commission nor of the Commonwealth in its response to the Royal Commission's recommendation. And that immunity removes the basic legal and human rights of residents, which has serious and unprecedented social, legal, policy and human rights consequences. Um, providing one sector of the business community with immunity from criminal charges, which can result in penalties of up to 10 years imprisonment and civil claims in return for compliance with regulations made under an act of parliament, signals a new and serious blow to upholding the rule of law. Offering immunity to commercial businesses is unprecedented. Many aged care providers are for-profit and some are publicly listed companies. Again, I'd like you to go to what's the rationale as to why having immunity from prosecution was necessary. I mean, once you've got all of these guidelines and hierarchy in place and you're requiring the aged care providers to go through you know, making sure that they've done all of their due diligence on why restrictive practices are needed, Okay, we can accept that, but why, once that has occurred, why does somebody, having gone through that, need to have immunity from prosecution? Minister, uh, thank you. I, well, I would say that um, this is being used in this bill to, as I said, to clarify requirements about, uh, in relation to consent to use restrictive practices, and it will be further looked at in the Aged Care Act. Um, in terms of the rights and protections for um, aged care residents themselves. That's where the quality of care and the hierarchy um, document, hierarchy of decision. Sorry, I'm looking for the correct language. But where those two um, principles and um, provide the protection uh, for aged care residents. But I think you do have to accept that in the event that you have met all of the requirements um, through the processes outlined earlier in this debate that, and restrictive um, practices are required, that when you have followed all of those things, you have done the right thing, you've followed the law, um, that you know, certainly for those involved in those decisions and the people providing care, um, you know, why should they be prosecuted after they've you know, followed Essentially, the law that's been put in place to, to you know, um, oversight these arrangements, um, so that, you know, if if they're not used properly, and if it's not used in the way that um, you know the the legislation provides, so if restrictive practices are used where unnecessary or they haven't followed the correct procedure, they will not be protected from prosecution. But in the event that they have and then had to make that decision, then there is an argument, a strong argument, to protect them from prosecution for the, the act that they've had to do in relation to keeping people safe in a facility. Senator Rice. Um, thanks, Minister. I mean, you say there's a strong argument. That's not what the, the Joint Committee on Human Rights felt. They felt that um, granting immunity you know, from any civil or criminal liability care recipients who are denied legal capacity do not appear to have access to an effective remedy for any violation of their rights. Basically, immunity from prosecution is such a significant thing that it seems to me that it's not needed in this case. That, you know, if, 
Indeed, if, if aged care providers had followed all of the um, provisions that they need to, well, then they're not going to be prosecuted. Um, why do you need to have immunity from prosecution? The, I mean, the Australian Law Alliance, in their um, media release today, went on to suggest that a possible solution is the offer of an, an indemnity rather than, than an immunity. Such a solution will be workable based on the history of claims arising from unlawful restrictive practices in aged care. The number of recorded cases over the past 25 years is probably as little as half a dozen, and not all were successful for the complainant. And he, he notes that there are previous examples of such indemnity schemes, most recently the indemnity scheme offered by the former federal government for health practitioners who may be found liable to pay compensation for serious adverse effects suffered by people receiving COVID-19 vaccines. Um, I mean, has there been any consideration to you know, step back from this um, offering this is immunity to introducing an indemnity scheme rather than immunity from prosecution? Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, well, a couple of things there in response. One, I would say that uh, to um, the stakeholders that are arguing for that change, that I'm sure that that can be put and argued in, in relation to uh, the New Aged Care Act in 2023, if they believe that is a superior way of doing this. I would say that this only applies where it is inconsistent with state and territory um, laws. Uh, so again, that narrows it. And again, it's not just a blanket free from prosecution um, arrangements. It's, it's where all of the necessary steps of the uh, quality of care and the hierarchy of substitute decision makers, where all of that has been followed. This is something that I'm advised the Council on, on the Ageing um, agrees with. And for anyone who has worked in aged care, um, you know, and I've, I've certainly spent some time in aged care in the last, you know, about three years ago. Um, you know that you do have to have clear arrangements in place around how these arrangements are used. But there are times when these arrangements do need to be used. They need to be used carefully and in accordance with the law. But where that happens. Um, it is reasonable for the staff involved making those very, very difficult decisions in very stressful circumstances to also be given um, appropriate protection for the decisions that are made when they have a f a followed all of the other requirements of the law. And that's the position the government's come to. Whether there's further discussion from stakeholders around how, how they believe that can be better managed, I'm sure that that minister will be very open to those discussions in relation to the Aged Care Act. Uh, that will be introduced next year. Senator Ross. Thanks, Minister. And yes, and, and you know we agree with you that there are you know there are some very important steps that need to be st stepped through. And you know as I said, we accept that there are you know you're putting in place the quality of care principles, putting in place uh, that, that hierarchy of decision makers where there aren't state and territory legislation, and accepting that. But I think there, what I want to put on the record is, in fact, there is a significant um, divergence of opinion from stakeholders, and I have had many stakeholders come to me deeply concerned. I've had the Law Council um, brief me about how significant it is to, apply, to put in place an immunity from prosecution. Um, they were un, unwilling to say whether it was something that they would come out strongly against because they weren't sure as to just how many cases would, it would apply to. Nothing that they said to me, nothing that you have said to me today has given me any reason as to why we should be putting in place an immunity pr for prosecution. That from a human rights-centred approach to aged care, it does not seem to be the appropriate thing to do to be taking away the human rights of aged care residents, even if it is only in a very small number of cases, and even if it is only in you know, circumstances that are exceptional, where guidelines and, and hierarchy of decision makers have been followed, and that you know, determination that somebody has made the determination that's necessary, um, 
we want to actually still maintain the possibility for people who feel that, despite that determination that it was necessary has been put in place, that harm has been done, and to give people the opportunity to be able to have their human rights upheld by um, allowing uh, uh, um, a case to be, to be taken against them. And that, yes, some of the sector support this, many others in the sector don't. And I really I go back to the findings of the, the Joint Committee on Human Rights that basically pointed out to us the significance and the seriousness, which does not seem to be justified. And I've heard no arguments tonight as to why it's justified, as to why we should be removing, um, why we should be giving providers an immunity from prosecution, even if it's only in these particular, you know, tightly controlled circumstances. Um, and with that, I think I may as well move my amendment, which oh, is. Sorry. Oh. Are you. Okay. Yep. Um, okay. okay. Um, so, Senator Russell. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, this bill that's currently before us almost directly replicates the bill that was in the parliament um, by the previous government, um, which was voted on. Uh, nearly six months ago, uh, and can I um, say that you know, as as part of that, obviously um, the previous government was was very keen to to make sure that the provisions that were contained in this bill um, were implemented as soon as possible, because we understood the extraordinary importance of those uh, these amendments to the aged care sector, and obviously to older Australians who rely um, on aged care. Um, in that bill um, at the time, an amendment was moved by then Senator Rex Patrick uh, that required for uh, the provision of 24/7 um, uh, nurse on site in all aged care um, facilities um, from the 1st of October 2022. Uh, so I'm keen to understand. Um, in saying that, you know, obviously we, we want to make sure that we move to um, a position where um, we are supporting our aged care facilities and our older Australians um, in a, a, a consistent, responsible, and timely manner. Why this particular bill, which you sought to amend in uh, in March to contain 24/7 uh, nursing care by October 2022, does not contain that particular provision? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank Senator uh, Rustin for the question. Well, as um, the senator knows, that was um, an amendment by Senator, the former Senator Patrick. Um, we certainly supported the provision of nursing, 24-hour, uh, 24/7 nursing care in aged care, but Labor's policy in, and the government's policy, which will be implemented, was to have. Um, those arrangements put in place from the 1st of July 2023. Um, I would also acknowledge that the bill, as amended, really got stuck because the government wouldn't bring it on in the House for debate in the previous uh, Parliament. Um, but that was not. Uh, we supported 24/7, but our election policy was clear that it was 1st of July 2023, and that's what we'll deliver. Senator Russell. Uh, yeah, so I'm just seeking clarification as to what was the the basis um, and the rationale behind the decision to move from a uh, position in, on the 30th of March of 24/7 by the 1st of October 2022 to the um, policy decision that was reported a couple of days later that said that it would be the 1st of July 2023. Minister, uh, thank you. Uh, well, as I can't um, speak for why the the government, the former government, didn't bring the bill on for debate in the House, which would have um, dealt with that amended bill. Uh, but I can tell you that we were keen to support 24-7 nursing care in aged care, which is why we supported that amendment. But our policy and our costings and all of the debate we had in the lead up to the election was very clear that our policy would start on the 1st of July 2023. Senator Russell. Uh, look, thank you. Um, and you know, the the government too is uh, is very keen to make sure that we see 24/7 um, nursing care, along with all of the other provisions of the Royal Commission, uh, in place, uh, and and certainly been keen to work with those provisions as a holistic package um, of reforms um, and in response to the Royal Commission. But um, can I just say, I mean, I'll give you another opportunity to answer it. I, I wasn't talking about 
our position. I was saying you voted to support 24-7 uh, nurses on the 1st of October 2022. You've subsequently, within a matter of 48 hours, changed that position to the 1st of Ju uh, July 2023. I'm just keen to understand what was uh, the, 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 the um, advice that made you change your mind from it being the 1st of October 2022 to the 1st of July 2023. Minister. Uh, thank you. And it's, I feel, it does feel a bit like we are um, relitigating debates from previous parliaments and prior to the election. Um, um, and it's not really. I, I accept that the committee stage does allow for wide-ranging debate, but it's not really relevant. The question um, Senator Russell puts isn't really relevant to the bill that we are debating right now in committee. Um, so I think it's best to say Labor policy, the government's policy, 1st of July. 2023. That's what we costed. That was the policy agreed by the uh, Labor caucus. That's the policy we will implement, um, and you will see it in a bill uh, that comes before the parliament shortly. Senator Rustin. Mm. Thank you. Well, I will reserve my questions to the next bill that comes through, where it um, is absolutely relevant to that bill. Um, <laughs> so, can you confirm that this bill? Um, is actually going to use the ANAC model as the mechanism, uh, the mechanism to transition to um, the uh, Aged Care Royal Commission requirement for 16 7 um, age, uh, nurses in aged care, 200 minutes of care, of which 40 minutes of care is, um, is uh, registered nurse care? Minister. Okay, sorry, Senator Rustin. I was just getting some expert advice there. My my, <laughs> my understanding is that it will be dealt with um, by subordinate legislation under the existing Aged Care Act. That there is already the ability to do that. Senator Rustin, are you in a position to be able to advise the chamber when this subordinate legislation is likely to come forward? Uh, the reason I ask this is that. Um, the, the, the sector has, um, has an expectation or previously had an expectation formed that they would be starting to receive the, the change in the ANAC funding from the 1st of October 2022, which included the funding for a 12-month period for transition. Uh, we're now sitting here on the 2nd of August 2022, uh, so I'm just seeking to get an understanding of when this support legislation will be brought forward in order for um, the funding provisions that the sector is expecting to be able to be put in place. Minister. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I'm advised that it will be made in coming one, months and ahead of uh, the 1st of July 2023, so to allow the transition to occur. Senator Russell. Um, can I just seek some clarification? My understanding um, and your advisers may be in a better position was that there was going to be funding made available through the ANAC model for the transition to um, 16 hours a day, seven days a week, 200 minutes of care, including 40 minutes of registered nurse care, uh, that those um, transitional funding arrangements were going to be made available from the 1st of October 2022 to enable them to be in a position to have that particular um, provision in place by the 1st of uh, October 2023. I'm keen to understand what the funding arrangements from this um, ANAC amendment that we're putting in place, how that relates to uh, the provision of that transition funding that the sector is expecting. Minister. The answer is yes, and I understand you advised that today. Is that correct? Um, hang on, through the chair, Senator Rustin. I'm not quite sure I am understanding because you, uh, the previous answer to a question was that it was going to be contained in subordinate legislation uh, in relation to these provisions. What I'm seeking to understand is, well, to put it bluntly, will the sector be receiving the additional funding that has provided for under the ANAC model to enable them to be able to get into a position to transition by 2023, October 2023, in relation to these? Is that funding going to start to flow from the 1st of October 2022? Yes. Sir. Yes. 
Senator Rustin. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, could you um, could you advise whether where this funding currently is located, and whether it's exactly the same amount of funding that was provided for by under the previous government in the 21 budget? Minister. Yep. Uh, sorry, Senator Rustin. Um, I think you had two parts to your question, but one of them was, um, is the where is the funding? I think you said, um, and is it the same as what was provided under the former government? And the answer to that is yes, it is there as as you had allocated in 2022-23 budget. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you. Um, so um, currently, um, so in the in the um, previous legislation, um, there were. Uh, a series of exemptions that were able to be considered. I'm just interested for you to flesh out for me what exemptions um, for um, aged care providers or facilities um, are contained uh, within this legislation that would enable them uh, a, a, a facility to be able to seek an exemption if they were unable by 2023 to meet the requirements that are required by this, this particular model. Minister. Senator Rustin, are you, are you asking about exemptions for the 24-7 nursing care? No, I didn't think so. Could you just uh, repeat what you were the exemptions I think you were seeking under the previous Senator exemptions Rustin. that relate to the um, the 16 hours a day? Because I mean, it, you, I mean, you don't even have the subordinate legislation in place, so I'm just wondering whether are you seeking to bring an exemption schedule in? With the subordinate legislation as it relates to um, the, these arrangements for for Anna? Minister. Sorry, Senator Rustin. I am trying to be as helpful as I can. My understanding is no, there are no exemptions, and nor were there exemptions under uh, your proposal either. Senator Rustin. Okay. So. Um, so, in the in the absence of the the subordinate legislation, um, we which we have no timeline on. So, I'm not talking about the subordinate legislation as it relates to the second bill. I'm talking to the subordinate legislation that require that that, that speaks to to this bill. Um, yep, yep. So, how long before the requirement for aged care providers to, to, to be in compliance with the conditions that they need to be in compliance with in order to meet their funding um, agreements for ANAC, will they see the subordinate legislation? Minister. Uh, thank you. I am advised well in advance so that they will have enough time to see that before um, the new requirements come in. Senator Russell. Okay. Um, just on a couple of specifics before we move on to allow Senator Rice to find out the outcome of her amendment. Um, in this bill, you've removed the requirements for worker screening regulations. Uh, I'm just keen to understand who you consulted with on the removal of those regulations. Minister. Thank you. Um, the Royal Commission response bill does not include the worker screening arrangements proposed in Schedule 2 to the previous government's bill. This is not, however, because we are shying away from ensuring that aged care workers meet professional standards and do not engage in inappropriate conduct. Um, to the contrary, the government is committed to implementing a much more comprehensive and robust national registration scheme for personal care workers that is consistent with recommendations Recommendation 77 of the Royal Commission, as well as the Code of Conduct, which is implemented through this bill. This scheme will include ongoing training, English proficiency and criminal history screening to further professionalise the aged care workforce. The government um, is currently exploring options on the best way to implement this scheme to ensure it's robust, operationally effective and above all designed to ensure maximum protection for older Australians receiving care. As a result, former Schedule 2 has been removed from the Royal Commission response bill in the interim so that sufficient care and attention can be given to designing the new scheme which will be delivered as part of the new Aged Care Act. 
In practice, these measures will also not be delayed as, as while the previous arrangements would have established an aged care screening database for workers and governing persons. I note that the time frame for commencement was within 24 months following the royal assent of the bill. In the meantime, the usual criminal history checks for workers will also continue to be required. Senator Rustin. Um, so thank you, Senator Gallagher. So on that basis, um, given um, that you are now seeking for the registration provisions to be contained in the new aged care bill, um, can you give a guarantee um, that these um, provisions, these protections, these really important protection provisions um, for older Australians in aged care uh, will not be delayed at all? as a result of the decision not to include them in this legislation? Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, as I said, I mean, the provisions that the previous government had in place was for um, the um, screening database for workers um, with a time frame to roll in for two years, of two years following royal assent. Um, I think uh, as we are determined to strengthen and build on those provisions, um, we would be putting them in place as soon as possible and before within that time frame, in line with, yeah, through the new Aged Care Act. Can I just get a confirmation? So you, Senator Gallagher, on behalf of the, the minister, are saying that the provisions, the, the, the worker registration provisions, will be in place. Um, before they would have been in place had they been contained in this bill, which obviously would have been two years from the royal assent of this bill, bearing in mind this bill could have well been in place six months ago, which means it would only be 18 months. But, but nonetheless, um, can you guarantee that they will be in place by then? And the other thing is, in my previous question, I asked you around who you'd consulted with, and you didn't answer that part of the question. Minister. Uh, thank you. My understanding is the minister uh, consulted with the provider's body, which supports this approach, and the intention is to have it in place um, within that time frame. Minister Russell, uh, could you also advise Sorry. whether the minister consulted um, with the, the workers' union around this, and if so, what was that advice? Minister. Um, my understanding is this was an, an election commitment by the government as well. I'm not sh I'm, so I'm sure that the minister, um, or the shadow minister at the time, uh, consulted widely in the formulation of Labor's election policy. I'm, I have no doubt that um, the shadow minister would have spoken to a lot of people in finalising Labor's policy. Senator Rustin. Okay. Um, thank you. So, on that basis, um, could you advise when the new Aged Care Act will be introduced? Minister. Uh, my advice is it will be introduced next year, 2023. Senator Russell. And, and obviously, um, on the basis of your previous um, statements, you will guarantee that the worker screening provisions and regulations will be included in that Act when it's introduced? Minister. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. Thank you, <laughs> Senator Russell. Um, okay. So just uh, um, just quickly on the the, um, the Aboriginal controlled um, organisation providers, um, how many um, uh, ACO aged care providers will um, are currently eligible for the exemption under the um, forty member or four board member current exemption provision? Minister. How many? Um, I'll just see if we've got that information for you, Senator. Um, approximately 40, I am advised. Senator Russell. So could you then advise how many additional ACOs will be now become eligible by the expansion of the provision for this exemption um, to uh, ACOs? Minister. That 40 figure includes that, Senator Rustin. I'm advised. Senator Rustin. Could I take you back a step then and ask you how many were, were provided for under the original exemption 
and how many additional ones will be provided under the new exemption. So how many people have actually been collected by the new exemption that wouldn't have been covered by the old one? Minister. I'm sorry, I, I don't think um, we have that information to hand, Senator Rustin. Um, I can see what we can provide if there is any, any further update whilst you go on with your questioning, but um, I don't, at the moment we don't have that information. I'll see if I can get a more comprehensive answer. Senator Rustin. Uh, on that basis, you may not be able to answer this one either, but I'd just be keen to understand what was the advice that you received that led you to make the decision um, to expand the, the provision in relation to this particular exemption and who did you consult with um, in the process of, of making this change in uh, policy that's included in this particular bill? Minister. Okay. Um, uh, two parts to that. Um, there were concerns about requirements for independence on the board is uh, one of them. I think you asked me who else did you ask me who was consulted? Um, the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation, so NACHO, National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Aging and Aged Care Council, Consumer and Provider Sector Reference Groups, Council on the Aging Older Persons Advocacy Network and Office of the Registrar of Indigenous Corporations were consulted on the, throughout the process of drafting uh, these provisions. Senator Russell. And um, uh, could you provide advice as to whether um, all of those organisations supported the expansion of this particular measure? Minister. Uh, my advice is that yes, they did. Senator Russell. And Final question for me. Um, were any um, ACO providers sanctioned by the regulator in the last 12 months? Oh, 12 months. Minister. I think we might have to take that on notice, Senator Rustin. Um, yeah, I think we don't have that advice, but I am happy to provide that to you when I get it. Thank you. Back to you, Senator Ross. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, I want to move my amendment, Amendment Number One, on Sheet One Five Nine Three. And, uh, yes, I'll proper process here, but um, just it, there is no divisions You're between correct. until seven thirty. So I don't know whether you want to keep talking for a while. You or? could. Uh, so yes, the option is to keep going for a few minutes. Otherwise, we will have to defer. I think the. Just, I'll just get you to hold while I just confer with the clerk. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Yes, yeah, so we, we can just keep talking for the next uh, three, four minutes, uh, if it, but we're in the hands of the Senate. What you'd like to do? Senator, Senator Roberts, you'd like to— Would I be able to move my amendment? Yeah. No, I don't need to. It's been debated so much. Perhaps if you just ask a question, uh, Senator Roberts. Minister, why are there no provisions for registered nurses compulsorily to be at the in attendance? Minister. Um, thank you, and I thank Senator Roberts uh, for helping us keep this discussion going. Um, it's because they <laughs> will be in the next uh, bill. So we'll be bringing them back um, in the next bill to deliver on the election commitment we took to implement 24-7 uh, nursing care and residential aged care from the 1st of July 2023. Senator Roberts. Senator Rustin touched on this topic, I know, um, but why wait so long? If you think it's needed, why not get on with the job? Minister. Um, thank you. Um, because well, the bill is currently in the House, but uh, my understanding is um, last week the Senate resolved to refer it to a committee uh, for a short inquiry. So that is also 
means we have to go through that process before it can come here. But the commitment is clear. Um, the election commitment that we made about having 24-7 nursing care in aged care is a really important one. Um, it will be funded in the budget um, due to commence on the 1st of July 2023, which means there is enough time uh, to ensure that it's dealt with through the bill that's currently before the House, on its way to a Senate committee and then in here for debate. Uh, sorry, Senator Roberts, your microphone wasn't on. Uh, Minister, how long are you expecting it to be in the House? Twelve months? No, in fact, I think it's due in the Senate committee on, yes, uh, for a report by the 31st of August. So it's due, the Senate committee is due to report on it uh, back to, he, to Senate by the 31st of August, which would allow for um, you know, debate following that um, this, this side of Christmas. Senator Roberts. With the date forward then, Minister, from July to February. Minister. Well, I think anyone would understand that you need time to recruit um, nurses into residential aged care. Um, the budget costs or the costings we did for our um, election commitment also had the money flowing from the 1st of July 2023 if we moved it forward. Um, well, I think there would be issues about implementation, for, for sure, uh, but also um, you know, we haven't accounted for that in our figures um, that we presented to the election. So, I mean, the Prime Minister has repeatedly said we're going to do what we said we'd do before. Um, you know, what we said we'd do in the election campaign is what we're going to do in government. That commitment was for registered nurses 24-7 in residential aged care from the 1st of July 2023. The budget um, will um, have that commitment um, contained in it. Um, the legislation can pass here whenever the Senate's ready to deal with it, post to the committee inquiry. Uh, providers will have enough time to implement the or to recruit uh, nurses into residential aged care and the funding will flow from the first of July. Senator Roberts. When we thank you Minister, when we um, set a date on our, uh, on our amendment for February we, were, we used one of our advisers who has experience, extensive experience in the health sector um, and in the public service, and he suggested that February would be entirely appropriate. So why, why stall it beyond February? Another February would be practical date for, for our aged care facilities to be able to recruit registered nurses. Minister. Um, well, I accept that's the advice that um, one Nation has got from, from their advisers, but our election commitment was from the 1st of July. It's a big change um, to uh, implement across the aged care system, important one, um, but we want to get it right, and our commitment was uh, to have it start from 1st of July 2023, and that's what the legislation, once it's got through the Senate uh, committee, will provide for. Senator Roberts. Our advisers at the moment, Minister, uh, we rely on them very much. And yet, uh, Mr. Albanese, without any consultation initially, uh, wiped 50%, wiped 75% of our advisers, and now we have 25% uh, back. So we have 50% gone in in a matter of a few weeks. Uh, and, and this particular advisor has been very helpful to us. He could be one of the ones facing sack. So is that what the government is trying to do? Just limit our advisers? Minister? No, um, not at all. I mean, they decisions uh, for Senator Roberts uh, to make about his advisers. I have no doubt every advisor, not sure it's relevant to this legislation, but every, all advisers right across the show, across the Senate, work very hard. I accept that and we rely on them heavily and I thank them all for their work. Uh, Senator Rice. Okay, I've got one last question on this amendment, um, on Senator Roberts' amendment, which hasn't been moved yet. Um, Labor in opposition at the bill at the end of last year joined um, Senator Rex Patrick, joined the Greens in supporting his amendment in to get registered nurses 24-7 in aged care from October this year. I know this is the question that Senator Ruskin was asking about before as to what's changed since then. I'm certainly quite partial to the idea that actually getting registered nurses in aged care by February is better than by July, given that you know it's a something that we all now accept is really important. So I want to know, you know, why 
given that we're in July now, if this bill comes back, um, you know, we could pass this now. It would give aged care providers some, you know, eight months to be recruiting. I don't see why we need to wait until July to get registered nurses 24/7 in aged care, as per the second piece of legislation that the government is proposing to introduce. Minister. Um, thank you, and I thank uh, Senator Rice for the question. I, I mean, I think I've answered it. Um, Labor's policy, which we took to the campaign, was for to implement this commitment from the 1st of July 2023. Um, that was the commitment we've made. The Prime Minister's made it clear we're going to do what we said we'd do. We're going to implement our election commitments. Now, I accept that others have. Um, different positions and different policies that they may have taken to the election, uh, but we're going to implement the one we took, which is 1st of July. It does allow uh, for this significant change to occur through the budget, um, but also deal with some of the implementation um, issues around that and also some of the workforce challenges um, and working with providers to make sure the arrangements are in place uh, from the 1st of July. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Okay, now that we're after 7.30, I will now move my amendment, um, amendment number one on sheet 1593 um, regarding the immunity from prosecution. As just to, to recap, given that I didn't receive any good rationale to me as to why immunity from prosecution for um, restrictive practices after they've gone through all of the various um, hoops and balances. Yep. Let's you know, make sure that um, the provisions are, uh, are appropriate, but at the end of the day, there does not seem to be any justification for um, giving immunity from prosecution to providers for, um, uh, for those circumstances. So my amendment would remove um, the second half of Schedule 9. So I wish to move that now. Thank you. So the question before us is that items three and four of Schedule Nine stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Oh, sorry, those that... Hang on. Sorry, one moment. Okay. So just to just to be clear to the Chamber that if you support retaining these items in the bill, you vote yes. If you are obviously the opposite, uh, you vote no. So do I need to put the question again? Yes. Uh, all those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I believe the ayes have it. No. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bell for four minutes.
uh, lock the doors. The question is that items three and four of Schedule 9 stand as printed. The eyes will move to the right of the chair and the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Pratt, teller for the eyes, and Senator McKim as teller for the nose. I'll, I'll be voting. Yes. No. Okay. Sorry, what was that? Thirty. What should say? 30. The result of the division is eyes thirty-five, noes fifteen. The question is resolved in the affirmative. Thank you, senators. I believe Senator Roberts seeking the call to move him amendment. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I have tabled an amendment to the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment, Royal Commission Response Bill 2022. Senator Rex Patrick first moved this amendment, and I acknowledge and appreciate his work. Our bill, our amendment, directly contributes to improved safety and quality for our respected seniors in aged care facilities. It provides for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, nursing support on site from a registered nurse. So many problems were identified in the Royal Commission's report. This amendment addresses a significant gap in care and response times that will help to alleviate the concerns of many aged care residents and their families. We recognise that remote and regional areas have problems in attracting and retaining a skilled workforce. Accordingly, we have provided for exemptions subject to reasonable conditions. So I commend this amendment to you. No one else willing to seek in the call? Okay, so I will the motion, uh, the amendment, sorry. Uh, and the question is that the amendments be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Roberts for the ayes and Senator Scar for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 18, noes 33.
Therefore, the question is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. Those against? The ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. The ayes have it. I stand. The committee has considered the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Royal Commission Response Bill 2022 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. Thank you very much. I move that the report from the committee be adopted. The question is that that motion be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Against? The ayes have it. Minister. Uh, thank you. I move that further consideration of the bill be in order of the day for the next day of sitting. The question is that motion be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against? Ayes have it. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks, uh, Senators. I now move that the Senate now adjourn. Uh, I need to call it first. <laughs> I need to call it first, Senators. Uh, all those in favour say aye. aye. Against? We oh, we must adjourn first. My apologies, Senators. It's been a, it's been a long break in between. Okay. Uh, who is seeking the call? Senator Billick. Thank you. Um, so tonight I'm continuing my very personal condolence motion to an amazing Australian and amazing Tasmanian, Deborah Hocking. And as I've stated, I knew Deb for about 50 years, so there's lots of stories. And I'd edited and edited and edited my notes last week. Senator, Senator Billick, I might just, just call the chamber. Folks, Senators, uh, if you can please either speak very softly or leave the chamber so that the Senator can be heard. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I started this speech in Senator's statements last week, and I digress so much because memories just flooded back to me. Um, as you can imagine, over 50 years there's lots of memories, and um, I ran out of time, so I just want to continue today. So I just wanted to reiterate why I think Deborah Hocking was such an amazing woman. She was a child of the stolen generation and suffered physical and sexual abuse by members of a foster family. She didn't tell us when we were at school about a horrible life outside school. She didn't tell us until we were adults. A school was her safe place and she'd put literally a boundary around school and being safe and didn't want to discuss it. But Deb had a strong sense of self-belief forged as a child and it gave her great strength, an amazing strength. I remember her talking to me on one occasion about not believing in God. And she'd been slapped in the face a number of times. She was telling me this story. She'd been slapped in the face a number of times by a foster mum because she refused to go to church. Correctly, she saw it as hypocritical because they went to church and then they came home and physically abused her. And she was told, you have to believe in God. And she said, well, I don't. And she was asked, what do you believe in? And when her response was she believed in herself, she was slapped again but she stuck by her self-belief. She would often proudly say she came from a long line of strong women, the Muanina people from southeast Tasmania. She also spoke to me on many occasions about the extra perceived demand to prove her worth as Aboriginal, being that she was fair-skinned. As a younger person, she thought maybe she shouldn't say anything about her Aboriginal heritage. It was a hard world for her to move into. Her response to people who said things to her like, you don't look Aboriginally, Aboriginal, well, she came up her response to that and her response would be, well, haven't you been conditioned? She would explain her Aboriginality as being a latte girl. And she used to do this at schools. She'd have half a cup of coffee in a clear container and she'd add milk to it and she'd ask, what have I got here? And they'd say, a cup of coffee. And she'd add milk to it and she'd say, what have I got here? And they'd say, well, it's still a cup of coffee. And she would use that as an example to explain how it didn't matter how much white you put into a cup of coffee, it was still a cup of coffee. 
And she did actually say, she would often say, you know, I'm the latte girl, big deal, deal with it. As I said the other night, Deb ran away at about 15 or 16 and lived on the street. She survived by scavenging in skip bins, but eventually she realised this was no way to live and wanted to change her life. So she got a job in a bank. They were the days when you could literally walk into the bank, do a maths test, and if you passed, you got a job. And she actually became a head teller. She was pretty good at maths. She could have easily turned to drugs or crime, but instead found that internal courage, that internal um, fortitude that made her who she was. Deb achieved so much throughout her life, and one of the greatest honours she received happened shortly before her death when Charles Sturt University offered her an honorary professorship, professorship. So she went from the kid that ran away and was scavenging in skips to a professor. Pretty proud of you, Deborah Hocking. Deb believed in forgiveness. She never forgot. She didn't believe in forgetting, but she did believe in forgiving. And she told me that once she came to that belief, that changed her whole life. She studied Aboriginal health, which really gave her an insight into the disadvantage Aboriginal people suffered. And she put her energy into helping and representing Aboriginal people and was a driving force behind progress towards truth-telling and reconciliation Tasmania. She was an advocate and an activist. Just some of her other major achievements include she was chair of the Stolen Generation Alliance. She was the facilitator of the committee that organises Sorry Day events in Tasmania. She used to visit schools to explain to school children the importance of and significance of Sorry Day and saying sorry and the importance of forgiveness. She was instrumental in former Tasmania Premier Paul Lennon delivering an apology to the Stolen Generation. Apparently when she went to meet with um, the former Premier Lennon, and had a chat to him, he said, oh, it was going to be very hard, and she said, well, I do hard. Let's do it. And they did. She was instrumental in discussions about the wording of the National Apology, working alongside Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. She took the lead role in organising the reconcilia reconciliation walk in Tasmania, where one in 20 Tasmanians participated. She was coordinator of the University of Wollongong Postgraduate Indigenous Health Program, and she was chosen by Harvard University to be the local coordinator of the Australian version of a program that focuses on compounded trauma in Aboriginal people. The program is to train health practitioners in treating patients as survivors of trauma, often across several generations, and which gives rise to behavioural and physical symptoms. Deb believed that seeing Indigenous Australians through the prism of trauma could be the key to closing the gap. Deb gave um, evidence to the, um, to the inquiry into the stolen generation. I just found her personal statement the other day, so I just want to quickly read that. And this is a quote. In my experience, the sense of loss and grief from being removed as a baby has left a scar so deep that recovery seemed almost impossible. We find forgiveness to allow our own healing to begin, but that should not give qualification or sanitisation of these wrongdoings and injustice. My mum and dad and I, uh, my mum and dad, I am sure, would have loved me very much, and the pain they must have had to endure is unimaginable. My strength of spirit has been challenged many times, and has, as has keeping the anger and frustration at bay. We share our stories so that others may understand what the legacy of child removals have left behind. It's not about blame or guilt now, as that takes us to a negative space, which I consider produces destructive behaviour. It is about considering the ways we can make sure this never happens again. If we become forgetful, the injustices of the past could well be repeated. Listening to these stories, which I consider are so generously shared with all, may seem hard and confronting from some, but just remember, it's been even harder to live the journey. And I'm sorry that Deb, despite her incredible contribution, did not live to see the task of reconciliation achieved, because I know that she would have been delighted to see the election of a federal Labor government that's committed to implementing the Uluru Statement from the heart in full. And while we still have a long way to go, I hope that before she died, Deb was at peace with the knowledge that she had a key
key role in building the foundations for the progress Australians have made towards reconciliation, truth-telling and closing the gap. I hope that we can honour her legacy and the legacy of so many other people who have fought for the cause of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people by seeing a future where there is genuine and lasting reconciliation, a future where the oldest continuing civilisation on earth is embraced and celebrated, where the gap between the health and economic circumstances of Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians has been closed and where Australia has come to terms with the truth of our colonial past. Rest well, Deb. Rest well, my dear, dear friend. You were my hero, and you used to laugh every time I'd say it, but you truly were. And I don't have that many heroes, I've got to say. You fought an almighty good fight, and you will always live in the hearts and minds of your old Ogilvy friends, the Oofs. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Billick. Senator Cox. Thank you, uh, Acting uh, Deputy President. Um, I rise tonight to speak about the groundbreaking work being done by Tiwi traditional elders in opposing the terrible Barossa, Barossa gas project. Santos's Barossa gas project in the Northern Territory is close to the Tiwi Islands. Uh, is potentially one of the world's most carbon-intensive gas projects. And if Santos actually go ahead with this project, it will be one of the dirtiest offshore gas projects in all of Australia. Climate change already poses an enormous threat to Tiwi culture, traditional practices, food sources, water and land. The Barossa project would mean climate catastrophe for the Tiwi Islands and also for the Tiwi people. The extraction, development and burning of Barossa gas would release 15.6 million tonnes of carbon dioxide emissions annually. Now, to give you an idea, that's more than three million cars for each year that this project operates. The main component of the gas is methane, which is 100 times more potent than carbon dioxide in the short term and emitted in vast quantities across the entire gas supply chain. At a time when the International Energy Agency says we cannot develop any new gas if we are to avoid climate catastrophe, Santos plans for one of the most polluting gas projects in the world is reckless and it absolutely must be stopped. The cultural, social, ecological and environmental impacts of the Barossa gas project are significant. The Barossa gas field lies next to the Oceanic Shoals Marine Park, which is critical, a critical area for uh, sea turtles. And these sea turtles are integral to Tiwi culture. The construction of the Barossa pipeline would harm the turtles' feeding habitat and create light and noise pollution that could distract the turtle hatchlings. It's horrifying to know that an unplanned oil spill from this project would pollute the Tiwi Islands' traditional waters alongside four government marine parks. So tonight I want to highlight the incredible work being done by the Tiwi traditional owners to challenge the Barossa project. At, a moment, at the moment, the federal court are considering a challenge launched by a Tiwi elder and Munyapu senior lawman Dennis Tipikalib, a, a supporter, um, with the support of his community, Dennis is arguing that Santos Barossa gas drilling approvals set aside because he and his community were never actually consulted about these drilling plans. The Barossa gas field is not a new development. And sadly, this story spans almost two decades. To give you a brief timeline, back in 2004, the Northern Territory government approved exploration drilling. In 2016, Nopsema approved appraisal drilling for the Barossa Wells. In 2018, Nopsema approved the offshore project proposal and master plan. And in 2020, Nopsema approved the Barossa gas pipeline. Throughout this entire process, the Tiwi people have never been consulted. In fact, many Tiwi people have only recently learned about the Barossa project thanks to the work of First Nations people like Antonia Burke and the civil society organisations like the Northern Territory Environment Centre. I was absolutely heartbroken to hear that Santos's so-called consultation process 
about the drilling environment plan consists of sending two emails and making one unanswered phone call to the Tiwi Land Council. Santos made a final investment decision on the Barossa project without the consent, you guessed it, without the consent of the Tiwi people. I was also incredibly angry to learn that Santos's legal team have claimed that because the project falls into federal waters, Tiwi people are not the relevant people that they need to consult with. Well, Santos, if the traditional owners who have been here for over 60,000 years aren't the relevant people that you need to consult with, then who is? Tiwi people will be the first ones impacted by the Barossa gas project, and it is shameful that Santos is trying to deny their connection with land, culture, sea and sky. <clears throat> it is also shameful that Nopsema are not doing more to fix their woeful, inadequate and almost superficial requirements when it comes to consulting with First Nations people. And it's not good enough to list these projects on Nopsema's public website and call that consultation. We've had this discussion earlier today. As part of the current uh, federal case or federal court case, the Environmental Defenders Office and the Munupu can, uh, clan group have requested on country healings with the federal judge, which, in a historical move, the judge recently agreed, as recent as last Friday, to travel to the Tiwi Islands in August to receive evidence on country with five witnesses who are the traditional owners from that area and they would be the ones who are most affected by this project. The judge also agreed to receive this evidence in song and dance, because, as we know, in some First Nations community, English is not their first, second or third or even fourth language. The Tiwi people will be able to talk about cultural heritage and how the Barossa project could interrupt cultural and spiritual practices if it goes ahead. This is a remarkable step forward and in addressing the shocking consultation processes which have been bandied around to date. Earlier today, we were debating Senator Thorpe's private senator's bill on the implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I think it's important to reflect on the links between the implementation of UNDRIP and the serious failures of Santos to consult with the Tiwi people. So, just for a moment, I'd like everyone in this place to imagine that if we implemented the key principles of free prior informed consent, which lots of people on, on both sides of this chamber have talked about today, that we could put that into Australian laws, policies and practices. Embedding these principles would stop companies like Santos from taking First Nations people for granted from seeing consultation from simply being a box-ticking exercise instead of recognising our sovereignty and the ongoing connection to country, to the sky and to the seas. This, in fact, is a landmark court case and it is for the first time that a traditional owner has gone to Nopsema to challenge their approvals processes. I know for one, as a senator, I've asked them to clearly outline what that means. And this is not just a huge achievement um, for Tiwi people, although I don't want to remove that from them. It's also for all of our First Nations communities who are continuing to fight against industry who say that they are our friends, but in fact are not doing the right thing. I would like to end by sharing some powerful words from the senior lawman about his work and, and how he triggered this court case. We are going to court because we have not been properly consulted about what is happening in our sea country. So for Santos to begin drilling at this moment shows disrespect for our culture and our interests. We are worried to hear about drilling going ahead soon before the court has decided. That is why we want this injunction to protect our sea country, our culture, until the court decides what is right. We have cared for this sea country for millennia. 
Once those holes are drilled into the ocean floor, they cannot be undone. For that to happen when Santos is not being consulting with us would be devastating to our culture and, in fact, a huge betrayal. I am doing this for my ancestors and my future generations, and I want to tell our children our traditional stories. If this drilling goes ahead now, it would be a very bad story to tell. So I want to thank the Tiwi people for their ongoing commitment, their resilience and their fight to save their sea country. Thank you. Senator Grogan. Thank you. We're experiencing a skills shortage in industries that are vital to the well-being of Australia. We have a situation where industries that everyone across this chamber will agree are vital, such as aged care, early childhood education, teaching, nursing and other industries that simply cannot find enough staff. Australia's skills shortage is one that's been simmering away for years. This is not a surprise. There has not been a clear plan, and without proper investment, when we hit the pandemic, it boiled over into a crisis. We saw our aged care workers forced to work in multiple facilities, sometimes unsafely, simply because that was the only way of providing enough staff to cover the care needs. We saw our nurses pulling hours that, would not, that are well beyond what anybody would say is safe. And just to ensure that our COVID wards were safely and appropriately staffed. But this left so many of them in such a dire situation. We simply did not have enough people with the skills required when we needed them. And where we did have workers with the skills we so desperately needed, we didn't have a system to ensure that their wages kept pace that they had enough money to put food on the table, that they were keeping up with skyrocketing wages, uh, with skyrocketing rents and increased transport costs. We did not have a system that protected our most vulnerable and our most vital workers. Jobs and Skills Australia will be an incredible tool to actually start to address this. It will act in partnership between unions, employers, education providers and state and territory governments, and it will take immediate action on our skills shortage. Jobs and Skills Australia will provide advice on current, emerging and future workforce skills issues, and it will help keep Australians in work by having that long-term view and having that long-term perspective. As industries change, so will our training to ensure that there are jobs available for people who need them. And it will work to ensure that there is a shared understanding of the issues facing Australia through a balanced approach to working in multiple industries. In February of this year, 17 per cent of businesses reported that they did not have enough employees and the recruitment difficulty rate for higher skilled occupants was sitting at 67 per cent. In my home state of South Australia, we felt the impacts of skills shortages, particularly in our youth unemployment rates and in our regional workforce, workforce shortages. In Australia, the youth unemployment rate is currently sitting at 7.9 per cent. And this youth unemployment rate is being deeply felt in South Australia. The younger members of our workforce are having to face the consequences of a government that refused to prioritise education and refused to invest in skills. Even though we have all been talking about the shifts in our economy, the shifts in our industry base for so many years. And it would seem like a no-brainer to connect that high youth unemployment rate to the skills shortage, to build those pathways for those young people to be sufficiently skilled up to take those available jobs and to address that issue with the resource that we have right in front of us. I've had the great fortune of working in the tertiary education sector and working particularly on pathways um, for students from more disadvantaged backgrounds into university and into vocational education. And I can assure you that there are a great deal of people out there, a great deal of young people 
who would love an opportunity for a pathway into a career in some of those areas where we really have desperate skills shortages. Vocational education, providing alternative pathways for school leavers into trades and different kinds of skilled workforces, allowing young people to match their dreams with the needs of our economy. These are the things that we should be looking towards. But not enough was done over the last nine years under the former government to prioritise this type of education, to prioritise vocational pathways and to actually build a system that understood what our available resources were and where our industries needed those skilled workers. So we need a plan. The vocational education and training sector trains four million people annually in Australia, and this is a central element of our education system. Action is required to match the training participation, the skill sets and the demand. Jobs and Skills Australia is the vehicle that is going to deliver this. It will produce independent data and analysis so that we can understand the costs involved with delivering the vocational education and training courses to students and what that impacts are going to be across governments, training organisations and industry. It will recommend funding on genuine needs to help us address youth unemployment and to address the other great scourge in South Australia, which is regional skills shortages. Jobs and Skills will undertake specific plans for targeted groups, such as the regions and youth. Obviously, in other parts of the country, there are other priorities also, um, and it will provide the targeted data that directly informs the policy development and the program delivery so that we can provide that match between what is needed and how we go about getting there. And this will all be complemented by the Albanese Labor government's commitment to create 465,000 fee-free TAFE places that are focused on areas of skills gap. In South Australia, we have been facing mass nursing and aged care workforce shortages, and the training that's being provided in many areas is insufficient particularly when we're talking about aged care and disability care. We've heard today, through much of the debate around the aged care bill, the, about the inaction of the former government in addressing issues within the aged care sector. And we've known this is a growing area of skills shortage for some considerable time, and yet nothing has been done to address it. And as a result, Aged care workers are having to overwork themselves, not provide the care they want to, thanks largely to workforce shortages and this skills crisis. Throughout the regional towns of Wyala, Port Pirie, Port Augusta, Mount Gambier, Port Lincoln, the aged care sector's skills shortage is an immediate issue. Prior to the election, I did a range of forums out through those regional areas talking about aged care, talking about the broader health workforce, and the story was alarmingly similar everywhere I went, that there were shortages, there weren't enough staff, people were overworked, and they didn't believe that they were able to provide the care because they didn't have the time, because they didn't have the staff. So that is why Jobs and Skills Australia is so essential, why the um, Jobs and Skills Summit in September is so important bringing together the critical areas, the critical stakeholders and understanding what that's going to look like into the future and building a plan, a short-term plan for immediate relief, a medium-range plan and then the longer-term plan about where the industries in this country are growing and where they are shrinking and building a plan accordingly. The Albanese Labor government has got big plans across manufacturing also and in the renewable energy sector and being able to plan for what that, skills workforce, what that skilled workforce looks like is critical to being able to deliver on it. There is no point building an industry if you can't then provide the relevant staff with the relevant technical knowledge and experience to be able to, to fill those gaps. So as we recover from the pandemic economically, now is the time to pull together and think very strategically about what our economy will need going forwards—short term, medium term and long term. 
We know we need to care. We know we need to teach. We know we need to build things. And to do that, we have to understand what that future looks like, and we have to understand how we are going to put the right people in the right jobs to build the future that we know that we can across Australia and that we can deliver on well-paid jobs, on decent jobs, help people deal with the rising cost of living through multiple ranges of um, policies, but also through ensuring people have a decent job, that they can put food on the table and that they can afford their transport costs and they can have pride in the job they are doing to build the economy. Thank you, Senator Grogan. There being no further contributions, the Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 12 noon.